You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. By transcription, it's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Every night is Mystery Night here on NBC. Tonight's mystery feature is The Silent Men. Tomorrow evening, join Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. On Tuesday, hear the pulsing excitement of Big Town. Then on Wednesday, there's The Big Story, Authentic Adventures of Ace Newspaper Men. And later Wednesday evening, there's the new Barry Crane, Confidential Investigator, played by William Gargan. Yes, for high adventure on a mystery feature every evening, Monday through Friday, tune into this NBC station. And now it's the silent men on your NBC station. This is Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. In a moment, it will be my pleasure to introduce to you stories of the silent men, the special agents of federal law enforcement who silently and for little material reward daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Their tradition is long and proud, yet to guard our welfare and our liberties, they must remain nameless. The Silent Men. Produced in Hollywood and starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. National Broadcasting Company proudly presents The Silent Men, transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here again is Douglas Fairbanks. Part of America's greatness is in its willingness and ability to open its doors and welcome new citizens from all parts of the world, the desirable aliens from other lands, whether they be peasants or scientists, poets or potters. They add richness to our culture. They give love and devotion to our soil. But not all aliens are desirable. They come here on trial. Most of them prove themselves worthy and they stay. Some must inevitably be sent back because they're a threat to our freedom, our institutions, our beliefs. Among the silent men who work as our sentinels are the men of the Immigration Department. Tonight, I will play the role of Special Agent George Spencer one of the silent men in tonight's file case, The Big Sneak. Good morning. Good morning. May I help you? I'm George Spencer, Boston Division. Oh, yes. Mr. Tremaine is expecting you. Mrs. Spence is here, sir. Good. Send him in. And hold all phone calls from now on, please. Go right in, Mrs. Spencer. Thanks. Good. Well, come in. Good to see you. Good, <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you, too, Chief. Uh, sit down. Tell me, how's the wife and George Jr.? Huh? Oh, Lillian's fine. George Jr.'s getting open spaces where his teeth used to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kids sure look like monsters from time to time, don't they? Yeah, certainly do. But you didn't call me to Washington to talk about Junior's teeth, I'll bet. No, I didn't, George. I wish that was the reason, though. Uh, Miss Walsh. Yes, sir. Bring in the dossier on Frankie Orlando. Yes, sir. Orlando. You remember the name, huh? Yeah, not with pleasure. Admitted to the United States under the quota of 1928. Um, arrests and conviction for bootlegging, dope, white slavery, manslaughter. Served time in Denimore and Alcatraz. Deported Italy in 1946. Well, you have a good memory. I say we don't need the dossier. <laughs> the Orlando file. No, just put it there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, what makes Orlando a problem? He's out of our territory now. Living in Sicily, isn't he? He's getting lonesome for us, George. Oh, I see. The boys from Treasury picked up one of his old mob on a counterfeit push a few days ago. A three-time loser. He tried to buy his way out of a life rap by giving a little information. Orlando's going to try to pull a big sneak, George. Illegal entry, huh? It's the only way he can get in. We wouldn't give him a ten-minute visa for a visit to Hoboken. You know what port he's going to try to clear? No. 
You know what it means if he gets back? Well, the old mob reorganized, his old rackets opened up again. Happy picture, isn't it? Yeah, delightful. He could cross from Mexico like a wetback, slip in from Canada. Or even clear a port with phony papers. He's got a lot of connections, George. He's a sharpshooter and he knows all the angles. Once he gets in, we'll have a job finding him. Took us almost six years the last time. Well, we've got to know where and how he intends to come in. Well, whatever it is, it'll be smart. We wait for him to come to us, we're dead. The only way to stop him is to go to him, watch him all the way. You want me to go to Sicily? Yes. As a matter of fact, George, you're booked out on a night flight to Rome. You won't even have time to go home. Well, how about cover credentials? I'm having those drawn up. You keep your own name. You know quite a bit about art, don't you? Uh, painting? <laughs> yeah. You might even say I'm a collector, Junior Gray. <laughs> <laughs> on my salary, all I can afford is reproduction. Yes, I know what you mean. Uh, when you get to Italy, pose as an art dealer from Boston. I don't speak Italian, you know. You won't be alone. I'm bringing Tony Curto in from San Francisco. He'll okay. be here this afternoon. You'll travel together. When you get to Palermo, check in at the Vittoria. And after that, it's up to you. Frankie Orlando is an undesirable. We don't want him here. You're the lock on the gate. Now, keep it locked. I'll try. Well, good luck, George. Thanks. I, uh... I don't suppose I have to remind you, Orlando was an old liner in the Mafia. I know. If he knows you're in his way, he'll try to kill you. Ah. Still reading? Hmm? Turtle? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Studying up on Sicilian art, just in case. <laughs> Our cover credentials won't do much good unless we know what we're talking about. They aren't going to be any good anyhow, George. Why? What's the matter? I was just down at the lounge with Tag. Who? Big Joe Giovanni. I didn't see him get on the plane. He's on. He has his seat back by the tail section. He see you? Saw both of us, I'm afraid. Well, I know him from his pictures, but he doesn't know me. He knows me. How? I testified against him once at a deportation hearing. He couldn't make it stick. Any link between Giovanni and Orlando? Both mafia mobsters. It's a cinch they work together. Well, that doesn't mean he knows what we're on. No, well, maybe I'd better move to another seat. Maybe we'd better split up. No, if he doesn't know me, our sitting together could be accidental. But if he saw us together when he came aboard, it'd look funny if we split. No, I guess you're right. Attention, passengers. Those are the Italian Alps we now pass over. Thank you. Well, we're getting there. Oh. Know where Giovanni came from originally, his place of birth? Um, uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, yeah, Naples. Yeah, well, he might be just taking a trip, visit the home folks or something. Could be. But on the other hand, he may be a contact for Orlando. If he's in on the sneak, we're in trouble. Well, we can find out. Um, stewardess, stewardess. Can I get you something, Mr. Spencer? Yes, uh, Mr. Curto and I were wondering about something. Is there a Joe Giovanni on the passenger list? Seat 37. He's listed as Giuseppe Giovanni. Ah. Funny you should ask about him. Why funny? Well, a few minutes after we took off, he asked who you were. Oh, I see. You ask about me, too? No, Mr. Curto. He just seemed to be interested in Mr. Spencer. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, what's Giovanni's destination? Naples? Well, I'd have to look it up on my seating chart. But, uh, no, I don't think so. I think he has a through ticket to Palermo, Sicily. <laughs> Giovanni had his tag all right. I could feel his eye on us when we changed planes at Rome and switched the shuttle to Naples and Palermo. He got off the plane at the Naples stop and sent a cable. He came back smiling. When we finally landed at Palermo, he moved close to us while we were waiting for our luggage. Let me offer you a lift into the city, gentlemen. I got a car outside. The limousine. No thanks, Mr. Giovanni. Why not? After all, I'm not a stranger. I'm not your friend, Mr. Cutter. Don't be so polite, Giovanni. I knew it doesn't look good. I just offered to save you the price of a taxi, Curto. I'd rather pay it. I like fresh air when I ride. They're taking our bags off the hand truck now, Curto. I'll get them. Your friend is a difficult man, Mr. Spencer. Oh, don't let it worry you. He's had a hard life. <laughs> uh, you think that's funny, eh? Oh, what do you think? I think maybe you and him could smarten up. You're a nice-looking guy. Culture and everything. But how much you got in your pocket? Oh, enough for tomorrow's breakfast. What kind of breakfast? Pizza, don't mean... Stop being so smart. Be a little dumb like me. I'll let you in on a good thing. Like what? How to get a big vacation. All over Europe. First class. 
Yes, all expenses paid. Paid by who? By me, Big George of us. I got the bag, George. Uh, throw them away, Curto. We're going to buy new ones and go on a big vacation. All expenses paid courtesy of Big Joe Giovanni. Oh, <laughs> isn't that nice? You're two bright kids, huh? You like big laugh. Yeah. And you're the biggest laugh we've had in years. Well, let me tell you something, Curto. You push me around in the States, but you're not in the States now. I can push back hard. You're an Italian boy yourself. You know what I mean. Get lost, Giovanni. Take it easy, Curto. Arrivederci, gentlemen. I give your regards to the statue and everything when I go back. Too bad she won't see you no more. I don't think Mr. Giovanni likes this, Curto. We got a bad break bumping into him. No, not too bad. He told us something. You mean that free vacation pitch? Yeah. Pick up the bags and let's get out of here. Right. Giovanni's got a clear passport. We've got nothing on him. Why should he offer us a bribe? Well, he doesn't want us around, I figure. Well, that means the lead we got from the Treasury Department was right. He, he's no reason to get rid of us on his own account. He, he just doesn't want anybody around here watching Frankie Orlando. I can't figure how they plan to get Orlando back into the States. But whatever it is, Giovanni's in on the sneak, all right. Hmm. No airport, the city bus here? No, they got one. It's probably broken down someplace. There's a cab. Hello. No, sir, senor. Climb in, George. Well, yeah. yeah, it's a poor but honest substitute for Giovanni's limousine. Yeah. Well, Johnny Alberto Vittoria. Subito, signore, subito. You know, George, Giovanni was right about one thing. This isn't a state. Whatever we're going up against, we can't yell for help. I've never seen you worried before, Colonel. My old man was born here. I remember all the stories I heard when I was a kid. You notice that gesture Giovanni made with his hand when he left us? Yeah, when he put his hand to his mouth and bit the knuckle of one of his fingers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the vendetta sign. It's like a promise, a note. Maybe he won't succeed, George, but Giovanni is mafia. Before we leave this island, he'll try to kill us. And when he does try, we'll be getting close to Frankie Orlando. We're already closer than he wants us to get. Keep an eye on the rear window. Next time we see Giovanni in his limousine, he won't be inviting us to ride with him. Bigger than I thought. Big enough. Huh. You know where we are? Well, we came into town through the Puerto Nuevo. Now we're on the Via Maqueda, almost midtown. Cuatro Cantoni is about a half a mile from here. That's the heart of the city. Yeah, this looks like a shopping district through here. It is. Well, it's kind of quiet, isn't it? After midnight. Plane landed a little late. We should. What's he stopping for? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Okay, for Mate Aki. Bronx up your Oh, man. What's the matter? Not a gas. At least that's what he says. Pull the back up. We can walk the rest of the way. Well, looks like we'll have to. Not far. One long block to Quattro Cantoni. He'll tell us right off the square. Well, as long as Giovanni and his friends aren't around, let's go. Yeah. Wait till I pay this guy. Here you. Eh, grazie. Oh, grazie, signore. That's what I was afraid you'd say. Come on. Arrivederci, signore. Arrivederci. What's the matter, Curto? That cab driver's a bad actor, that's all. He dumped us out here because somebody wanted us dumped here. How do you know? Because I sure changed him on the fare and he thanked me. If he was on the level, he'd scream like an eagle. Let's get off this block. It's too long and there's no cover. I was about to ask him why we needed cover, but before I could get the question out, I knew. From not far off, I heard the sound of a large car moving slowly in low gear. Curto heard it, too. The direction of sound is hard to place in the dark. We looked both ways, up and down the street. Then we saw it. Coming from behind us on the far side of the street. No headlights. Moving slowly. Moving faster than we are. Look for a doorway. Uh... Don't increase your pace. Play it easy. They want us to reach that street light up ahead. That's why we better find a doorway here. And have us like shooting fish in a barrel. We've got to get inside one of those stores. It's our only chance for cover. They're all locked. By the time we get a door open... We can't use a door. Use your suitcase. What do you mean? Well, if we come to that light, they'll speed up. Just before they reach it, throw the suitcase through one of those store windows and get in after it. Find the display lid. Which store? That big clothing store looks good. Here they come. Run for it. Throw the suitcase. Run, boys, come on! Behind the lid, drop! Come 
Spencer. You hear me? We hear you. I make my offer once more. You can't get out of there. Maybe not, but you can't come in here either. Not unless you like to be dead. Police, yeah. Italian police. Do me go, do me go. Why don't you stick around and wait, Giovanni? Ah, they're gone. Quick, grab the luggage and let's get out of here. We don't have to run. Well, if we're found here, we'll be held until our credentials are checked. That'll take time. And time is something we haven't got. Well, a couple of hours. Look, a couple of hours might be all the start Orlando needs. What makes you think he's going to move that fast? Giovanni makes me think so. He tried to knock us out too quickly. If he had time, he'd have waited for a better chance. the Hotel Victoria just long enough to put our baggage in a room. If we were right about Orlando's move, there was no time for sleep. We knew he'd be living on the grand scale, so just before dawn, we hit the best of the produce markets and started to ask questions. Curto found an old man who knew all the answers. He, he, Senor Orlando, he's a buy from me all the time. He's a big man. Yeah, yeah, real big success, we know. You know where his house is? Sure, I deliver. Deliver everything. I got the surplus. The Jeep I buy from Stata Unito. It's your country. Where's Orlando's place? Uh, the, the Palazzo. Uh, oh, uh, you know where's the church? Which church? Uh, Santo Spirito. That's south of the city near Monte Pellegrino. See, si, see, si, that's the one. Orlando, he's living in the Palazzo. It's a big white Palazzo after you pass the church. I, I... Uh, why you ask about him? You you know him from some place? Yes, yes, we know him. We looked him up once back in the United States. Huh? Yeah, for six years we looked him up. Hey, hey, hey you want to ride with me? I I gonna go by the Orlando Palazzo. What do you say, George? Uh, side curtains on this jeep, and it's something Orlando must be used to seeing. Better than driving past the place in a hired car. Hey, you gonna come? Yeah, grazie. We uh, yeah, we will come. Si, andiamo. Make deliveries this early in the morning? Oh, no, no. I just take a stuff to my store. Oh. I deliver uh, later in the, the daytime. Uh, how long since you seen uh, Signor Orlando? Eh? A long time. Uh, back in the Stato Unito. That's eh? right, that's right. You don't see him since the accident, huh? What accident? Oh, with the automobile. He's uh, got accident. When was this? Oh, on a door uh, two months ago. Oh, he hurt badly? No, I don't think so. Only his face. I, I see him walk around all with a bandage on the face. The first time I see him without the bandage, I don't know who was the same man. He, he's got no mark on the face. He's no scar, you know? He just look like a different man. That sounds like a plastic surgery job, Credo. That's what it sounds like, all right. It was bad enough when we knew what he looked like. What do you say? What's the matter? Nothing, nothing, just just a little problem we've got here. The new face isn't going to hurt his chances any when he tries to make you sneak. We've got to know what he looks like now. Hmm. If you want to see him, you go in the afternoon, after lunchtime. He's a sitting garden by the palazzo. You'll have to pick up a camera someplace. Fine. How do we get near him with it? Well, there's a top pole on the back of the jeep. We can throw it over a couple of crates, hide under it, shoot a picture without being seen. We hope. Hope or not, we've got to get that picture. <laughs> It took a while before the old man agreed to help us. He didn't understand what we wanted or why we wanted it, and of course we couldn't tell him. Curto told him something in Italian that seemed to pave the way, and shortly after noon of the same day, we were under a tarpaulin on the rear of the jeep when it stopped near the white palazzo. There's nobody in the garden, George. Thought the old man said Orlando was always there in the afternoon. Well, he was wrong today. Curto, we're too late. Too late? Throw the tarpaulin off. How do you know we're too late? What do you see? Uh, the house door is padlocked from the outside. And the sneak is on and we've lost it. We've got to stop him. George, you might be headed for any port in Europe by plane or ship. Which way do we go? First, we've got to get into that house. Come on. You think he might have left something behind? Something that might tell where he's headed? If he didn't, we're finished. He could land at any one of a thousand points in the United States. He's been planning this for a long time. <laughs> into the house, went through papers and files, desk drawers and closets. It looked like a hopeless case. And then we came across something. George, hold it. Find something? Maybe. Here, take a look at this. A waste paper basket. A copy of a cable van. Misspelled a couple of words and crossed them out and wrote them correctly. Must have decided to make a whole new copy before I sent it. Dated yesterday. Yeah, it's a funny message, though. 
Uh, uh, meet me with Emerson when you get the word. Remember, Emerson. Monaghan won't do. No signature. He wouldn't send a cable to the States, not this kind. Who's it addressed to? Can you make it out? No, no, it's been blurred. Emerson or Monaghan? Could be code names, of course. Or they just might be real. Some contact he expects help from. The attorney, maybe. Somebody like that? Well, it could be anything. If that cable ever went through, the cable office should have a copy on file. We can get the address from them. Come on. Well, if they've got it, we better place a transatlantic call to the chief in Washington. That's exactly what I had in mind. He can check on the man who got that cable, and maybe there'll be something in the files on somebody in the rackets named Emerson or Monaghan. Mm. We'll have to get back to the States ourselves on the next plane. Whatever plugging we can do now, we'll have to do at the home end. I just had an idea. What's that? One thing Orlando will need is a clear passport. He probably took Giovanni's and altered it. But I doubt if he'll try to use it to enter the States. He's got something better than that up his sleeve. Maybe a passport stolen or... Or bought from some American stranded over here, Pat. Wonder what the chief is going to say when he finds out that Orlando slipped through our hands. You can say what he always says. Find him. The cable had gone through all right. We got the address, a place in New York, and forwarded the information to headquarters. Then we boarded a plane for home. The chief met us when we came in at Idlewild Airport. Well, the address on that cable was phony. You mean it was never delivered? Oh, it was delivered, all right, but there's a vacant lot at the address. Well, how could delivery be made to a vacant lot? Messenger boy said there was a man waiting there when he came along looking for the house number. Could the kid describe the man he gave it to? Oh, vaguely. Not enough to help us. Came through at night. The street was dark. Oh, man. My, my car's out this way. Well, how about those two names in the cablegram, Emerson and Monaghan? Anything on those? No, not a buzz. Nobody but those names ever associated with Orlando or his mob. Hmm. Too bad we didn't get our tip a little earlier. If we had, I know you would have stopped it. If he came in by plane, he's probably already cleared. No, I've been watching the planes closely. We fingerprinted a few people we weren't sure of. Orlando will have the same fingerprints he had before. Now, here's the car. Well, unless Orlando's on a boat headed this way, it looks like we're licked. Uh, until we find him, I mean. <laughs> now, we'll know he's here. Won't be hard to tell. We'll be seeing a lot more newspaper stories about white slavery and... Dope addiction. That's what we're letting ourselves in for if he gets past us. That's what I hate about it. Oh, come on, George. Come on. Snap out of it. Don't look so glum. More than a week gone by. Liners coming and going. No sign of them. Oh, there's still the tramp steamers, George. Oh, yes. I have those papers ready to sign. No? Which one? Permission for a private ambulance to pick up that polio patient after air rescue service brings in from the team. Oh, yes. What's that about, Chief? Oh, it's a girl stricken with polio on a tramp steamer two days out of Port of New York. Going toward Europe or coming from there? Uh, coming from Europe. Uh, we have a few cases like this every year. If it's serious like this one seems to be, air rescue sends a seaplane out, picks the patient up, and rushes them in for hospitalization. What hospital? Well, that's up to them once we clear them for quick admission. You mean they come right on through without a careful check? Oh, George, you know that. If the passport's clear, of course. If somebody's critically ill, you don't want to make them wade through red tape. Sure, you? sure, sure. I'm sorry. I just got Orlando on the brain, I guess. <laughs> well, relax. This polio patient's a girl. Hmm. Uh, what is it? I'm just wondering who made the diagnosis. Very few doctors on tramp steamers, Chief. Yeah, very few is right. And very few girls booked passage on tramp steamers. Has that pickup been made from the ship, I mean? Yes, sir. I gave a verbal okay to Port of New York about three hours ago. They should be in from the return flight in about a half hour. Where are they landing? Then, that's where the ambulance will be waiting. Mm. You don't want to change the order, do you? Yes. When that rescue plane comes down to the field, have a department doctor there and a department ambulance. That patient ought to be thoroughly checked by us. You sure you want it this way, George? I know it won't harm the patient any, but... Uh... The patient is a girl. I know how you feel about it, and if I thought this was a legitimate case, I'd feel the same way. What's the matter? What a strange look, George. I... I just thought of something. Now I know I'm right. Well, if you're that sure, let's have it. That cablegram, remember? It said, um, meet me with Emerson when you get the word. Monon won't do. Well, you know what it means? I know what the names mean. I just remembered. They're both names of respirators for polio victims. Manufacturer's names. Oh. Why, that's right, Mr. Tremaine. 
I remember seeing them during last year's polio fund drive. They're both excellent respirators, but the Monaghan is a smaller one. It just covers the chest and torso. That's why the cable said it wouldn't do. Orlando wanted the heavy, full-sized Emerson to give him a better cover, a, a better disguise. Call Bennett Field right away, Miss Walsh. Tell our man there to get a departmental doctor on the field and wait for that rescue plane. Arrange transfer to a regular hospital if necessary, but the patient is not to be moved in that private ambulance. Yes, sir. Uh, hiding behind a thing like that. Polio. Using sympathy on a machine somebody's life might depend on to get back into the country and do more damage. That takes a real rat, George. Well... Isn't that what we've been looking for, Chief? A real rat? New York on extension three, Mr. Tremaine. Oh, thank you. This is it, George. Hello. Tremaine speaking. Ah, <laughs> good. Fine. Keep him there. Yeah, good idea. I'm with that all the way. Goodbye. Well, that's it, fellow. It was Orlando, then. Yeah, it was him. Hale and Hardy, too. Well, we're not just going to deport him again, are we? No, not just yet. We figure he's healthy enough to do about another ten years on the rock, just to convince him. Then we'll deport him. Now, can I go home now? <laughs> yes, on the first plane. And uh, thanks, George. It was a good job. Well, that's what I'm paid for. You satisfied? Yeah, yeah. A man like Orlando with his mob could cost decent people millions of dollars in cash and, and heartaches. You stop him, and what do you get? No, I never thought about it. No, really, I'd like to know. Oh, I get a lot. Those decent people you spoke about, her friends and neighbors, and my own family, cigarettes, drive my own car, radio, bottle of beer. <laughs> Maybe I've no imagination, but, you know, I, I can't think of anything else I especially want. Can you? No. There isn't anything else. Well... Give my love to Lillian and George Jr., huh? Now, go home. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The file case of the big sneak completes but another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men. The special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you the story of our government's fight against illegal traffic in narcotics in the file case entitled The Empire of <coughs> the Blind, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Joel Murkoff and transcribed in Hollywood. All names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Georgia Ellis, Bill Conrad, Paul Dubov, Ted DeCorsia, and Ramsey Hill. Douglas Fairbanks may currently be seen starring in Mr. Drake's Duck. Millions of innocent Koreans will die this coming winter unless you give your unneeded clothing today to the American Relief for Korea. That's ARK. A-R-K. Unless there are local collection agencies, please send your used clothing prepaid today to ARK, Oakland, California, or ARK, Mass Beth, Long Island, New York. Listen again next week and every week to other factual cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Now it's the Jubilee Show on NBC. Thursday, there's Mr. King, tracer of lost persons, dragnet, and counter spy. Now it's the silent men on NBC. This is Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Once again, it is my privilege to introduce to you stories of the silent men, the special agents of federal law enforcement who silently and for little material reward daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Their tradition is long and proud, yet to guard our welfare and our liberties, they must remain nameless, the silent men. Produced in Hollywood.
Hollywood and starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents The Silent Men, transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here again is Douglas Fairbanks. The international list of narcotic violators is compiled and kept up to date by the Permanent Central Opium Board of the United Nations. It is a list of all known illicit drug dealers throughout the world. Vicious criminals who bring misery and destruction to hundreds of thousands of people every year. Number 121 on this international list was John Bartello, sometimes known as Pip the Blind, the leader of a narcotics empire that spread from coast to coast of the United States and into Mexico. Bartello's Mexican runners smuggled opium across the border. Other messengers brought it to New York where Bartello's secret factories converted it into heroin. From here, another system of dealers and peddlers fanned out across the country to sell the dope. And the dope they sold sparked much of the crime of the nation. Yes, 121 was an important number to erase from the international list. In tonight's story, I will assume the name of Special Agent Pete Jackson, one of the silent men who risked death in order to smash the empire of Pip the Blind. As Special Agent Pete Jackson, I had been assigned to Federal Narcotics in San Francisco. It was Thursday, May 5th, 1949. We had closed a local case that afternoon, and I was alone in the office at headquarters, typing out a final report for the Bureau when the call came in on the private tie line from Washington. Hello, San Francisco. Oh, who is this? Jackson? That's right. This is Blair, Pete. Oh, hello, Chief. <laughs> well, we closed a good one out here today. I was just writing it up for you. Anything big? Oh, papers of heroin, selling them through the mails. Well, that's a new one. Yeah, he had himself quite a mail order business till we canceled him out. One of our leads? No, it's a case we've been working on with the sheriff's office out here. Good. I'll read the report. The reason why I call, Pete, I have an assignment for you. Sure thing, Chief. I hate to upset your personal affairs on such short notice, but I'm afraid you'll have to leave town. Well, anything you can tell me about on the phone? I just Yes, sir. Oh, uh, better not tell anyone where you're going, even the family. Just say that you may be gone a matter of weeks. We'll keep in touch with them for you. Right. I'll be on the plane. The next evening, Chief Blair met me at LaGuardia Airport and drove me to a little used road on Long Island where a secret rendezvous had been arranged with another car. When we spotted the car, we pulled up behind it, killed the motor, and got out. There were two men in the other car. The driver nodded as we walked up alongside. Hi, Blair. Good evening, Lieutenant. Pete, this is Lieutenant Ryan of the New York City Police. Pete Jackson from San Francisco. Glad to know you, Jackson. How are you? And this is Mr. Martinez from Mexico City, who is representing the United Nations Central Opium Board. Hello. Welcome, Senor. Uh, you must be tired after your long trip. No, not too much. It was a fairly smooth flight. Yeah. Had your dinner yet? Thanks. I ate on the plane just before we landed. Oh, well, then perhaps you'd better just climb into the back seat and we'll talk here. Sure. As good a place as any. Uh, you will forgive the informality of our meeting, senor, but it would not be good for us to meet uh, more openly under the circumstances. Oh, I'm used to it. <laughs> and I tell you on the way over, Pete, the man we've been working on for such a long time is John Bartello, also known as Tip the Blind. Yeah. So Mr. Martinez's agents in Mexico, we've got a pretty good line on how he's getting the raw opium into the country. When the time comes, we can choke off the supply. Yes, but as you realize, senor, it would do no good to arrest a handful of Bartello's men in Mexico while the head of the organization remains free. Yeah, of course. And that's why we've concentrated on Bartello himself. What's that? That's just oh. oh. As I was saying, that's why we've concentrated on Bartello himself here in New York City. I see. That's been Lieutenant Ryan's department, see. Yes, ah. and we learned quite a bit about him, Jackson. We know who he is, where he lives, how he operates. You know his habits, his friends, his business connections from coast to coast. We know when he makes a big buy. We know when he makes a big sell. We still haven't been able to get enough on him personally to make a felony conviction stick. <laughs> this is still hard for me to understand, gentlemen. When we know the man is guilty and still cannot arrest him... Yes, Mr. Martinez, it's just as aggravating to us. But in order to obtain a conviction against Bartello in this country, a narcotic agent would have to actually see him hand over narcotics and accept payment or hear him order one of his men to do so before a witness. 
Uh, care for a cigarette? Yes, thanks. Yeah, Jackson, that's what fits the blind has been smart. Oh, hold the light, will you? Thanks. Now, for ten years, he's been the known head of the largest narcotics ring in the country. But he's never actually handled any of the stuff himself. Mm. And whenever he discusses a deal, he makes sure there are no possible witnesses present. That's why we brought you in from San Francisco, Pete. <laughs> and so I was beginning to surmise. You needed a new face. One that Bartello had never seen before and couldn't possibly recognize as a narco agent. According to our plan, Senor Jackson, you will have to become personally acquainted with it, Bartello. A sort of relationship will have to be established uh, so that his suspicions are not aroused. So that he will accept you as somebody in his own line of business. Hold it, there's a car coming. Uh, it's okay. Uh, as I was saying, he must accept you as someone in his own line. Uh, perhaps a competitor. Uh, perhaps a possible customer. In other words, you want me to pose as a narcotics dealer myself, is that it? That's it. Uh-huh. You're a dealer from San Francisco. Uh-huh. Not uh, too big an operator, so he wouldn't expect to know your name, but still big enough to be interesting. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, what, what is my name? You lose an inversion of your own. Jack Peter. Right. Well, now, how about my speech and general personality? A little <laughs> too academic. Not at Bartello's <laughs> level. He's got a couple of bankers and a college professor on his payroll. Is that so? Just play it straight. You're familiar enough with the West Coast narco operation so that any names or details you mention will sound legitimate to him. Mm-hmm. In fact, senor, uh, let's say the connections you have been buying from are his own outlets on the coast. Uh, perhaps your reason for being here to uh, circumvent this little man and deal directly with Bartello. Uh, this type of thinking he would understand. Uh, Jackson, one of my men has lined you up a hotel room on the Upper East Side. That's where Bartello operates from. His main front's a little Italian bar on East 105th Street. Mm-hmm. How you make contact will have to be up to you. I see. Here's the hotel address, Pete, and the uh, cover credentials establishing you as Jack Peters, California driver's license, uh-huh. identification card with a San Francisco address, Social Security card, a couple of letters addressed to you as Peters. Uh, uh, better give me the stuff out of your wallet now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. And here's some reading matter. Everything we know about Bartello's operations. Digest it tonight and return it through our Manhattan mail drop. It's got all the names you'll need. Yeah, I'll mail it tonight. Oh, uh, by the way, Pete, you need a car while you're here. Yes, I guess I will. The coupe we drove over in will be yours for the duration. No, oh, thanks. Oh, thanks. Uh, only one thing. Yes? Don't try and open up the trunk and back. Oh? I keep it locked. Well, whatever you say. When you're ready to contact us, call Lieutenant Bryan's office or in an emergency, dial my local number direct. Good luck. It took a few weeks to learn my way around and establish a pattern of habit. After a couple of nights, I dropped in for a casual drink at Bartello's favorite bar. Then I began dropping in regularly. Still no sign of Bartello. But there was no secret about this being his headquarters. He operated from a back room. Finally, one of his lieutenants started showing some interest in me. On one of his regular round trips from the back office to the jukebox, he stopped at the bar and climbed up on a stool beside me. You come in here quite a bit lately. Yeah, yeah. I see the boss likes music. I like music. Oh, no offense, Tubby. I just heard that Pip liked music. How come you know my name? We never met before. Well, it's no secret, is it? You're one of Pip the Blind's boys. I'm nobody's boy. Oh, don't get me wrong, Tubby. Uh, (laughs) Where I come from, that's considered a compliment. Pip's a pretty big operator, you know. Where are you from? San Francisco. What do you know about Pip? Well, like I said, um, Pip's a pretty big operator. Oh, he's a big operator. What do you know about him? Only that we had some um, business interests in common. Yeah. In fact, I'm one of his customers. That's interesting. Only I wonder if Pip happens to be aware of that. You see, he's the one sent me out here to find out who you are. Well, that's something I'd be happy to explain to him. Okay, mister, come on. Guy says he's a customer, Pip. He knows you. Mr. Bartello? That's right. Sit down. I'm Jack Peters, San Francisco. What can I do for you, Mr. Peters? Uh, Tubby said uh, you wanted to see me. <laughs> Just wondered what you were doing in the neighborhood is all. Uh-huh. You look lonesome coming in here every night by yourself. Oh, I'm stopping at the hotel on the corner. Well, appreciate your business. You mean you own this bar? Sure, got a whole wow. string of them all over the country. 
How do you think I make my living? Well, I, I didn't know, Mr. Bartello. Oh, call me Pip. That's my nickname, you know. Pip the Blind. Certainly, Pip. That's because I got a cast in my eye, just a little Pip. Here, this one, this little spot. They call it a Pip, you know? Yes, I see. All the kids give me this name and it sticks all these years. <laughs> kind of different, huh? Yeah. Oh, Tubby, be a good fellow. Go change the jukebox, huh? Uh, uh, sure. Sure thing. You better stay out there. Make sure it don't keep playing the same number over and over. Sure, Pip. I don't like to have too many people in the room when I talk. It makes me nervous. What's this about Tubby saying you're a customer? That's right. Been buying your stuff from Lou Warren out on the coast. Peace good. What kind of stuff? White stuff. H. Who else you know out there? Oh, Joe Cassetti, Manny Green, Donovan, Kagan, Durslag in L.A. The names are familiar. <laughs> Understand prices are high out your way. Oh, $500 an ounce is what I've been paying. That's <laughs> uh, a lot of money, but yeah. not when you figure you can resell it for 2000 and you get it cut up into cuts. Well, I can still do a lot better buying it direct from you. I only deal in kilo lot. How much? Cost you $9,000. I can handle it. Cash? I'm not quite ready well, yet. Well, let me I... know when you're in the market. We'll talk some more. I just happen to notice it's 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, I always move up to my place in Harlem. Another bar? The White Kitten. I like the music up there. Just another jukebox like I got here, but somehow it sounds different. Maybe the atmosphere. You ought to drop in sometime. The White Kitten? Yeah. Anytime after 10. Quite a place. Uh -huh. <laughs> first meeting with Pip, I knew that I had been accepted as a narcotics dealer. And after a few more contacts, I was ready to make my move. I phoned Lieutenant Ryan's office for a meeting with Chief Blair, and once again, our rendezvous was the deserted road near the airport on Long Island. It was just after dark when I drove up behind Lieutenant Ryan's car. It's a little late, Pete. Any trouble? No, I doubled back a couple of times to make sure I wasn't being tailed. That's what took so long. Want to get in? Uh, Lieutenant Ryan, well, I'll stand out here. be more room. Well, how are you, Lieutenant? Oh, can't complain. Hey, what's with the crutches? Uh, they're for you. A lot of bandages here, too. I'm afraid you're going to meet with a little accident, Pete. Well, <laughs> line of duty, I guess. I'll take your shoe off. You kidding? No. Uh, okay. Um, your report, Pete, but fellow seems to stick pretty close to that back room of his. Yeah, that's right. It's um, where he does all his business. Sock off to Please. Okay. He, um, he won't talk with anyone else in the room, so it's going to be practically impossible to get witnesses. And that's the reason we're fixing you up with a bum leg. You've got to get Bartello out of his club and into this car. This car? That's a... Wow. It's a pretty special buggy you've been riding around in. Wire recording? More than that. I just told you to leg up on the seat now and I can start wrapping it. Okay. It's got to look like there's a splint under the bandage. Hmm. I have an idea that's why you didn't want the trunk unlocked. I think <laughs> to show you the expense account on this job, I'll we tore out the entire back so that the man can ride comfortably in the trunk. Tonight, when you make your contact, Lieutenant Ryan is going along. I'll be riding shotgun. Oh, uh, let me get these hands. Uh, the lieutenant will be your witness. The way it's fixed, he can see out of the car in any direction, including the front seat. Yeah, there's a mic built in right there behind the ashtray. Two-way in it, car. You want to talk to me, just push the cigarette lighter on the dashboard. Yes. Yeah. Well, that leg looks pretty good. Yeah. Or bad. <laughs> I don't think you could walk on it now if you wanted to. <laughs> the department's plan had been carefully worked out. Not only was my car specially rigged, but another innocent-looking pickup truck had been reconstructed to carry more concealed agents, armed with both guns and high-powered cameras. They would be parked across the street from Bartello's place when we got there. Now, with my leg bandaged, crutches leaning against the front seat where they'd show, and Lieutenant Ryan riding in the trunk compartment as a witness, I drove back to Upper Manhattan for the crucial contact with Pip the Blind. It was a little past nine when I pulled up in front of the bar. We're there, Lieutenant. So I say. And there's our truck parked across the street, right where they said it would be. What's all the racket? Hello, Tubby. Oh, it's you. Pip inside? Yeah. Uh, what's with the leg? Oh, I broke a little bone in my foot. Can't walk on it. That's too bad. What do you want with Pip? 
I got a deal working. Can you call him out here? You know, Pep, don't ever talk to nobody on the street. You'll have to come inside. But I tell you, Tommy, I can't put any weight on his leg. I, and I've got to see him right away. Well, no. I'll see what he says. Tell him it's big. A kilo. I'll tell him. Lieutenant. If he comes out. Truck over there. Just sitting there in the loading zone. As though the driver's inside someplace making a pickup. I know, but those kids playing around. Hope they don't get between us. Cut off. Someone's coming. It's him. Hello, Pip. What's the matter? You get banged up? Chipped a bone in my foot. Slipped on the street the other day, and this is what happened. <laughs> yeah, you're getting old, Joe. Yeah. Get in, Pip. Yeah. Uh, well? Can I tell you what I wanted? No, you just said you wanted to see me. I've got a fast deal for a kilo of eight. I've got to have it right away. That's hard to get nowadays. I don't know if I can help it. Pip, it's important. This party's a big dealer in Harlem. If I can deliver right, he'll be an important customer. You got the cash? Seven thousand. My pressure's nine, you know that. I know, Pip, but I've got to sell it for nine. That's the only way I can make my deal. I don't cut my price. Well, that means I won't make a dime out of it. Well, yeah. tell you what. This time only I'll make it eight thousand. That means you make a grand. From now on, it's nine G's. Thanks. Thanks, Pip, if it's... If it's quality stuff, I'm sure you'll pay more. What? Well, he's been getting us so cut up with powdered milk sugar to use it won't take it. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the quality of my stuff. It's kind of a leg I can't get out of the carpet, so if you could bring the stuff out, I'd, I'd appreciate it. You? Yes. I'll give you the money now if you like. You think I'm nuts? I don't do no business here. I run a respectable bar and talk to a few friends, that's all. Stubby will take care of him. Well, any way you want to handle it, Pitt. Stubby? Yeah, Pitt. Put your head in. Yeah. Mr. Peter's ready to make a buy. I promised him a kilo of heroin. Sure, Pip. You got enough on him? Mm-hmm. Plenty. Okay, then you two get together and make a meet someplace. Someplace safe. Okay. From now on, you deal with Dubby. Uh, about the price, Pip, don't you? You think you'd better explain? Oh, it? yeah. This time only, Tubby. Eight thousand. No on the regular price. I got it. And I'm counting on you guys to make sure your meets are changed each time you connect. Don't worry, Pip. I'll, I'll see that change. You better get in with him, Tubby. Sure. Take care of the left. Thanks, Pip. Okay, when do we meet? It's got to be tonight. Okay, but the later the better. Well, um, how about one o'clock? Say the corner of 93rd and Broadway. Mm, make it one o'clock. Only I tell you where. Uh, you still live in the hotel on the corner? That's right. I'll be in your room. I'll phone you later. Yeah. 
You'll get it after I keep the dog. Okay, Here's your package, Peter. Thanks for the business. Give it a hint, kid. Tubby's messenger dumped the brown paper package into my front seat, and they both hopped into the cab. I waited till they were lost in traffic and then drove back downtown by a roundabout route to headquarters. Lieutenant Ryan got out of his hideaway in the trunk compartment in the presence of the chief and other agents. We opened up the brown paper package. Inside were two large, glancing envelopes filled with heroin. This was the evidence the Bureau had been waiting for. At last, we had the goods on number 121 of the international list. We planned the roundup for late that night. The bar on 106th Street presented too many problems, so we waited until Pippa Blind had transferred his operations uptown to his Harlem Club, the White Kitten. It was just after 12 when Lieutenant Ryan, Chief Blair, and I entered the club. <laughs> Well, Dave, we're jumping tonight. We're mm-hmm. too crowded for comfort. Well, let's hope there won't be any action. You see him, Dave? Sitting at a table towards the back. Well, fellas like a drink? No, thanks. No tables left, but you can get a drink at the bar. Thanks very hey, much. You looking for someone? Sort of. Well, you're looking for trouble. <laughs> Nothing like that, son. There he is. Come on. I tell you, we don't like people coming in here looking for trouble. Somebody say trouble? Your name's John Bartello? That's right. Also known as Tip the Blind? That's me. Who turned off the music? Shall I turn it back on, Pep? No, no, never mind, Tilly. We're federal agents, Mr. Bartolo. So we're federal agents. That's all my income tax. You know this man? Which one? You mean it's me, Pep. Never seen him before in my life. Pep's been better disguised as outside. So sure you've seen him, Pep. He's a guy been coming into the other bar lately. I'm a special agent, Pep. You'd better come along. Is this a pinch? You too, Tilly. <laughs> okay, so we'll discuss it outside. Turn on that music again, somebody. I want to hear something hot when I get back. Okay, Pep. This is ridiculous. You've got nothing on us. I run a respectable business. My lawyer will help me out before we get downtown. You've got no evidence. I'm afraid this time you're mistaken, Pep. You recognize that car at the curb? That's Mr. Peter's car. So what? The man you claim you never saw before in your life. So we happen to have photographs of the two of you sitting in the front seat of that car. Okay, so I know him, so I sat in his car. Some law says I can't. He, uh, he was trying to sell me the car. Then you should have bought it, Pip, because in the back trunk of that car, the evidence is going to put you away for a long time. <laughs> Not me, pal. I never talk in front of witnesses. Let's go, boys. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The smashing of the empire of Pip the Blind closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving atomic secrets and treason, the file case entitled The Case of the Rubber Gloves, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. The Silent Man is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Mr. Lewis and transcribed in Hollywood. All names and places were fictional. And any resemblance to persons living or dead was purely coincidental. Featured in tonight's cast were Herb Butterfield as Chief Blair, 
Paul Freeze as Lieutenant Ryan, Jan Arvan as the Envoy Martinez, Ed Max as Tubby, and Lou Merrill as Pip the Blind. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Douglas Fairbanks may currently be seen in the motion picture, Mr. Drake's Duck. Here again is Douglas Fairbanks. There are 10 million Korean refugees. Three million have literally no house or town to go back to. They are completely and utterly destitute. Over two million have already died of wounds or exposure since fighting began. Many more millions of innocent Koreans will die this coming winter unless you give your unneeded clothing today to American Relief for Korea. That's ARK. A-R-K. Unless your church, your local Y, or AWBS can collect them, please send your used clothing prepaid today to ARK, Oakland, California, or to ARK, Master, Long Island, New York. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Monday means more fine music on NBC. This month... And now, it's the Silent Men on NBC. This is Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Once again, it is my privilege to introduce to you stories of the Silent Men, the special agents of federal law enforcement who, silently and for little material reward, daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Their tradition is long and proud, yet to safeguard our welfare and our liberties, they must remain nameless. The Silent Men. <laughs> in Hollywood and starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents The Silent Men, transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here again is Douglas Fairbanks. Good evening. The past few years of post-war turbulence all over the world have created a fraternity of international racketeers unmatched in history for versatility and viciousness. Merchants of espionage, professional political agitators, black marketeers, counterfeiters, narcotics traffickers. Adept at every kind of crime from smuggling to murder, these international renegades are making capital of the present world tension. To combat them, our silent men are fighting the grimmest battle in their history, at the risk of their lives, with little publicity and with the future welfare and security of every one of us in their hands. Who are these silent men to whom we owe so much? Tonight, I will assume the identity of one of them, Special Agent James Cooper, Enforcement Division, Bureau of Commerce, in our file case of The Rubber Gloves. <laughs> Coop. All right. Catching up on your paperwork? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, just checking applications. Export licenses for critical materials. How's Nancy? Uh, getting tired of waiting. Pretty soon now, isn't it? Any day. Well, what's it going to be? Boy or girl? Girl. <laughs> you sound pretty sure. Of course. Well, better let Nancy know so she can cooperate and... What's the matter? Huh. This export application I was checking. Chavez and Company, Barcelona. That name sounds familiar to you? Hmm. Chavez. Yeah. Yeah, ring some sort of bell. Me too. Wait. I think I've got it. Should be in the notebook here. Yeah. Chavez and Company, Barcelona. Suspected as transshipment agency for strategic military materials to Eastern European countries. 
Investigate carefully all requests for exports to this firm. Now, what's being exported to them? Rubber gloves. Rubber gloves? That's right, Larry. Here's the application for export license. Take a look. Mm. Request to export ten cases of long rubber gloves to Chavez and Company, Barcelona. I don't get it, Coop. Neither do I. What? Maybe the chief will. <laughs> Rubber gloves. That sounds innocent enough, Cooper. Yes, sir, but Travis and Company isn't. Yeah, they are. Such a clever outfit like that will occasionally include a harmless order to keep us guessing. All the same, we better find out as much about those rubber gloves as we can. I have a call into the general manager of the manufacturing company, Chief. They'll put it through here to your office. Good. Yeah. Rubber gloves. Now, why would Chavez and Company want rubber gloves? Well, according to their application, they want to sell to various industrial chemical concerns in Spain. Oh, could be my call. Oh, Hello? Hello, Mr. Cooper? Yeah? This is Ramsford of Avalite Rubber Products. Oh, yes, Miss Ramsford. I'm Special Agent James Cooper here at the Enforcement Division, Bureau of Commerce. What can I do for you, Cooper? Your company recently filled an order for export, sir. Ten cases of long rubber gloves. Now, that's fine. Hmm? I've been thinking about calling you fellas on that. Oh? Uh, just a minute. You, you've been making that type of rubber glove for our government? Yeah, that's right. Gloves are made of a special compound we've only recently developed according to government specifications. Huh. I understood unofficially that the gloves were for use in connection with a so-called Project 1065. That means anything to you. Yes, it certainly does, Mr. Ransford. Thanks. Chief, those gloves are the same kind that our boys have been using in Project 1065. 1065? Yes. The latest sequence of experiments on atomic fission. These two words, atomic fission, one sent a motion of swift series of events that would have far reaching consequences. Hurried late night conferences were held. The decision was made. As was a grim faced chief who called Martin and myself into his office the next morning. Cooper, that application for expert license on the rubber gloves. Approve it. Approve it? That's right. But, Chief, we know what those gloves were designed for. That's the point, Martin. Now, look, here's the background. Project 1065 is a series of experiments concerned with one phase of a manufacture of atomic weapons. Now, without going into the technical side of it too much, this phase will reduce the time and procedures necessary in the manufacture of these weapons by as much as 40%. Red hot, huh? Yes. Now, shortly after the project started, one of the scientists who was working on it went sour on it. A nuclear physicist named Frederick Kleber. I mean, he got out of the country before we could grab him. Kleber, sure, sure. That was about three months ago, wasn't it? That's right. Now, we think he's somewhere in Europe, hiding. We also think he learned enough to duplicate the experiment. Well, that is up to a certain point. What do you mean? Well, in the crucial phases of these experiments, there's an increased danger from radiation. And since this part of the work must be done by human hands, increased protection is necessary. The rubber glove. That's right. Made of a special compound. The only compound yet developed that's strong enough to withstand radiation. And yet, possible enough to permit the extremely delicate work necessary in the experiment. And yet, you say for me to locate a license to export the gloves. Exactly. Yeah, but wait a minute. Are we by any chance going to export something else with the gloves? Well, we are. Two special agents. Martin? Mm-hmm. 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 Tag along and keep an eye on us. Huh? It's vital we find out just where those gloves are going. I don't think it's Barcelona. Or if it is, that, that they'll stay there long. Any line on their final destination? None at all. That's up to the two of you to find out. Well, where are the gloves now? And they're in a book in the warehouse. The day after tomorrow, the Sarah B. Alston, a freighter with accommodations for a few passengers, will sail from Norfolk, Virginia. She arrives in New York the next day to complete loading. She included the gloves. And then she shoves off for Barcelona. With two more passengers. Oh, no. I'm not saying you're passengers. You're going to be deck there. What? Deck hand. Well, you think we know enough about it to pass? Yeah, there's a man named Kovac waiting for you in the next office. He may get hands out of him. Good. <laughs> now, I want you and the crew so you'll be able to keep a closer watch on the crate. I know you can't roof them in the hold all the way over, but stick as close as you can and follow them to their final destination. We hope the trail will lead you to Frederick Kleber. Any questions? No. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, Martin, this job comes at a rather awkward time for you, isn't it? A little. Uh, your wife. Nothing new. No. Still waiting. Oh, well, I'm sorry I have to send you out, but this is something you can't wait. Sure. Well, come on, sailor. Just one thing more. Now, you're going to be watching these crates. I have an idea the outfit we're after will also have them in watching them. 
to make sure they get to their destination and to prevent anyone from finding out what that destination is. So, watch yourself. Martin and I reported to Kovac, and the job of transforming us into passable deckhands began. When Kovac pronounced us ready, we decided to split up so no connection would be established between us. Martin flew to Norfolk and boarded the ship from there. I picked it up in New York. A long voyage began. We were assigned a different watch section so we could take turns keeping an eye on cargo hold number three, where the gloves were. But nobody went near it. The days it sea slid by uneventfully, quietly. Perhaps a little too quietly. Martin and I kept away from each other until the night before we were to dock at Barcelona. Then we met at the rail near the stern. Michael, how's it going, man? Okay. You? Fine. Oh, yeah. Anything about that? No, not a thing. Been pretty dull. I know. You understand the passengers or crew showing an interest in the cargo? Not a show. I don't think. Watch it, watch it. That hand coming. Uh, let me see. Uh, Sally Barnes, a uh, redhead, isn't she? Yeah, that's the one. Oh, sure, I know. Last time in Frisco, we were... Oh, I'd either have you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure, mate. There you go. Yeah, keep it out of the way. Uh, thanks. Sure. Yeah. Nice night. Yep. Like I was saying, this play of balance to me was... Mm. What a way for a married man to talk. You got to say? Uh-huh. Who is he? Name's Samson. Have you tried to get acquainted with him? No, not particularly. We're in the same watch section. I see. Well, we'd better break it up now. Look, we'll be docking in Barcelona tomorrow. From what I understand, the cargo will be unloaded into a warehouse on the dock. Mm -hmm. I heard one of the deckhands talking about a waterfront bar close by the dock. As soon as we get ashore tomorrow afternoon, let's um, let's meet there. Right. See you in Barcelona. These two stools at the end of the barn. Okay. You can see the warehouse from here. We won't be able to go on getting pretty dark. Well, when it does, we can move outside. We may have a long wait. Uh huh. But we know that crate of gloves is in the warehouse. Sooner or later, it's got to be delivered somewhere. No, but sooner instead of later, I can think of places I'd rather be right now. Yeah, I can imagine. Must be pretty rough not knowing whether you're a father yet. Yeah? yeah, so it is. Still going to be a girl? Sure. A girl? You got some to wear like me, uh, no? No, you see, we... Oh, a little bachelor. How about you, mister? You <laughs> don't look so bad, but you back on to wear like me? Well, ordinarily, I'd be delighted, Consuela, but you see, we're already expecting some young ladies. Oh, I could make you forget the young ladies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh. I think you're being paid. Why you do not answer when I call you? I answer when I feel like it. Do not talk to me that way. Who do you think you are to tell me how I don't talk? What are you doing here with these uh, people? Look, I'm sure... You are my girl. You don't tell me who girl I am, I show you. I go with these two. I like them better than you. Now, just a minute. I'm sure... Well, tell me. you come with me. Oh, of me? I said come with me. Oh. Hey, you. Larry, no, cut it out. But cool. Don't you see what they're up to? I tell you what I mean. I said, hear me. It was those two. They started it. They tried to make us well leave me and go with them. Larry, let's get out of here. Yeah. Oh. Oh, thanks, Coop. The big deal I almost fell for. Oh, forget it. Let's get around this corner out of sight. Yeah. Yeah. Coop, they must have us pegged. That's all we be done to put us out of the way. Hard right, to take our minds off the warehouse. Look, this. Huh? Old truck pulling up to the side entrance. Quick, back in the shadow. Yeah. Men getting out there. Hey, our friend Samson. The deckhand who asked us for a light aboard ship. Open the warehouse door. Now he's getting back in the truck. That's it inside. I'd give odds to have those rubber gloves. Come on, Larry. It looks like the trail's heating up. Martin and I headed our way into the darkened warehouse. Over on one side, we could see the outline of a small truck and Samson's flashlight bobbing around near the tailgate. We worked our way carefully along behind a long row of crates until we were close enough to see what Samson was doing. But what we saw surprised us. Samson had pried open the crate and had dumped the special compound rubber gloves on the floor. He now took an armload of other rubber gloves from his truck and refilled the empty crate with them. I don't get it, Coop. Why the switch? 
quick. Now he's tried the board off the side of another crate. Uh. <laughs> Looks like little straw basket. Uh. Look. He's slipping the special compound gloves into that crate under the straw basket. Uh. Hmm. Nearing both crates up again. I still don't get it. I think I'm beginning to. But I won't know for sure until we can get close enough for a look at those two crates. All through. Mm, we better get down. He's driving it out. Okay, now let's take a look. All right. Well, I'm beginning to think that Chavez and companies are pretty smart out there. What do you mean? Watch it. Barrel on the list. Oh, yeah, thanks. Here we are. Now, figure it this way. The goal in that bar was either to put us out of the way or at least keep us occupied until the switch was made. Got your lighter? Let's look at the crate. Yeah. Here. Uh-huh. The first one's the crate we followed across the ocean, see? Chavez and Company, Barcelona. We mm, know it's full of another kind of rubber gloves, probably quite ordinary ones. And now the gloves we're interested in is the second crate. Underneath a bunch of small straw baskets. Mm. This is in German. Gerda Candy Company. 26 curling starts of Vienna, Austria. <laughs> Vienna? What do you know? Hmm, pretty neat, isn't it? Chavez sells these substitute gloves to his various customers here in Spain. Well, that way, if anybody checks up on him, he's in the clear and all very innocent. In the meantime, the real gloves don't need to be on any crate of candy bath. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, I guess then is our next stop, April. No, nope. I'd say our next stop is that Chavez and Company right here in Barcelona. What? Well, it seems to me Chavez has gone to a lot of trouble to set up this thing. Doesn't it think it'd be nice of us to fall for it? Oh. You know, I think you've got something there. As long as Chavez is aware of our identity already, we're not looking at it. And right now, it's worth a lot to us to make him think we picked up the wrong trail. Okay, what do we do? Are you calling him? I don't think we have to go that far. Remember, all we want to do is convince him we don't know about the switch. And I think the best way to do that is to make like a couple of pop magazine detectives tomorrow morning. shipping line, we learned the ship was bound for Genoa to rest. Through our legation in Barcelona, we communicated with the authorities in Genoa, requesting them to keep the crate under observation. Next, I put through a telephone call to Police Lieutenant Hammond Hussel in Vienna, a man we worked with before. I asked him to keep the candy shop under surveillance until we arrived. Then, at dawn, Martin and I returned to the waterfront of the waste room. An hour later, a truck pulled up at the warehouse, and the crate containing the substitute grubs was loaded aboard. We followed the truck to the offices of Chavez and Company and took up post across the street from the receiving entrance where we could both see and be seen. We managed to present quite the conventional appearance. Hats pulled down, leaning against the lamppost and <laughs> reading newspapers. No, I feel kind of silly standing here like this. You know, you look kind of silly. Okay, okay. <laughs> you look like a fugitive from a great B-movie yourself. And you listen to the on a paper about the birth of your daughter? It might be. I could read Spanish. Think it's happened yet? It should have by now. <laughs> what is it? Curtain in the second story window has moved a couple of times. Could be Chavez watching us. I'm telling you. They've got those funny gloves all uncrated. Looks like they're making up small bundles of them. Probably to be delivered around the city. Uh huh. They're uh, throwing them in the truck. Do we tag along? For the first stop or two. That should be enough. The well, one thing, Coop. They think we're off the trail. It may be easier to navigate with the line. Right. Besides, I'd much rather have them think we're a little on the stupid side instead of having to dodge bullets all the way to Vienna. We followed the truck while it made the first two deliveries. Now it was time to drop the game and get back on the right trail. We took the next plane to Madrid and from there to Paris and finally... Vienna. Lieutenant Hansel was waiting for us at the airport. Hooper! Martin! There he is. Over here! Right. Well, <laughs> how are you, Hansel? I'm fine. And the two of you? Okay. Uh, it's good to see you. It's been quite a while, hasn't it? Yeah, just over a year. Look, look, I'll show you something, Cooper. Huh? Don't you see? My wristwatch. Oh, of 
course, I'd forgotten. Huh? <laughs> yeah, last time I was here, Hunter took a fancy to my watch. I guess it was all the various dials and gadgets we got into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I get one just like it. it, it oh, no, wait, that band. You have a different one. Uh huh, an expansion band. See? Oh, believe I never catch up with you. <laughs> well, don't worry. I'll send you one from the States as soon as we get back. Good, good, that's good. Now, come. My car is outside there. Now, right. Oh, but it's new as you two. No, nothing much, except of course Martin's daughter. His daughter? Oh, that is good. That's good. Congratulations. Well, thanks, but she hasn't exactly been born yet, I don't think. Well, what is this? She's not born yet, but already you know she's a daughter? Oh, in my, my, in the United States, they make all guys in everything. Good. Here we are. Now, get down to business. We have been keeping an eye on your candy shop. Oh? Uh, I think you're on the right track. Is that anything interesting with the candy shop? Not yet, but it's uh, quite a scientist of yours whom you think is implicated. Let me tell you. Yeah. yeah. A man answering his description of seen briefly yesterday in the same block as the candy shop. It's quite possible he's hiding there. Yes. The candy shop could, um, could probably be conducting his experiments there, is it? Well, that is hard to say. There apparently is the shop in front, a back room. Living for us upstairs and the basement. Mm. What is in the basement, we don't know. You want to, sir? An elderly woman, a uh, far dear boss. And you have it under constant observation, huh? Yeah, as you will see. Uh, we are going to that street now. <laughs> Down on the other side of the street. Well, that's the candy shop, eh? Yeah. Where are you, man? Uh, here on the scaffold across the street. The painter. Yeah, here, son. And then down the block, the taxi cab park. The drivers also run. Mm -hmm. And then here to our right, the window washer. We'll get it covered, don't we? <laughs> you got a place picked out for us? Yeah, across the street from the candy shop. That uh, front room on the second floor. Yes. And here's the key. Oh, fine, thanks. Each of the lookouts is equipped with a hand mirror. If they wish to attract the attention for any reason, they will flash it at your window. Right. That uh, kite is en route here from Genoa by railroad. That should arrive around 4 o'clock this afternoon. And as soon as it leaves the depot, I will communicate with you. There's a telephone in your room. Uh, sounds like you've provided for just about everything, Mr. Hammond. Well, I hope so. Huh? Come on, Coop. Nothing to do now but go up to the room and wait. Uh -huh. Until the crate shows up. The second it does, we close in. <laughs> Like the door? Yeah. And the light switch. Hmm. Empty. He's out of an old room. Don't worry, you won't be harmed. Let me get first but a bedroom, Coop. That hole, does it lead to the back door, Frau Gerber? Yeah, yeah. Now, please, you... Come on. I don't get it, Coop. Neither do I. No sign of the crate. Or the truck. Truck could have shoved the crate off and kept going on down the alley, but I expect to find the crate in the candy shop, along with Frederick Kroeber and his outfit. I must have guessed wrong, Coop. But how? Where did we go wrong? I. Wait a minute. Hmm? What's the matter? I don't think we went wrong after all, Larry. Look, on the other side of the alley, right here. You mean that building? Uh huh. Looks like it used to be a factory or a warehouse, but it's all boarded up. Hey, there in the dust. Yeah. Yeah, 
footprints leading to the door and the mark of something heavy having been dragged there. It must have been the crate. Addressing it to the candy shop was just a cover. But the door. So I brought it up. No. It just looks that way. See, the door opens in. The boards around the sill inside just disappear. Okay, old one. Drop your guns. Drop them fast. Okay. Now, one of you go back and push that door shut. I'll, uh, I'll get it. Lock it. Now, come back here. We'll get a little light. And uh, my two old pals from the ship, huh? I thought I recognized your voice, Samson. Down those stairs, both of you. Don't get ideas. I'll be right behind you. Come on, move. Look down there, Coop. Spit it out like a lion. Uh-huh. Two men. The one who started the fight in the Barcelona brawl and... Yeah. You recognize the second one? Come on. Okay. A pretty scientist, Frederick Kleiber. Come on, Enrique. Little job to be taken care of with these two snooper boys. All right, with that. The alley door. Hoopa! Down here! 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 Well, I don't think we'll have much trouble getting extradition on Claver so we can face a treason charge. I'm quite certain he will not. And with Claver in jail, the security of Project 1065 is intact again. I still don't understand how you happened to find us when you did, Lieutenant. I just must have happened to. Huh? My. Uh, here is your wristwatch back, Cooper. Oh, thanks. Wristwatch? Yeah, sure. Remember that alley door? It opened in. When Samson told me to push it shut, I slipped my watch off and hung it on the outside doorknob. Then when the door was closed, the watch was hanging out in the alley. So I was Well, the other and the candy shop told me that you had gone into the alley, so when I saw the watch, I... Good heavens, in excitement, I forgot all about it. All about what? Martin, for you, a cable has come from back home. The stork. It has eyes. What? Yeah, and all this talk of yours that it would be a girl. You know you were right. I... Huh? You mean it actually is a girl? Yeah. What? Well, <laughs> I sort of hoped it would be a boy. What? Yeah. I thought if I kept saying girl, it would be a boy. <laughs> oh, I give up. <laughs> girl. Oh, about that. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The case of the rubber gloves completes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of the silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story of espionage in the file case entitled Death in the Mail, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> Produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Bob Wright and transcribed in Hollywood. All names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were John Stevenson, Howard McNear, Raymond Burr, Betty Lou Gerson, Don Diamond, and Ben Wright. Your announcer is John Stanley. Douglas Fairbanks may currently be seen starring in Mr. Drake's Duck. Here again is Douglas Fairbanks. Millions of innocent Koreans will die this coming winter. Unless you give your unneeded clothing today to American Relief for Korea. That's ARK. A-R-K. Unless you have a local collection agency, please send your used clothing prepaid today to ARK, Oakland, California, or ARK, Mass Long Island, New York. Thank you. <laughs> The 
Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Now, it's the Jubilee Show on NBC. For pictures of your favorite NBC stars, buy the current NBC Silver Jubilee issue of Radio TV Mirror Magazine. And now, it's The Silent Men on NBC. This is Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Once again, it is my privilege to introduce to you stories of The Silent Men, the special agents of federal law enforcement who, silently and for little material reward, daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Their tradition is long and proud. Yet to guard our welfare and our liberties, they must remain nameless. The Silent Men. Produced in Hollywood and starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., proudly presents The Silent Men, transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here again is Douglas Fairbanks. We take our postal services for granted in the United States, but the people who handle the mail we receive every morning are not automatons. They render public service of the highest caliber and in the course of that service sometimes lose their lives. The loss of life can be accidental, but sometimes it is deliberate. And it becomes a case for the silent men because the post office department, like all branches of our federal government, has its own group of special agents. Silent men who stand between us and unexpected destruction. Tonight, with your permission, I will play the role of one of these men. Special agent Bill Foster in the file case entitled Death in the Mail. Got here in a hurry, Foster. Well, you called me in a hurry. As soon as we found out the nature of the wreck, we discovered the explosion was in the mail car. Well, I knew it wasn't a case of the city police. Hey, you see what it did? Yeah. How about the men in the car? There are two dead, one in the hospital. Oh. Well, where did this thing come from? Started in Laredo. Picked up mail here at Baton Rouge, too. Just heading out of the yards when she blew. Everybody's been kept away from here except the firemen and a few others that had to get close. Well, let's take a look inside. Yeah, I'll give you a boost. Yeah. 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 Burned too badly. Smells like the explosion came from the nitro charge. Mm-hmm. That's what I thought. What, whatever it was, it must have been in that package. I don't know. There's quite a few packages blown to bits. Yeah, but the, the wrapping on that one was blown out. Not much of it left. Might be just enough, if it can be handled properly until the lab man looks it over. See any other pieces around that might be from the same wrapping? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's one. Hmm. Now, take a look at this. It's pretty badly twisted up. Metal. Hmm. Looks like silver, some kind of trophy. You know if the men on this car were hit with flying metal at all? Yes, the uh, ambulance dog dug a piece out of one of them. Why? Because there was something inside this thing, still, still see part of it, like a mechanism. You mean a bomb? Yeah. When I was right, this wasn't an accident. Uh, would you send nitro through the mail? <laughs> no. The only accident is that this thing killed the wrong men. It was intended for somebody else. Whoever it was, he's lucky this is one package he'll never receive. I got a pair of rubber gloves and tweezers and a few other tools and gathered the pieces of the package together for shipping to the federal laboratories in Washington. 
Two days later, I got an order to report to the chief of postal inspection. Now sit down, Foster. <sighs> Thanks, Chief. This is Mike Roberts. He's with another service. Roberts? Foster, that's quite a package you sent through. Lab find anything that'll help us, Chief? A couple of things. We were able to restore part of the address. Enough to tell us that the package was addressed to somebody in Washington. Mailed from Laredo, Texas. Well, is that why you're here, Robert? That's right, Foster. Then this isn't strictly a post office case, eh? Well, that we don't know. I, I'm just coming along to make sure. Well, you boys only handle two kinds of cases. Counterfeiting, which has nothing to do with this one. And protecting the president, is that it? That's right. Chief, you'd better show him those lab photos. Oh, yes. Here, take a look. Yes, I see what you mean. The paper was badly charred, but the ultraviolet brought out those few letters, the G-T-O-N and the capitalized D.C. Well, that'll be Washington, D.C., all right. But uh, I, I don't see where you come in, Robert. There are a million people in D.C. That's right. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, where do we start, Laredo? Uh, we can start you further back than that. We think we know where the package originated. Uh, there's a lab analysis we brought on the back of those photos. Oh, yes, I see. There was some engraving on that silver. Yeah, I see it here. Hand work, Indian design. Old Aztec pattern. Mexican, huh? Yes. It wasn't a common piece, either. So the report says. If only we knew where the piece came from. Well, the best bet is Mexico City. Any reason for thinking so? The cord the package was bound with is a type made only in Mexico City. Start there. Good. Public credentials are being drawn up for us now. What kind? <laughs> You're going back to school, Foster. Classes at the university there are very popular with Americans. And they don't start for three weeks. You'll apply for enrollment. That will be a good reason for being around in case anybody gets curious. Okay. Anything you want before you go? I wish that silver cup could be reconstructed by an artist, a, a drawing of what it might have looked like originally. Your boss is a jump ahead of you. It's being drawn up now. Uh, I should have known. It'll be ready in an hour. As soon as it is, I'll drive you out to the airport. At Mexico City, we checked in to the Hotel Reforma, then started to tour the town, the silver shops, places that worked the metal by hand. We concentrated on the Indian section near the junction of the Alameda and the Paseo. For three days, we drew a blank. Maybe we should be looking closer to the center of the city, back by the Avenida Madero. I don't think so. Wait a minute. What is it? Look at that shop. It's not a silver shop. It's leather and fabrics. That up there hanging there, hand-woven. See it? Yeah. Look at the design on the border. Hey, hey, it's the same design as the one on our silver cup. There's no sign of any metal goods around there. Huh? Well, let's ask the man. Something for the senores? Um, we were interested in this, uh, zarape. It is all woven by hand, senor, and the finest of looms. If you would like it, the price is 14 pesos. Mm, I don't know. Um, zarape is not much use to me. We were attracted by the design. Oh? A design like that would look good in metal, in silver. Come into the shop, senor. Come on. Come on. We can talk better here in the store. Who sent you to me? Well, I, um, I, I don't like to say. Why not, senor? Uh, we don't know who you are. I keep this shop. You were interested in this harapi. We were interested uh, and attracted by the design, that's all. Then you were not sent to me, eh? No. I, uh, I just thought you might have something with that same design. Uh, that's all, something in silver. I carry no silver, senor. Uh, you know anybody who does? I'm not familiar with the vendors of silver, senor. So why don't you just buy the Zarapi then, Bill? Okay, we'll take it. You said uh, 14 pesos? The senor is a tourist? Uh, no, no, we're here for a two-year course at the university. We're looking around for a few room decorations. Well, that's why I want a design like this in metal. Well, here's your money. It will not be necessary to pay now, senor. You will pay when delivery is made. Delivery? Si, senor. Delivery. Oh, that's right. We can take it with us. It will have to be delivered, senor. Why? This is the only therapy of that kind that I have. I will need it for display until another arrives. I don't sell that many of them. One never knows, senor. 
You wish to have it delivered or no? We'll take it. It's all right, it's all right. Yes, um, you can deliver it. And the name and address? William Foster at the Reformer. Senor William Foster, the Reformer. When can I have it? As soon as I can obtain another. Perhaps tonight. Come on, Robert. Buenos dias, senores. Y muchas gracias for your patronage. We almost stepped into something there. Yeah. A design of some sort of an identification. I know it. When he asked who sent us, he was expecting some sort of code answer. Should have tried to bluff a name. It wouldn't have worked. Oh, but it, well, it might have thrown him off for a little while. What do you mean? Oh, we made a mistake, Bill. He knows we weren't interested in that design by accident. We might be able to cover. Oh, how? You, you check my enrollment at the university. That'll work for us. And we gave the right address. Yeah, that might help. Hey, wait a minute, will you? Hold it. What's the matter? I'll tell you in a second. Drift over to the shop here and look at the Rashi. Very firm Rashi, senor. Very comfortable. Cheap. Very cheap. You got a pair in size 10? Oh, si, si, senor. I will get them for you, eh? Watch out. I'll just, in just a second, turn your head casually over your shoulder and left. Right. Don't see anything. Notice the kid? The one sitting on the curb back there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when that Mexican took us back into his store and there was a small window, I happened to glance out. There was a kid out back in a hammock. That same kid? Well, I'm not sure. Are you tagging him? We'll know in a minute. If he keeps it's following... That same, senor. The last pair in your size. All handmade by the best craftsman. Why? How much? Uh, six pesos. They are worth more than four. Uh, five. I give you for five, senor. Only because it's the last paying of five. No, well, that's a great reason. All right, here you go. Gracias, senor. Okay. Don't look back. Well, we've got to see him. Cross to the far side of the street at the next corner. We can spot him when we cross. Oh, okay. Let's put on a show for him. What kind? Oh, we've got something to report when he goes back. There's a bookshop near the Reformer. Pick up some of the textbooks they use at the university. Uh, Joe College for real, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if this takes long enough, we'll actually have to go to school. Don't worry. It won't take that long. i got a hunch it won't take long at all. Morrison. American? What else? I hope I'm not disturbing you. Not at all. You're new here, aren't you? Well, I've been here a couple of days. Mm, I knew it wasn't long. I haven't seen you before. My room is just down the hall. My name's Foster, Bill Foster. This is Mike Roberts. Mike, this Miss Morrison. Delighted. <laughs> Call me Leslie. And I don't know how delighted you're going to be when you find out what I've done. I could use a drink if anybody cares. We don't have anything here. I, I, I could send Oh, something. no, no. Don't bother. I don't have much time at the moment. You can buy me one in the bar later. We'll be there. I just stopped by to apologize. You see, this package was delivered to my room. I ordered some things from one of the shops, and, well, I thought it was mine. But it's yours. Oh, well, there's no harm done. No, but you owe me 14 pesos. Oh, <laughs> well, that's right. Here, here you are. Thanks. I, well, thinking it was mine, I opened the package. I tried to wrap it up again neatly, but I'm not much on wrapping things. Uh, I'm afraid one corner of your serape sticks out a little. Oh, don't mention it, then maybe nobody will notice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please, sit down. Oh, uh, no, no, really, I have to run. But uh, if you want to buy me a drink, I'll be in 616 in about half an hour. Sure. Thanks, Leslie. Bye. Ooh, that, my friend, was a dish. Let's get a look at the serape. No. Don't open it. Why not, Bill? You do, and we'll both know, but not for long. What? Take it in the bathroom, drop it in the tub, and let water run over it. Soak it good. Oh, no way. She opened it, Bill. It must be all right. If she's all right. But with... Hey. What? You're right. There's something ticking in this thing. The rapids don't tick. Get it in that tub and get it soaked. Hey. Right. Hello? Hello? Operator, get me the police. No, 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 no. Police. La Cinerale. You'd better come back out here, Robert. Just in case. Well, 
Well, uh, very interesting what you call a gadget, eh, Senor Foster? Yeah, very interesting. Battery fuse controlled by what spring mechanism? If we hadn't doused it in time, this wouldn't have been a very pretty room. The charge is in a bottle, heavy glass. Would have, would have been just like a shrapnel. You told me the first bomb, the one mailed to your country and blowed silver. Hey, wait a minute. You, you got the teeth pulled on that thing? Yeah. Mike, this is Inspector Luna, Mexican Federale. Hi, Inspector. Mucho gusto. Um, what did you find out, Mike? Sweet Leslie is not the guest of this hotel. Yeah, well, I didn't think she would be. Room 616 is occupied by a couple of old maids looking for Latin lovers. <laughs> I checked the desk and the bar. Nobody knows the girl. Elevator boy remembers bringing her up with a package. Oh, that's all. Uh, can you describe the lady? Um, about 5'3". Doing that? Um, well kept. Say about 120 pounds? Well, that'd be close. Hazel eyes, full lips. Uh, the name won't help. Probably wasn't her own. Uh, we shall attempt to find her. If you do, don't let her know it. Above all, don't arrest her. You like young ladies who leave you such gifts as this one? No, but we'd like to know who the young lady is working for. He's been well groomed. So Mike Roberts started a check on the beauty shop. A girl like that was bound to hit one sooner or later. I went through the Mexican police files with Inspector Luna, but drew a blank. We set up watch on the place where we purchased the Zerate. This is the street, Senor Foster? Yeah, that shop midway in the block. There, man coming out front now. Juan Diego. You know him? See, si, he's a harmless merchant. Uh, you must be mistaken, Senor. I'm not mistaken. He's a strange man, perhaps, but not a violent one. The package he sent was violent. Uh, See, si, I almost forgot that. We could make an arrest. Uh, you couldn't make it stick. With a bomb in the package? Don't underestimate him, Inspector. The package passed through the hands of a third party. That gives him a grade-A defense. Besides, he may not be the one we want. Probably working for somebody. We want the top. The man who murders with silver. The girl, perhaps. Just a front. The killer we we're after figured we might not be suspicious of the package if we thought an American girl had opened it first. Mm. I will have my men maintain a watch. Uh, it will be better if we leave here now. Um, take me back to the reformer. Mike may have come across something. Very well. How many men do you have at your disposal? Enough. Why do you ask? Enough to make a systematic survey of the city? I see. But uh, what do they look for? That design Mike and I have been following must be an identification symbol of some kind. If it's some secret organization, there may be others like it in other shops, not necessarily Zarapis. Silverwork, like the cup, decoration design, practically anything. Uh, you said you had a drawing of the design from the silver cup? Yes. I will have photographs made and passed out to all men. Do not worry, senor. We will locate all stores carrying that design in any form. <laughs> Bulletins went out to the Federales and the hunt began. The reports started to trickle in. The design in a mural on the wall of a restaurant, on a rug in the lobby of a small hotel, on the draped cloth of a portable tortilla stand. There was a list of 20 places, and then Mike hit the jackpot. He found the girl. It was that beauty parlor hunch, Bill. I was just about to walk into the place and ask questions when I spotted her. And she isn't a customer. She's a manicurist. Good work. The address is in the next street. That's right. The Plaza de la Constitución. Oh, right near the political center, isn't it, Inspector? Indeed. Yes. That's a real choice hangout. It's an elaborate place. Probably half the embassy wise, to say nothing on the wise of the Mexican officials, patronize the place. That's a listening post, all right. This, uh, this is some sort of organized group. Anyway. It is getting late. The shop will be closing for the afternoon. We had best stop here. That's great. We can't be seen here. Maybe we can tag her on the way home, find out where she lives, huh? Where's the entrance to the place? Well, it's between those large stone pillars, that building down there. It's the what? Hey, wait a minute. The man coming from the opposite direction. Juan Diego. Yeah, our friend with the loaded zarapes. He's turning into the beauty shop. Huh. Funny place for him to turn up. Must be some kind of a contact. Mike, I think this is what we've been waiting for. What do you mean, then? We've had men checking out that design. Somebody knows it. The only reason he'd come here would be to give a warning. <laughs> Could have used the phone. I'm afraid of a tap, baby. Right. That's got to be it. Bill, they may be communists. Uh, not likely, Mike. Mm, no, senor. Communists operate quite openly here. Uh, we're on the trail of something else. Well, whatever it is, they believe in violence and they're out to kill. 
There is Diego again, coming out of the salon. Stay low in the car. He's looking this way. He doesn't seem to be going any place. Hanging around. I'm waiting for her. This can be better than we thought. Oh, why? If he was just giving a warning, he wouldn't wait. They must be going someplace. A meeting? Must be. And if it is, the top boy will be there. <laughs> nice, friendly fellow who murders by mail. You've got that therapy I gave you, Inspector? See. Si. Well, hold it. May come in handy. We waited for ten minutes. Then the girl came out and joined Diego. The inspector put the car in low gear and drifted along behind them. They stopped by the statue at the Plata Mayor. And a few minutes later, a dust-covered station wagon picked them up. We started out through the Avenida Juarez and headed through the native quarteles. We lagged about a quarter of a mile behind. This is strange, senores. Huh? We seem to be heading for Lake Texcoco. No, what kind of a place is that? Nothing but a few miserable huts. Is that all? That and the old Aztec ruins. Hardly the sort of a place for a meeting. I'd say just the place. A group like that wouldn't meet in the plaza. No. Ruins sound like a good bet to me. We shall soon know. Why, what's coming? If they're headed for the ruins, they will be abandoning the car on this side of the lake. The road that leads to the ruins is not in repair. You mean they'll have to go around on foot? See, si. The path is fit only for walking. That's not so good. No. You can bet the approach is staked out. We've got to get in there. I can summon some men. We can move in with force. No, first we've got to find out which man is top dog. Then they can move in. If we get into trouble with this outfit, they'd better move fast or they'll be too late. <laughs> stopped by the lake, a half mile from the native hut. Diego, the girl, and a man we hadn't seen before turned into the swampy brush and disappeared on a small overgrown trail. We came to a stop near the station wagon. There were other cars pulled into the brush out of sight. Inspector Luna had put in a radio call for some men. I have sent for a group of 50 federales. We can cover the area. They will come up a back road and move in from the far side of the lake. That way may not be guarded. Now, how long will it take him? Oh, a half hour at the most. Where is the meeting liable to be? In there? Uh, there is a natural formation of rocks, almost like an amphitheater. We can start in a few minutes when it is completely dark. While we're waiting, I, uh, I want to walk down to those huts. We're not going to crash that meeting in the clothes we're wearing. <laughs> Even in the dark, Diego or the girl would spot us in a minute. You mean to borrow clothing at one of the huts? Yeah. Don't you like the idea? No, I favor it. It may save you from being shot. You know, I'm afraid we'll need more than a change of clothes to get in there. Well, we've got a pass. The inspector can wear this set up. I suppose the design isn't recognized anymore. I suppose there's a password set up. What do we do then? Keep a hand on the gun in your pocket and pray. got his past an armed guard on the trail who flashed his light, saw the Zarape, then cut the light and waved it through. A few minutes later, we were in a natural bowl of rock. It was lit at one end by a huge fire. Near the fire was a flat rock, platform high. As we came toward it, weaving through the small, intent crowd, a girl jumped to the rock. It was our playmate from the reformer. There was a stir of excitement as she pointed to the shadows, and a huge man emerged from it. She started to speak in a wild, perfect Spanish. Robert McKenna. She was not an American girl. We'd been taken in all the way. Then her speech ended. Suddenly, as the huge man reached the base of the flat rock, there was no doubt this was the head man. Look, he's climbing up on the rock. He is lighting up his face now. You know him, Inspector? Kind. He disappeared years ago. Why? Because he was hunted. He was a revolutionary and a fascist. He's still in business with that silver buckle and that gun belt he's wearing. That's our design again. Yeah. The Aztec pattern in silver. He was once a silver. Wait a minute. He's going to talk. Viva! We are being betrayed again. For our boy pulled out the hand to foreigners. Bring us to an hour. Five hours ago. Let them be the right. And then... 
Yeah! You may not be a town minister, but he could get top billing on the Kremlin circuit. My men are beginning to arrive. Where? See, they're slipping in around the edges of the crowd. The people do not notice them. No wonder. Look at his hive. They're almost hypnotized by all of their own fanatics. I will be able to tell you that our his men, they would never return to us. But because of an accident, he escaped the death we planned for him. Who is Aris Mendy? A special envoy to your country. He was in Washington when he returned here from Washington. Bill, that bomb on the train must have been addressed to Aris Mendy. Aris Mendy returns. On Aris, his blood will redden our soil. Thank you, Senor. I'm in there in place. Take him any time, Inspector. Now, these people are dangerous. If you become involved, kill to protect yourself. Aris Mendy's train enters the terminal. Hello, Randy! Billy, you all right? Yeah. He laid my forearm open to the bone. Yeah, I'll make a tourniquet with my shirt. We'll get you to a doctor. Diego kept on running. They had to shoot him in the back. Yeah. Sounds rude, doesn't it? <laughs> well, that's one that Emily Post overlooked, Mike. There's no polite way to kill a man. In a good piece of work down there, Foster. Oh, thanks, Chief. But don't forget Roberts, though. Oh, I meant you too, of course. Yeah. Foster is a brain. I was only along for the ride. One of their own officials, huh? Hey, what did you make of Pekaya? You said he wasn't a communist. Well, not officially. Oh, they may have used him to stir up trouble, needled him a little, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I think he was just a local fanatic with big ideas about himself. He was the top man in the group, all right. Specimens of his own handwriting were on papers found on his body. The Mexican police matched him with the photostats of the bit of writing we found on that exploded package. Made the same? Uh, there's no doubt about it. Well, I think the Mexican government will take care of Akai's followers. I've spent a long time in jail. Good. Then, uh, from our end, the case is closed? Well, I'd say so. When you say so, that's good enough for me, Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, that arm going to be all right? Oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> all it needs is my wife's loving care. <laughs> I can't. Come on. I'll drive you to the airport. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The file case, Death in the Mail, completes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of the silent men. The special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week... We'll tell you the story of our government's fight against counterfeit currency of foreign origin in the file case entitled The Marseille Counterfeiters, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Joe Murcott and was transcribed in Hollywood. All names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Joy Terry, Tom Holland, Lillian Byatt, Stacey Harris, Don Diamond, and John Stevenson. Don Stanley speaking. Douglas Fairbanks may currently be seen starring in Mr. Drake's Duck. And here again is Douglas Fairbanks. Millions of innocent Koreans will die this coming winter unless you give your unneeded clothing today to American Relief for Korea. That's ARK. A-R-K. Unless you have a local collection agency, please send your used clothing prepaid today to ARK, Oakland, California, or ARK, Mass Beth, Long Island, New York. Thank you. <laughs> Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men.
now it's the Jubilee Show on NBC. Now there's high adventure with the silent men on NBC. Silent Men, starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks in The Silent Men. Transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. This is Douglas Fairbanks. The wealth and the security of a nation depend not only on physical strength, but on the soundness and value of its currency. The American dollar is the soundest piece of money in the world, but because of its value, it has been the target of men of evil purpose, men who would destroy it or use it to attain wealth through counterfeiting. That their success has been small and limited is a blessing to us. A blessing guarded by a handful of men who have one major purpose in life. The protection of this government and its citizens. These men are the special agents of our federal government. Tonight, with your permission, I again play the role of one of them. Special Agent Ben Jarrett, in the file case entitled The Transatlantic Push. <laughs> From the beginning, it was obvious that this was not an ordinary case. This one started at the top in Washington, D.C., in the office of James J. Maloney, chief of the division. Come in, Ben. Hi, chief. How'd you know it was me? The guard called that you were on your way up. Oh. Secretaries are all out to lunch. Sit down, Ben. Thanks. How are you? How are things in the Dallas office? Hot. <laughs> But quiet. <laughs> we can do something about the quiet part. I'm bringing Al White in from the San Francisco office. We'll work together. Uh, take a look at these, Ben. Mm-hmm. Counterfeit, huh? Yes. Queer stuff. Yeah. Look at them. Hmm. President Grant didn't photograph too well in those 50s, yeah? A little too much yellow in the color of the seal and six of the eight serial numbers out of line. Otherwise, not a bad job. The hundreds are even better. Except for the same color on the seal and the numbers being out of line on the serial. Any lead on who's doing the pushing? Uh, take a look at the chart on the wall. Mm -hmm. Counterfeits of foreign origin. Where'd you get this batch? A woman named Lenya Veronsky, displaced person. Came in from Europe two days ago. She was picked up in New York yesterday when she tried to use these to open a bank account. If she knew the clear, she wouldn't go to a bank. You're right. She didn't know she bought the bills in the black market in Europe. Her whole life savings, Ben. Oh. It wasn't easy to slam the counterfeit stamp across the face of those bills. Not when the woman has a number tattooed on her arm. Concentration camp? One of the worst. Book and oh. And that's the type of person being victimized. Oh. They come here with a stake to start a new life. And we have to take it away from them because it's counterfeit. Where do I start, Jim? The woman's in the detention room. You'd better see her. Detention room, please. Hello. This is Maloney. Uh, send Mrs. Veronsky to my office, please. Thanks. One thing occurs to me, Jim. How do we know the queer isn't being printed here and shipped overseas for unloading? We've checked the stock. Oh. No paper of this type being milled in the United States. Now, the same goes for the ink they're using. Any line on the point of origin? The paper... France or Spain. Mm -hmm. The ink, Italy. That's all. I see. Well, I'd better note that. Oh, uh, come in, Mrs. Veronsky. Thank you. This is Mr. Jarrett. Sit down, please, Mrs. Veronsky. It's, it's all right. Oh, it's, it's all right. This is the man I wanted you to see. Now, you tell Mr. Jarrett where you got the money. 
in Paris before I come here. I have two sons. We, we all work to come to America. My other son and two daughters and my husband, they, they are dead. Oh, and what? Would you like some water, Mrs. Vronsky? No, no, I, I am all right. Me and my, my last two children were safe. Then one day they say I can come here on the... the uh, Quota. Yeah. Hmm. With my boys, they must wait, so... A man changes our money for American money, and, and I come. Now you say the money is not good. Mrs. Baranski, uh... Do you know the name of the man who sold you this money? No. He was short. He had no hair. He is happy, laughing. Laughing. That is all I know. Laughing. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Bronster. Please wait in the next office. I'll see you again. Ben... We've got to smash this transatlantic push. Miss Hennick is preparing letters for you and Al White to police authorities in France, Spain, and Italy. When do we leave? As soon as Al White gets here. Now, when you get to Paris, check with Chief Inspector Francois Poiret of the French Sûreté. Right. Poiret. Uh, speak any French? Uh, it depends on your point of view. My high school teacher said no. <laughs> well, this looks like a big, well-organized gang, Ben. That means they'll play rough. After seeing that woman, I hope they do, Jim. I hope they do. Landing at Le Bourget Airfield in Paris was nothing to distinguish Al White and me from the vacationing Americans and businessmen who stepped from Flight 950. I liked working with Al. He was five foot eight and tipped the scales at a stocky 180. His face was round and guileless, and in straw hat and white apron, he, he wouldn't seem out of place behind the meat counter of an American chain store. Federal penitentiaries are full of men who thought he looked stupid. <laughs> well, we took a rickety French taxi from the field to an inconspicuous hotel, and within an hour, we were in consultation with Inspector Poiret of the Surete. Here are the first money of files. That's our word for counterfeit gentlemen. Uh, I hope there is something that will be of help. Do you have a special group specializing in foreign currency, Inspector? Uh, these. English pounds, American dollars. Well, they are small operators, though. The big rings, uh, they are evasive. And we've had too many other internal problems. Uh, one cannot hope to keep up with them all. Huh? Well, what do you think, Al? I don't know, Ben. On the back of the records are clipped samples of the counterfeit currency. Five, tens, and ones. And so phony, a good police dog could spot him. Yeah. Besides, these men have been caught. We're looking for the ones who haven't been caught. Here, Inspector, you take a look at one of our samples here. Hmm. Most professional. Good enough to get by almost any place this side of the ocean. Hey, will you leave this with me so I may direct my men? Sure. We'd better see what we can stir up in the black market, Al. Yeah. Goodbye, Inspector. No wow. Hey, wait a minute, Ben. Inspector. Wait. Uh, yes. That file of queer pushers, uh, excuse me, counterfeiters, any of the gangs in there made up of Italians as well as French? What's your angle, Al? Just a thought. The chief said the ink came from Italy. No, I'm afraid not. Look, Ben, a big gang, and this must be big, doesn't spring up overnight. It, it grows. It could be a post-war gang, but it's just as likely one that started during the war. Maybe before. Well, that figures. They're old lying counterfeiters, all right, but pushing queer American is a new branch for them. What did they do before? Well, that's stabbing in the dark, Al. Maybe, but American counterfeiters had a sideline during the war. Remember the Memphis case? Rationing coupons? They had rationing here, didn't they? How about that, Inspector? But of course. There was much counterfeiting of ration certificates. Any of the counterfeiters Italian? There was one group. Some Frenchmen, some Sicilian. Jackpot? Looks that way. Recall any of the details, Inspector? Well, the operation was large. 
They were apprehended, but uh, the evidence was meager. The jail term's not long. What has happened to them, I do not know. Where was their base of operation? A printing establishment in the 8th arrondissement, owned by one uh, Georges Corbin. He was a member of the ring. But since then, he has married and maintained a reputation. Georges Corbin, printer, 8th arrondissement. We better pay him a visit, Ben. <laughs> you say after him? Nothing. I, I do not know. He is not here. Please, go away. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you Corbin's wife? Oui. Yes. I think you'd better talk to us, Mrs. Corbin. You may save your husband a lot of trouble. Come in. Now, where is he? I do not know. His shop has been closed for some time. The other storekeepers in the arrondissement say they haven't seen him for months. He's away. Where? I do not know. That is why I am frightened. How long has he been gone? Five months. And you don't know where? I can tell you nothing. You were sent by the police. If I tell you, George will be killed. Killed by who? The man who took him away. Please. Please, please. If she's leveling, Corban may have been snatched. Poor A said he quit the game. Maybe they came back and got sore when he wouldn't play. They need a press and an engraver, and he's worked with them before. I hate to do this, but we haven't got much choice. Mrs. Corbin, if your husband was taken away five months ago and you don't know where he is, how do you know he hasn't already been killed? I have had letters. During the war, your husband was a counterfeiter of rationing certificates. He did nothing wrong with his then. Maybe not. But the men who took him away were the same men he worked for before, weren't they? He did not want to go. They forced him. Mrs. Corbin, we believe that. So if you want to protect your husband, you better talk. Those men are counterfeiting American money. They may turn out all they can handle and then quit. Maybe we will find his story. To be a witness against them? They'll kill him unless we can get to him before they quit. Oh, no, no. He's right, Mrs. Corbin. You'd better let us see where those letters came from. But they come from one also. I will show you. From, from Chabot, La Havre, Marseille, Toulon, even from Paris. I was afraid of that. Yeah, they're smart. No one point to go to. The pushers are mailing the letters from all points as they fan out to spread the queer. Mrs. Corbin, do you know any of the men who took your husband? I never saw them. They came one night when we were sleeping. George got up. They argued. And one of them struck him. He came into me and said that he had to go to the shop to give them something. What thing? I don't know. For printing. They brought the doors back again. He came into me and said he must go with them. But I must say nothing or they would... I tried to stop him, but he pushed me away. I ran into the street and I saw them driving off in a truck. You say the men never saw you? Just one of them, once in the dark. He came in with George. Then he wouldn't recognize you? No, no, no. Thinking of a stakeout, Al? Well, if you'll go for it, it might work, Ben. Worth a try. Mrs. Corbin, we may be able to help your husband if you help us. What do you want me to do? Inspector Poiret of the Surete will arrange a fake passport for you under another name. We'll supply you with half a million francs to do some shopping in the black market. Shopping? For what? Counterfeit American money. You'll say you're going to America and you want to change the francs for American dollars. Will you do it? I don't want to be brutal, but it may be your husband's only chance. Yes. Oui. I will do it. Inspector Poiret and his men, Al and I arranged a stakeout in the black market areas of Paris, the back alleys behind the Hotel Georges Saint, the winding streets of Montmartre, 
Men of the French Surete were planted unobtrusively in the crowd. Always one of them within a few feet of Madame Georges Corbin as she tried to make contact. Occasionally, genuine American currency turned up, or inferior counterfeits of small denominations. But none of the counterfeit fifties and hundreds with the serial numbers out of line. Until, late one afternoon, we moved the stakeout to the Boulevard Clichy, just off the Rue de la Paix. She's made a contact then, doorway of the florist shop. Take a look, Inspector. You know the man? Hmm? Oui. He was one of the ones with the rationing certificate. Condor. Uh huh. Small fry pusher, eh? Look, she's taking a shawl off her head. It's the bills we're looking for. Shall I signal my men to make the seizure? No, no. Put a tail on him. Pardon? I have a man following. We don't want him. We want the men we were printing the queer. Ah, the transaction has been completed. Let's say, one of the same with you. Suivez lui. Jean Henri, avec lui. Let me. Sign three men. They will report his action. I'll be right back. What's up? The pusher ditched some sort of paper in the doorway. I'm going to go get him. You seem disappointed, Monsieur Jared. The contact. I was hoping it might be Laughing Boy. Yes? Huh? Laughing Boy? A uh, pusher who's happy about his work. He enjoyed giving some queer money to a woman who deserved a better break. We'll find him, though, later. Did I do the right thing? You are fine, Madame Colbert. Let's see the money. Yeah. They are the ones you seek? Yes, yes. Too much yellow, serial numbers out of line. Uh, it's the push, all right. That's the merchandise, Ben? Yes. Yeah. What did you find? This envelope. The one he carried the money in. Uh, what does post restant mean? General delivery. Let's have a look. Hmm. To Antoine Restore, post restant Montmartre, Paris. From Joseph Perfetti, post restant to Marseille. This was mailed from the Bureau de Poste of the Opera Quartier to Marseille. Well, then the source may be in Marseille. Mm. The queer is mailed from there to the pushers. We'd better get down there. Inspector, can you arrange for a postal watch in Marseille? We can follow a story from there if he comes to pick up his mail. And the sorting clerks can let us know the destination of anything he sends out. <laughs> let it go through and pick up the pushers at the receiving end. It should be arranged. I go to Marseille with you. Marseille, an ancient city, beautiful and treacherous, with the sacred Notre Dame de la Garde only a matter of steps from the sloping, twisted alleys and back streets of the old town, where murder might stand waiting in the shadow of a doorway. For days, Al White and I stood behind a torn curtain, looking through the grimy window of a cheap rooming house waiting for a signal from one of the changing groups of Surete men lounging about the Bureau de Poste. Then, finally, it came. A lounger dropped his newspaper, stretched lazily, and moved slowly after a man in a red beret. There it is, Ben. Ristori picked up his mail. Good. Let's go. We took over from the Surete, following Antoine Ristori in and out of the winding streets. Keeping out of his sight as he made his way through the maze of the old town quarter, veering south off the Boulevard des Dames. Sometimes the red berry was just a flash of color, seen for a split second, as we turned into one street, while the story slipped into another. But we never lost it. Then, on the Rue de la Neuf, the story disappeared into the cafe at number 41. Do we go in? No, no. We'd better wait. We might have gone in for a drink, unless that's the base of operation. I doubt it. A cheap cafe in a section like this means trouble. They wouldn't keep a printing press where the gendarmes might be visiting. Well, that figures. But there's no spot for a Rolls Royce either. And there's the back of one sticking out of the alley next to the place. And the story might be keeping a rendezvous with the top men. Hmm. License number 9552 CA7. Look, I'll stay here and keep an eye on the story. We passed a hotel in the last street. Must be a phone there. Maybe poor A can get a line on the owner of that car. Good idea. I'll call him. It'll be dark in half an hour. Poirier can meet us here with some men. Make sure you get a complete on the owner of the road. You can't buy those pushing tin foil. No. Inspector. Over here, in the doorway. Is the story still there? Yeah. Two hours now. There may be a back door, you know. I cased it. Leads into a blind alley by the car. I'd have to see him. 
Incidentally, what about the car, Inspector? Very interesting. It is registered to one André Salvini, who also owns the cafe. Monsieur Salvini has blossomed forth recently as a man of wealth, dealing in real estate. What kind of real estate? A few more establishments like the one we watch, but also a magnificent home in the country. An old chateau in the pine forest near the village of Cabri. Country estate, huh? Not a bad place to print the queer, Ben. You know the location, Inspector? Yeah, unfortunately, no. There are many such properties in the Cabri area. It could be one of 20 or more. Well, then the way to get there is to let Ristori and Salvini take us there. They might not talk, Al, and if we grab them, the rest of the gang might split. Yeah, but if we try to grab them and miss, they'll head right for their equipment and move to another spot. We'd have to start all over from scratch. Obviously, you have considered a way to prevent such a move, Monsieur White. What is your plan? You and I go in, then. Ah, the cafe becomes lively. Yeah. All right, we uh, go in. Then what? When we get in, Inspector Poiré can block off this area. When the rampers start, grab everyone who comes out on foot. But don't stop that car. But we want to know is where it goes. But it would be impossible to follow it. I do not have the vehicles to cover all avenues of exit from this quarter. Well, you won't have to. Station three cars along the highway near Cabri. Unmarked, no official cars. One fifteen miles this side of the town, one ten, one five. That's town. They'll know they're not followed when they get clear of here, and they won't be leaning too hard on that gas pedal when they get near Cabri. Your men can follow it from there, then, in relays, until they spot where the car turns off. We can follow and move in. If you leave the cafe alive, monsieur. Perhaps a few of my men... Not too many would tip us. He's right, Inspector. We'll take it alone. When the trouble starts, blow a couple of whistles up the street. But don't close in until the car is gone. Come on, Al. Let's go. Oh, wow. And good fortune. Red beret at the corner table. The story. Yeah. Two others with him. Which one is Salvini? Take the table next to them. Um, Garçon de Quantro. Voila! Voila! Encore! Encore! Laughing boy. The man who pushed that money over on the DP we saw in Washington. He's looking at us. Oh, do not mind me. I am always, how you say, a happy one. Uh, you uh, are American, no? That's right, laughing boy. <laughs> voilà! He makes a, a nickname for me, you will? <laughs> laughing boy. <laughs> I love the name, monsieur. Work on him. <laughs> now, what's your real name? Andre Salvini? No, no. I am Jean-Paul de Perrotte, my companion. Permet la bouche, Jean. <laughs> Pourquoi? Que voulez-vous, monsieur? He wants to know what we want, Al. Tell the man. We're looking for counterfeiters of United States currency. The three of you are under arrest. <laughs> so, I am arrest, no? Prenez-le! <laughs> The men moved towards us in grim silence. Half a dozen of them. It looked like we'd bitten off more than we could chew. The fight started and some of them fought to cover. The murder at hand to foot attack of the underworld attacked. We had to get a signal outside. I broke loose and threw a bottle at a window. As it hit, I turned just in time to see a savat kick catch Al White under the chin. He sagged to the floor, unconscious. And at the same moment, a savat kick caught me in the stomach. And I dropped, feeling a sickening pain as Poiré's men signaled their approach. <laughs> Them. Leave them! To the car! No. Where's Al White? My men took him to the hospital. Oh. <coughs> How bad? He was unconscious. Mm. Concussion, possibly. Face will need stitches. Oh. 
Uh, they fight Savat with metal clips on the heel. Uh, our friends get away all right? Yes. I will drop you off for medical attention, too. And then I will proceed to Cabri. Oh, I'm all right. I'm going with you. If anything happens to Al White, I'll stay here until every one of them hangs. My car is outside. It is equipped with wireless. You are sure? I'm that... sure. Let's go, Inspector. <laughs> Sure, this is the place? The limousine is at the rear of the house. There is also a truck. It came shortly after the limousine. It's being loaded. Then the equipment is here. Let them load it. There's chances than destroying any of it. Uh, a truckload of everything. I wish we could do something about that dog. I sent a man who has a way with animals. He'll be quiet shortly. Let's go. How well has your men got the place covered? And guns and lights have been placed at strategic spots. We command all possible avenues of escape. Not a machine gun at each entrance of the driveway with spotlights? Oui. And 30 men of the Brigade Mobile. They are well armed. Ah. There is the end of Monsieur Dog. Good. Now, if they'll move, we can... They come. You command here. I go to the other side. All right. The spotlight. Fire a burst over the truck. Brigade Mobile, close in on the house. Very fine coup, Monsieur Jared. Your government will be most happy. Well, they'll be happy to see these counterfeit plates. Your scorebound was pretty clever. Mm. This numbering machine only carried six digits, and the bills needed eight. So he engraved the first two on a lithograph stone, just a little too low, deliberately, so the machine numbers wouldn't line up with them. It was the easiest thing to spot. I'm glad he was not injured. Mm. And you will be glad to know that uh, Monsieur White is recovering. Which is more than we can say for Laughing Boy and Salvini. You don't recover from being dead. Well, <laughs> Restore and the others will make a most impressive trial. Don't forget, we've a few to add yet. Keep us quiet until we pick up the pushers at the various post restaurants when they call for their mail. It will be attended. But when it is over, your votes have done us a service. There should be appropriate honors. No, no, thanks, Inspector. You take them. We're well paid for our job. Well paid? In America, the law enforcement agents receive much money? <laughs> I wasn't thinking of money, Inspector. No, not money. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The stopping of the transatlantic push closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving narcotics and the Far East in the file case entitled Heroin Source X, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> The Silent Man is produced by Warren Lewis. Tonight's transcribed case was written by Joel Murcott and directed by Walter McGraw. All names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were John Gibson, Rock Rogers, Ruth York, Joe DeSantis, and William Keane. This is Fred Collins speaking. Douglas Fairbanks may currently be seen in the motion picture Mr. Drake's Duck. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the Silent Men.
Wednesday, William Garden as Barry Craig, Tension Confidential Investigator. Stay tuned to NBC. The NBC radio network is now entering its second quarter century as a leader in radio entertainment. Now it's Douglas Fairbanks and the Silent Men on NBC. The Silent Men, starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks in The Silent Men. Transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. This is Douglas Fairbanks. You know what heroin is? They call it the killer drug. It's an opium derivative, a triple essence of morphine acting on the higher centers of the brain and subtly destroying them. In the world of drug addicts, it's known as stuff, the white powder, or simply H. Of all known drugs, it is by far the worst. It can turn the most decent man quickly into a vicious killer or a fresh young girl into a hag in a few months. Its use is outlawed in the United States. Its presence anywhere is an invitation to disaster. For this reason, the Bureau of Narcotics recently dispatched a special agent on a secret mission to the Near East. His assignment? To destroy a suspected heroin source and thereby keep this peril from destroying American lives. The special agent on the assignment was Larry Thomas, whose name I will have the honor to assume in tonight's file case entitled Heroin Source X. As special agent Larry Thomas, I had been called into Washington from our branch office in Duluth. For three months now, I had been building a new folder on foreign narcotic source, so far designated merely as Heroin Source X. While building the folder, I had also been going to school. In the Bureau's laboratories, I had become a chemist, carrying out tests and lab analyses on every recent sample of illicit heroin the Bureau had been able to acquire. Finally, when the unrelated items in the folder began forming into a pattern, a report to the commissioner brought a personal visit to the lab. Commissioner, good morning. How's it going? Well, pretty interesting, sir, but slower than I care to admit. Well, this is all pretty new to you. You would have had the report weeks ago if I could have put one of the departmental chemists on it. Oh? No? Oh, I had a reason for wanting you to learn all this by yourself. Well, I learned it all right. If there's anything you want to know about opium derivatives, I'm your boy. <laughs> <laughs> I see you brought the folder. Yeah. Now, let's see if I got it all here. Well, it looks like it, sir. Everything that come in on heroin in the past few months. Plus your own report. Right. Well, it's finally beginning to shape up, taking on direction. Well, that's what I felt then. I had a call from Boston this morning. Oh, Benson? Yes. A large consignment of illicit drugs was discovered on a ship there in the harbor. What kind of ship? A freighter from the eastern Mediterranean. Turkey? Yes. Uh-huh. You remember a few months ago, there were quite a few rumors about Turkey. They were saying you could buy heroin capsules like peanuts along the Istanbul waterfront. Of course, but there was never anything definite to back it up, though. Your folder backs it up. We've compared these tests you've been running on the seized heroin samples with control specimens from all parts of the world. Everything points to Istanbul as the most logical point of origin of the new line. Well, Commissioner? With ten times the number of agents we've got, we couldn't expect to keep the stuff out of the country unless we destroyed the source. So we're going to send a man to Turkey. You think he'd be welcome? I've already talked to one of the Turks on the United Nations Commission on Narcotics. Uh-huh. The Turkish government will jump at the chance to prove they're not just talking international cooperation. Well, how about our State Department? And we'll need clearance, of course. That's the first step. And the man for the job? You, Larry Thomas. Oh, now, just a minute, Commissioner. <laughs> what I know about Turkey is strictly limited to Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> <laughs> the chemistry of heroin is all you'll need to know. That's why I've had you doing this lab work yourself. You can expect to find heroin in practically any Mediterranean port, but you won't know when you've hit the mother load until you compare it chemically with the analytic findings of this new stuff that's being shipped into this country. Oh, what do I know about language? Buy a book and learn Turkish on the way over? <laughs> From what I hear, you won't have to use it. 
English is compulsory in a lot of the schools over there right now. Uh -huh. Besides, Istanbul's a seaport. And besides that, there have been enough American tourists abroad this year to teach the natives all the English you'll ever need. Good. <laughs> Anything else on your mind? Yes. Just don't forget to let the Turkish police in on our little secret. I'd hate to spend the rest of my life in a Turkish jail. <laughs> When the State Department clearance came through, I took a transatlantic flight out of New York. And not quite 72 hours after I'd hailed a taxi cab in Washington, D.C., my plane set down on Turkish soil. An hour later, I was stating my business to a young attaché at the American consulate, a fellow named of George Stevens. Now, if there's any other way that we here at the consulate can be of help, Thomas, you won't hesitate to call. Oh, thanks, Mr. Stevens. You'll find reservations in your own name at the Park Hotel. Larry Thomas, American Tourist. <laughs> <laughs> kind of surprised, but you fellas always adopted some sort of concealed identity. <laughs> Not this far from home. Besides, it's hard enough remembering your own name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in the cable I received, I was instructed to put you in touch with the Turkish police. Oh, yes. I've arranged an appointment for you here tomorrow morning with the director of the criminal division, a Colonel Nadal Marouk. Excellent. Well, he should be a lot of help. Meanwhile, can I at least show you the city? Oh, thanks. I think I'd better just feel my way around alone for just now. This is one of the most ancient cities on Earth, you know. Yes, a lot of history here, and a lot of other things, too, I'll bet. <laughs> well, better get out and see a little of it. I'd be careful where I look, Thomas, especially after dark. Istanbul, a city of mosques and minarets, great palaces and crumbling tombs. A city of intrigue and mystery. I checked in at the Park Hotel, then took a cab around town to get my bearings. That night, I made like a tourist, and contrary to George Stevens' advice, I found myself strolling along the waterfront, along the states of the Bosphorus. Instinctively, I kept out towards the edge of the sidewalk, away from the walls of buildings and the dark shadows of doorways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello, mister. You are American. Yeah, that's right. How'd you know? Lonely, maybe? No, no, just <laughs> taking a walk. Oh, all by yourself? Yeah, yeah. You wish maybe to have drinks? No, no, thank you very much. I've just had dinner. Like for to see interesting place, maybe? Can see much thing for American dollar. Yes, I'm sure of that. <laughs> or maybe you interest in business. You like to buy something, maybe? You ask a lot of questions, maybe. <laughs> Can show you where to buy many things. Make lots of money. I'll bet. Or um, maybe you interest in something for your pleasure. Like what? Like the little powder, maybe? What do you know about the little powder? Enough. Let me see your arm. Oh, no. No, you do not find the needle mark on me. Then how do you know about the powder? One learns many things when one has so many friends as I have. Sounds interesting. You will pay me if I tell you a place where the little powder is to be found. How much? I will make it cheap for you. <laughs> The girl's name was Sadia. I couldn't tell her nationality. She spoke seven languages, and her eyes hinted at the wisdom of 7,000 years. Yet for $3 American money, she steered me to a little place called the Crescent, and what she called the Little Powder. It was a typical smoke-filled coffee house, except this one had a floor show, the local version of Little Egypt, with an act that hadn't varied since the Chicago World Fair of 1896. <laughs> I ordered a cup of coffee, thick and sweet, and bought a box of perfumed Turkish cigarettes and waited for Sadia to bring the contact over to my table. <laughs> After the girl on the floor stopped dancing, Sadia came back. She had a man with her, a Greek she introduced as Kokanos. Ali Espera? He does not speak English, mister, only his native Greek. Have you told him what I want? He says he must talk with you first. About what? Either he has the stuff or he hasn't. You are if you are What do you say? He says, do you favor our entertainment? Yes, fine, but mm -hmm. tell him I'm not here for the entertainment. I'm here on business. Does he understand? 
Oki eti elti na pasosiki erowin? Toka hatay lalbano. Yes, mister. He understands. Well, does he want to do business or doesn't he? Telui ampatasis am hesot. He ele halbe hat. He is sorry, mister. It is not possible to make the transaction. What do you mean, it's not possible? I have the money. He grevanta. What's he pointing at my neck for? He likes the tie around your neck, he says. Well, that's easy. Tell him I'll give it to him. He grevanta seen in a softy. He says it is not the right one. Oh, mister, you had better go now. <laughs> Sadia's tone, I knew it was definitely time to leave. I got out of the neighborhood as fast as I could and took a cab uptown to my hotel, but I couldn't sleep. My mind was too full of questions about tonight's incident. The next morning at the consulate, I got some of the answers from Colonel Marouk, the director of the criminal division of the Turkish police. Mr. Thomas, there are two large producers of illicit heroin here in Istanbul. Of that we are certain. Any names, Colonel Marouk? Two only, and one of them you have already met. I've met him? A certain Greek, Kokanus, he calls himself, who frequents a certain place of evening entertainment known as the Crescent Casino in the theater section. The Crescent? Talk about coincidence. No, no, it is natural that if one is seeking heroin in Istanbul, he will sooner or later find his way to the casino and Kokanus. But he was the fellow I told you about who kept pointing at my neck last night. Yes. Probably thinking of slitting your throat. No, no, he was undoubtedly looking for a sign of some sort. A uh, type of password. That is. Uh, what about this Kokanis, Colonel? He is without known occupation. His repeated presence at the casino is said to have been caused by his infatuation with one of the entertainers, a uh, uh, dancer du ventre. I do not know the English expression. A uh, bell dancer, I guess we call it, Thomas. Little Egypt, eh? Kokanis <laughs> is of the one organization. The other? There again, we are not certain of the status of the man. But there is one Mustafa Dalkakirin, a Turkish national. Mustafa Dalkakirin. And where do I find him? He is often seen at the Eriko Bar in the Bayoglu quarter. Eriko Bar, Bayoglu. You may take as many of my operatives with you as you wish. Oh, thank you, Colonel. But with your approval, I, I'd prefer to meet this Mustafa for the first time alone. The Bayoglu Quarter is one of the poorer sections of Istanbul. Two nights later, I found my way down there to the Eriko Bar, a small room below street level. A zinc bar five feet long and two marble top tables. That was all of it. At one of the tables, I found Mustafa Dalkakirin. He was easier to talk to than Kakana, or perhaps tonight I was wearing the right necktie. American? You are an American? That's right. A friend of yours, a sailor I met, told me to look you up, said we could do business. So? So I want to do business. I do not make business here. You will come with me to my own restaurant, Guzaladana. Sure, I'll come anywhere. Very there. Ferry? Ferry, he knows about America. Ferry will talk to you and find out if you really are an American. We took a taxi to the Guzul Adana. It was a big new restaurant in the Ferra section, not far from where I had met Kokanis a few nights before. And in Mustafa's private office, I met Ferry. Oh, yes, he knew Americans all right. He had once been a steward on a ship that docked at New York for all of two whole weeks. And in addition to that, I have attended an American school here in Istanbul. Yes, I've heard of it. The Robert College, isn't it? For two years, mind you. And this accounts for my so perfect accent. As you see, I have none. You do very well, Mr. Ferris. No, mister. Just Ferris. Very democratic, you see? Okay, Ferris. Yeah. But you... You say you are an American. <laughs> Anybody can say that. But how do we know? Well, you've been there for ages to be able to tell. Precisely. And it is because of this that I am so valuable to Mustafa. Is this not so, Mustafa? It's so, it's so. It is because of this that Mustafa places such great trust in my judgment. Find out. <laughs> 
Uh, your, uh, your credentials, Mr. Thomas. Well, I, uh, I've got my passport. <laughs> it's got my picture. Hmm. Not a very good likeness, but you know how these passport photos are. It is you. And this is my driver's license from the state, Larry Thomas, Duluth, Minnesota. Duluth? What is the meaning of this world? It's a city. That's where I operate, near Chicago. Chicago? Hmm. What other cities do you know? Uh, oh, Detroit, St. Louis, Miami, Boston, New York. New York? Ah, tell me. What is the game that is played in New York? Quickly. I don't know, unless you mean baseball. Right. Mustafa, he is number one with an OK. Right, Thomas? Right, right. The man who sent him. So, you say like this, Thomas. An American seaman tells you to find Mustafa. That's correct. And if you find him, you are ready to do business. Big business. Nothing less than 100-pound lot. That is 50 kilos. Oh, the name, the name of the American seaman. Mm. Care to mention the name, Thomas? You know better than that, Farid. We don't throw names around in this business. The name, Farid? Could be the name of the American sailor was... Uh, George Peters? Could be. And if the name was George Peters, from which hand is the finger missing? Oh, sure. Uh, sure, about that finger. You uh, wouldn't be playing with us, would you, Thomas? Why should I be playing with you? Answer, all right. Uh, 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 come to think of it, the finger's missing from his uh, right hand. Colonel Marouk, to break in on you so early in the morning. Oh, you are welcome here at any hour, Mr. Thomas. Uh, you have learned something of the heroin producer? Well, I'm meeting the top man in an hour through Dalkakirin. His name's Yatef. Remarkable. To have accomplished so much in so short a time. The meeting place? The Gazul Adana. Uh -huh. Mustafa Dalkakirin's new restaurant. You would like company at this meeting, is it not so, Mr. Thomas? That's right. Yatef will probably take me to his factory. I would like to have your men there so they can follow us. As many as you wish. What are your requirements? A fast car parked at each end of the block, I'd say. Someone to watch the front door from the street. Well, that ought to do it. That and more will be stationed outside the Gazula Dana in exactly one hour. Good, good. Just don't make it too many. Oh, by the way, Colonel, ever heard of an American seaman named George Peters? George Peters? Yeah, George Peters. Perhaps I have something here in my card file on him. It is important that you have information on this, Peter. It could be important to me. Ah, yes, here we are. George Peters, American addict, apprehended six weeks ago, smuggling narcotics into Turkey for his own use. Anything about his hands? What? Either of his hands have a missing finger? Ah, yes, I see, I see. Yes, middle finger missing from right hand. Oh, brother. What is it? <laughs> oh, well, my luck is running a little too good. <laughs> That's the second coincidence so far in this case. I hope there isn't a third. <laughs> Colonel Marouk suggested I be at least 15 minutes early to my morning appointment. In that way, the conference would be underway when his men took up their positions outside. And there would be less chance of their being spotted. It was exactly 10.15 when I walked through the empty restaurant in Mustafa's office at the Gazul Adana. You arrive early, Mr. Thomas. Too early am I, Mustafa? You are not too early. Sit down. Oh, Mr. Kokano. Right, Kokano. Sit down. I thought I was meeting yourself. I am also yourself. And you speak English? I speak English. <laughs> Your name, I'm told, is Thomas. My name, I already know. How do you manage to keep track of him? I do not joke, Mr. Thomas. Where is Farid? Farid will be here when we need him. You wouldn't talk to me the other night. That is correct. I understand I wasn't wearing the right kind of necktie. Why the change? Perhaps it is because you are carrying the right kind of money. American dollars, quite a bundle of them. I must see your money. Now you'll see it after I've seen the goods. You carry the money in this black case? 
No, that's a chemistry outfit of mine. I don't buy until I've tested the merchandise. I don't allow As soon as Farid comes with the car, we go to the factory. You can make your test. He's late, Mustafa. Uh, that one is always late. The amount you require is 50 kilos, Thomas? If the quality is right. You are late, Farid. Mustafa, yes, sir. Do you know that half the police of Istanbul are out front? Police? They must have followed me here. I had a feeling that... Farid, you are sure? That is why I am late. I have been watching them before I came in. The car is in the proper place? It was not seen. Wait, then. We live by the back way. Follow me, Thomas. We'll leave that pack of hungry cats to watch an empty bag. The plan had backfired. Instead of leading Colonel Marouk's police to the heroin factory, I was being taken there alone. After traveling at top speed through a maze of streets I didn't know, the car finally stopped in a back alley, and they rushed me through a door and down a flight of steps. I was hopelessly lost. They took me through a cellar, so dark I could barely make out the gas meter on the wall. And then upstairs to what must have once been a large kitchen, but what was now undoubtedly a secret heroin factory. And there, under the suspicious eyes of Mustafa, Kokanas, and Farid, I made my analytical test. Very well, gentlemen. I'm finished. You are satisfied? The results of my test indicate a drug of great purity and potency. You are sure? Yes, I'm sure this is exactly what I've been looking for. You've no idea the adulteration this stuff goes through sometimes. That is no affair of ours. Uh, tell him, Yasef, the prices we have received from purchasers in the American market. 3,000 American dollars the kilo. 3,000? This is not cheap Indian or Iranian stuff, but 3,050 kilo lot. Ah, uh, we'll waste time. Wait, Yosef. Uh, perhaps you will tell us the price you are prepared to pay, Thomas? 2,000. Cigarette, Thomas? No, thanks. Do you have a match? No, I... Here, I, I have a lighter. No, oh, thanks. American, see? Yeah, it's a nice one. You must realize, Thomas that the impression you make is not a favorable one. First, you question the quality of our merchandise. Now you try to force down our prices. Sorry, that's all it's worth to me. Fifty kilos at two thousand. Very well. You have the dollars with you? <laughs> I don't think I'd be foolish enough to carry that much on me, do you? Bring the stuff to my hotel tomorrow. I'm at the park. I'll have the money waiting. We make no deliveries. All right, then I'll come back. Only you've got to tell me how to get here. The way your boy Farid drove us out, I got lost. You need not trouble yourself with directions. We will call for you at the Park Hotel tomorrow at exactly noon and bring you here ourselves as soon as we are certain we are not being followed. This was it. Kokanas, or Yasef, was definitely the head of the heroin ring. I had found the source of supply. But I hadn't found a way to lead the Istanbul police to either. And I knew now they were suspicious. We left the factory down the same darkened steps. When we reached the cellar, Kokanas went ahead to open the door, and I stopped. Uh, hold it. Uh, just a second. What is it? Uh, how about another light, sir, before we get outside? Eh? Sure, why not? Hurry. Over here, out of the draft from that door. Well, off, Thomas. What are you looking at there? Oh, nothing. Just happened to notice the gas meter. We we use electricity at home. Come on. Mr. Thomas, I congratulate you. Excellent police work. Who would have thought to look for a serial number on that gas meter? Oh, thank you, Colonel Merrick. <laughs> it was my last chance to bring you in on the party. But to have one of them hold the light while you noted it. Excellent. The tough part was remembering it. 137-486. I, I kept saying it to myself all the way back in that car. <laughs> the address is in the Tepabashi section, number 6, Sabashi. I do not think our little birds will escape this time. Well, what are you planning, Colonel? 
When you and your companions arrive tomorrow at number six Abashi, some workmen will be digging a trench in the street, engaged, I think, appropriately in repairing the gas main. I am correct that the room in which you will meet overlooks the street? Right, I'm sure of that. Just so. Then when your meeting has progressed to the point at which you would like our company, you have but to make the slightest signal at the window. The house will be unobtrusively but completely surrounded. Sounds good. Remember, a signal at the window, and we shall be with you instantly. At half past one the next afternoon, I remembered. The Turks had been so interested shaking off a non-existent tail driving out that they didn't even notice the workmen in the trench in front of number six Abashi. Our meeting was proceeding according to schedule. Fifty kilos of heroin in one quarter kilo tins and a hundred thousand American dollars lay on the table. I picked up one of the tins and strolled casually toward the window. What are you doing, Thomas? Just want to look at this stuff in the light, that's all. You have tested it yesterday and again not ten minutes ago. Yeah, but I just thought I'd, um... Hey, what, what's wrong with this blind here? The blind is nailed down. Get away from that window, Thomas. Here, I, if I can just pull it loose a, a little at this side but here. Stop, forget him. He's the talk of a police in Put down that chair, Thomas. Stay where you are, all of you. Look out, he has a gun. You mean a rod, don't you, Paige? You are all right, Mr. Thomas. All right, Colonel Marouk, and very glad to see you. For the third time, my luck had held, and a few hours later in the American consulate, I was dictating a cablegram to the commissioner, Bureau of Narcotics, Washington, D.C. Okay, Thomas, fire away. I'll put it right on the machine. Thanks, Stephen. Um, able today, with brilliant cooperation from Turkish police, to buy pure heroin from source of recent large shipment to U.S. Source destroyed. Operators in custody. Yeah, great. That's just great, Thomas. It'll go out tonight. Thanks. Thanks. Well, now that it's all over, how about taking me up on that offer? What's that? Do a little sightseeing before you go back to the States. I'd like to show you a little of Istanbul. One of the oldest cities in the world, you know. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The elimination of heroin source X closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving a dangerous criminal masquerade in the file case entitled The Roping of Joe Landis, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> The Silent Men is produced by Warren Lewis. Tonight's transcribed case was written by Mr. Lewis and directed by Walter McGraw. All names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Bernard Lenro, Leon Jenny, Danny Acco, Gregory Morton, and Ilya Brockton. This is Fred Collins speaking. Douglas Fairbanks may currently be seen in the motion picture Mr. Drake's Duck. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government, for they are the silent men. Carson and Joseph Cotton star now in The True Ground on NBC.
Radio Network is now entering its second quarter century as the leader in radio programming. Now it's the silent men on NBC. The Silent Men, starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks in The Silent Men. Transcribe stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. One of the prime requisites of a federal special agent is a thorough knowledge of undercover work. There are times when an agent must be able to transform himself into a convincing criminal. He must know the habits of the underworld, the talk, the psychology and the modus operandi of the habitual criminal. On his ability to fit himself into any situation and to assume any role necessary, an agent's life may and often does depend. In tonight's file case, in which I play the part of Special Agent Tom Brackett, such an undercover operation was required. It is entitled, The Roping of Joe Landis. Word had come in from our San Francisco field office of an unusual bargain sale out on the coast. Somebody was selling counterfeit $20 bills for two. As soon as the bills broke, Jim Curtis flew out from Washington. Five weeks later, I received orders to join him. I'd been told that District Chief Mike King would be waiting for me at the airport. He wasn't. So I got to a phone booth. This, please. What number are you calling? Isn't this the federal building? That's right. What department did you work? Is this the department that investigates things for the government? Would you mind stating your name, please? I um, um, just wanted a little information. Yes? It's about money. Counterfeit money. I wanted to know how you can tell if it's being passed. Oh, I see. Hold on a minute. What are you trying to do? Record this conversation? Will you repeat that? I said you're going to record this conversation and then you're going to have this call traced, aren't you? I can save you the trouble, Chief. I'm calling you from a phone booth at the airport <laughs> where you were supposed to meet me. Crack it! Oh, <laughs> crack it! You screwball. Get yourself a cab and come on down to the office right away. Right. Ah, that was quite a line of double talk you were dishing out, Chief. Is that SOP now for all telephone calls? <laughs> right out of the manual. <laughs> Tell them nothing until they know who they are and why they want to know it. Where's Jim Curtis? I thought he'd be here. Yeah, you're meeting him later on. Yeah? No, no. Jim's a working man now. He's gone into the printing supply business. A plant? That's a good way to know a lot of printers and engravers. You think the stuff's being printed here in San Francisco then, huh? Mm-hmm. Here, you take a look at one of the bills they're passing. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good, Chief. The engraver knew his business. That portrait of Jackson's a honey. Ah, uh, the color's a little light, though, especially mm. the green. Yeah, I noticed that. The serial numbers are sloppy. Printed typographically? Yeah, the last two serial numbers and the letter A are blurred on some of the notes. Not all of them. Uh, how many broke here in San Francisco? About 32 that were passed here in town the last five weeks. 32 in five weeks? Sounds like a small operation. There's reason to believe this has only been a trial run. Just getting ready for the big push, eh? Mm hmm. We've been testing this, huh? Any leads? Well, Curtis will bring you up to date. He'll be waiting for you in his car in front of Pier 16 down at the waterfront. Okay. Well, this shouldn't take long. Um, all I want is the name of the people who are passing the queer, the location of the place that's being printed, the name of the engraver, and the plates to convict them with. And the plates. Always the plates. <laughs> Within an hour, I was heading for my appointment with Jim Curtis. It was damp and foggy as only the San Francisco waterfront can be foggy. Curtis saw me first. Hey, over here, Tom, in the car. Hi. Well, welcome to San Francisco, Mr. Bragg. Ah, 
You sound like the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, sure. I'm a solid citizen now. Uh, Chief, tell you about my job. Selling printing supplies, isn't it? Yeah. You know what? I'm quite a salesman. Anything promising? Well, I'm kind of interested in a guy who runs a small plant. Got friendly with him. Found out he's not adverse to making a fast buck. Hmm. Said he'd print phony whiskey labels if I knew where to sell them. So I ran a make on him. What'd you find out? Name is Landis, Joe Landis. He was a top engraver in New York some years ago. Found anything to tie him in with the bad notes? Well, not exactly. He steers away every time I bring the matter up. But he's moved his plant three times in the last four months, and some of the 20s always oh, show up somewhere near his shop. Well, it certainly seems to be worth a little undivided attention. Where do I fit in? Well, now, look, I've told him about you coming out here. You're supposed to be a guy I work for back east, man with a big bankroll looking for profitable investment. Oh. Not necessarily legitimate one. He's more than willing to meet you. Oh, what name do I use? You're on. Good. When do I meet him? I'll bring him up to your hotel tomorrow afternoon, Tom. Where are we heading now? Oh, got a little job to do. Landis moved to this shop today, and I thought we might as well take a look at the place he moved from. Never can tell what he might have left behind him. Well, it's worth a try. Uh, better stop here and walk. Uh, take this flashlight, will you? Sure. Got a gun? Not with me. Think I'll need one? <laughs> you never know. He's a mild little guy, this Landis, but you never know. There yeah, is it. I think we'd better go around back. Be an easier door to open. Uh, how are you on lock? Not too good. Ah, no problem. It's unlocked. Mm. Well, we sure didn't do much of a cleanup yet. Hmm. Hold the light on this carton of junk here, will you? I'm, I'm going to empty it. All right. Ah, bits of scrap metal, some lead type. Oh, wait a minute. Here's something. Yeah, feel this paper. Hey, you can print money on this stuff. Jim, look. There's another piece with numbers on it. Looks like they were running a proof. 49A. All right, let me see that, Tom. 49A. Well, brother, maybe we got something. 49A, that's the last three figures on the serial number the phony bills. Quiet. Someone's at the door. Let's get out of here. Who's there? Be to Tommy. You're on your own. All right, see you tomorrow. I registered at the Von Dome, a downtown hotel that caters to men of dubious occupation. I spent the next couple of hours at the bar downstairs establishing myself as a visiting Easterner who had some money to throw around. The next day, I followed the same procedure. About two o'clock, I went up to my room to change. Shortly after, there was a knock on my door. Who's there? Curtis. Jim Curtis. Jim, nice to see you. Come in. Oh. Heard you got in, so I thought I'd come up and say hello. Uh, There's a friend of mine, Tom. Joe Landis meets Tom Bracken. Well, I'm glad to know you, Joe. I'm happy to know you. Sit down, man. I'll fix your drink. Uh, not for me, please. <laughs> my, my wife insists that I don't drink during the day. Jim? Yeah, sure, I'll have one. I'm still single. Okay. Uh, Joe here is a printer, Tom, and a good one. I told him that uh, most likely he could throw some work his way. Well, I can use a good printer. I do good work, Mr. Brackett. Very good work. Here's your drink, Jim. Oh, thanks. Can I talk to you straight, Landis? Uh, yes, yes. You think I'd have brought him up here if you couldn't? Tom? I just wanted to be sure. This job I have for you, Landis, is, um, well, a little uh, unorthodox, if you know what I mean. Uh, perhaps I should make myself clear at this point, Mr. Brackett. I'm a printer and engraver, and that's all. So if you have anything in mind that's not good printing practice, I... And I'm afraid Jim here may have given you the wrong impression. What kind of talk is this, Curtis? You know my type of operation. What'd you bring him up here for? I'll get it myself. Joe, you told me... I to... told you nothing. You said your friend might throw some work my way. Well, I need work badly, but not the kind he had in mind. What kind of a steer was this, Jim? You know I don't have time to waste on things like this. Eh, nice to have met you, Mr. Brackett. But there's no need for me to stay. My wife is waiting for me. She's a very excitable woman, and if I keep her waiting ten minutes, she... Well, you know the way some women are. Look, Landis, I don't get it. I'll say good afternoon, gentlemen. I must get back. Okay, Landis. Jim, you stay. I want to talk with you. Boy, did you ever louse me up. Well, now, Joe here isn't the only printer in town. Good afternoon. Oh, deadly, Annette. 
After finding that proof sheet with the serial numbers last night, after him asking me to peddle bootleg whiskey labels for him, he pulls the Righteous Indignation Act. Mm, I don't know. He was watching me pretty closely. Something might have made him suspicious. Well, why did he come at all? Maybe to look me over. If Landis is our man, he'll be checking up on me. And if he's satisfied, ah, a mountain will come to Mohammed. Yeah, okay. See you later, Mohammed. <laughs> I spent a pleasant, though expensive, few days making the rounds of the bars. I bought a lot of drinks, and I talked to a lot of characters. But more important, I established a personality for Tom Brackett, East Coast operator. Not being used to such lush living, I finished up Sunday night with a floating headache. I slept till late afternoon the next day. I was coming out of the shower when the phone rang. Hello? Mr. Brackett? This is Brackett. Landis? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The man who was in to see me last week. I'd like to talk with you. I'm here in the hotel. Sure, come on up to my room. I'm downstairs at the bar. How about joining me there? More privacy in my room. And if you don't mind, I'd rather you came down. All right. No difference to me. You'll be alone, won't you? All alone. Brackett, sit down. Well, nice, cozy little corner you picked, Landis. We can be alone and at the same time see what's going on. Why wouldn't you come up to the room? Afraid of something? Uh, no offense, Mr. Brackett. <laughs> My wife helped plan me the little things, and she thought it'd be better this way. I would have called you sooner, but we've been a little upset about your friend Curtis. Well, I hardly call him a friend. What's he done to upset you? And the missus is certain that he's a, well, an informer for the police. Hmm, could be. Haven't seen him for nearly three years. What makes you think so? Well, we moved our plant last week. And the next night, my wife went down to see if we'd left anything important behind. When she got there, she surprised the man inside the building. She saw him. It was Jim Curtis. She's positive? Yes. She found something that had dropped out of his pocket. Absolute identification. When was this? Night before we came to see you. That's why I wouldn't talk in front of him. Well, good idea. I'll check on him. If what you say is true, well... I uh, understand that you're looking for investment. That's right. And that you have the necessary cash to close the deal that looks good to you. Let's cut out the oratory, Landis. What's on your mind? Well, it's this way. Supposing I had some friends, very clever ones, who could turn out an excellent copy of a $20 bill. I'd like to see one so I could judge for myself. Supposing you could buy these bills for $10 a hundred. I'd still want to see the stuff. Reach under the table. What? You have it? Yeah. Careful how you hold it. Don't let it be seen. Hmm. And your friends aren't as clever as you think. Colors are too light. Serial numbers too heavy. Last two numbers in the A are out of line. They passed more than 70 of these with no trouble. This queer would have to be taken out of the country, maybe Mexico. If I handle this stuff at all, it's as a dealer. <laughs> My friends would be very amenable to this. However, I would have to discuss our little talk with them. Uh, you handle this uh, merchandise? Yeah, at a price. I'll keep the sample. Oh, no, 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 Gladys. Uh, that's my wife. You wouldn't think of it. All right, all right. But tell your friends I don't buy till I see all of it. And the plates, too. I want a guarantee of future delivery. The plates? I hardly think to say yes. that's the only way I'll know that I'm dealing direct. I'm not interested in working through jobbers. Uh, I'll tell them. And uh, you take care of Curtis? I'll do a little checking first. If you're right, good. When I got back to my room, I called the chief. He arranged a meeting that night between Curtis, myself, and him at Golden Gate Park. I took a roundabout route, checking carefully to see that I wasn't being followed. I found him there, sitting on a bench. Hi, Chief. Move over. <laughs> How's it feel to be one of the most publicized crooks that hits San Francisco in a given year? Oh, it's paid off. There's no doubt that Landis checked on me before he made the contact. Yeah, he must have. All right, let's have it. There's someone else in it with him, too. 
Sounds like a small operation. I gather his wife knows about it and is more than a little nervous about the whole thing. Well, maybe we can prescribe a sedative. Uh, did you get to see one of the bills? Yeah, yeah, but he wouldn't let me keep it. When did you see him again? He said he'd call me. We've hit a snag, Chief. Mrs. Landis saw Curtis leaving the old print shop last week, the night we found the proof sheet. Hmm, that's bad. She's positive. Landis tells me she's got absolute proof. Huh? What kind of proof? I don't know. I didn't want to press too hard. Well, that makes it tough, Tom. You have to move fast. Force the showdown. Yeah. Did the boys on the stakeout get anything new today? Descriptions of a few people going into Landis' shop. One of them was Ed McLoy. Frequent boarder of some of our better prisons. Ed, tell them about the Navy, Chief. Tom, we got the whole U.S. Navy working on this one. Eh? The Navy? Yeah, I was yeah. coming around to that. This afternoon, Mrs. Landis came out of the alley with a package wrapped in newspaper. She drove to the Oakland Bridge, stopped the car, and threw the package into the water. We want that package, so we called in the Navy. Well, what can they do about it? They're sending divers down in the morning to try and find it. So come on, let's drive out now and see how they're doing. i got to talk to Lieutenant Saunders. He's in charge. Think they'll find it? It's a big ocean. Yeah, it's a big Navy. Glad you got here, Chief. Just got word from meteorological boys. It marked out five areas in which the package might be found. Well, I'll be... How in the world did they figure that out, Lieutenant? Sort of naval magic, you might call it. Huh. We had the spot from which it was dropped. They've taken the estimated weight of the package, the wind velocity, speed of the ocean currents, and the topography of the ocean bottom. And, and they added, subtracted, and multiplied, and the answer is five areas to search. Yes. Can't say that I anticipate success, Mr. King, but my divers can use the practice. Well, when will you know? Late tomorrow afternoon. Should be finished by then. Um, one thing, Chief. Yes, Tom. On what did you base the estimated weight of the package? On the weight of a set of zinc plates. That's what I think the lady was anxious to get rid of. And as I told you... We know. You want want those plates. plates. (laughs) I spent the next day in my room waiting for Landis to call. When he hadn't, by six o'clock, I was sure something had gone wrong. I was about to contact the chief and tell him so when the telephone rang. I let it ring again. Yeah? Landis. Who? Joe Landis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Have you got enough cash to close a deal tonight? Yeah. If we make a deal. All right. What kind of suit are you wearing? Brown tweed. Why? Hat. Light tan. Be in front of the merchant's building at 7 o'clock. Stand at the curb, and a light panel truck will stop and ask you if you want to live. You ask how far they're going, and if they say McLoy Hotel, it's all right. Come alone. If there's anyone with you, they won't stop. All right, but it's got to be done tonight. I'm leaving town in the morning. It'll be done tonight. <laughs> Climax was shaping up, and I felt the tingling excitement that always hits me when I get close to the final big play. It's an excitement that has a little fear in it, too. I reminded myself that Joe Landers, for all his pleasant face and soft talk, could and would use a gun if he had to. Ed McCloy picked me up as scheduled and drove me to a little print shop on 10th. You made it all right? No, I don't like this. Oh, Mr. Brackett, this is my wife. Mm, how do you do? Always work this late, Joe? Uh, some handbills to get out. Grocery store on the corner. Weekend specials. You can finish up later. Shut it off, Joe. I look better if the press was working while we talk. Just in case someone... Turn the thing off. We're all right. What did we need this for, Joe? Lots of printers make good living. Just... Joe, tell her to keep quiet, will you? Now, turn the thing off. Baby, you've got to stop worrying. Let's get down to business. All right. Joe tells me you're interested in a hundred grand. Yeah, at a price. Let's see him. Don't do it, Joe. I got a feeling about this—a bad feeling. It's, it's driving me crazy. We'll burn it. Bring it on. This up. woman of yours gives me the willies, We've Joe. We've got to have the money. They're, they pull me in for writing bad checks. We've got to do it. You go home and wait for Joe, Gladys. We don't need you. I stay with Joe. Uh, let her be. All right. Bracket, you ready to buy tonight? That's what I'm here for, isn't it? What was Jim Curtis doing in our shop? That's what I want to know. Brackett said he'll handle Curtis Gladys. Now, stop thinking about it. Just give me the proof he was there. Mm -hmm. Gladys picked this up off the floor. Must have fallen out of his pocket. Now, let's see it. 
Let me keep this. I can make good use of it. I don't know. Should I, Ed? Give it to him. All right, now, about this deal. I want to see the money. All of it. It's hidden in the back room. Come on, let's go. Okay, take a look. 7,000 genuine, and it's yours. Uh, that's only because we need the money in a hurry. For future deliveries, we'll have to deal again. It's a deal. Give us the money and take it away. Well, you don't think I carry a roll like that with me, do you? The guys have been knocked off for a lot less. Now, it's in the vault at my hotel. That's no good to us. Joe, why don't you and me go home? McClary can handle it. No, you, you go yourself. I want to be around when Ed gets your money, and I want my share. If you stay, I stay. Bring the notes to my hotel. I'll pay you there. Uh-uh, no good. We'll have the stuff in the car, and I'll become a policeman. Joe, it isn't too late. Oh, easy. why don't you keep quiet? All right, now, here's how we'll work it. I'll go with you to your hotel, and you get the money. In the meantime, Joe will get a room for you in another hotel. You know which one, Joe. Yeah, I know. All right, when Joe calls us that everything's all right, we'll go there and close the deal. Well, that's all right with me. Now, Landis, let's see the plate. I tell you, I got him, Mr. Brackett. Isn't that enough? No. Don't do it, Joe. Don't do it. You've got to keep your voice down, Gladys. I told you, Landis, I want to see those plates. If not, I don't buy. I've got to know you can keep on printing them. All right, show them to him, Joe. Yeah. They're outside. I'll get them. See, he hides them in a garbage can. Made a false bottom, keeps them there. Some of our competitors want them pretty bad, not to mention the police. They're valuable. Yeah. Joe's going to be surprised. What about? What are you talking about now? The plates. He isn't going to find them. Nobody's going to find them ever. What? Where are they? Where'd you put them? Tell me around. We'll sell this bunch. Then we're through. Joe's a good engraver. He doesn't need this kind of work. You got him into this. Where are those plates? A place where they'll do us no harm. At the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. The chief's hunch had been a good one. Like he thought, the plates were somewhere on the ocean bottom near the Oakland Bridge. McCoy was furious, and for a moment I thought he was going to kill her. But Joe promised me that he could have another set of plates in two or three months. He'd made two sets of negatives and said he could turn out all the twenties I wanted. So I let myself be persuaded to go through with the deal. McCloy drove me to my hotel. After Landis called, I got my package of marked money and we drove to the Roxanne Hotel, a dirty little place near Chinatown. Landis and his wife were waiting for us. We had the lobby to ourselves. The clerk was conveniently absent. Everything all right, McGlory? Yeah, it seems to be. Where's the stuff? Up in a room? We didn't get a room. That's dangerous. We'll go out in the car and you follow us later. We'll blow the horn, then you come outside. We'll switch packages. Then we can get away fast. I'll wait here with Brackett. Keep him company. Come on, Joe. The Landises are what you might call cautious, eh? Yeah, no guts. Mm. You know, with his talent, he could be worth a million bucks. Mm. Now, that's it. Come on. I'll get my car, too. Take the money. Quick. I'll take that carton first. All right, here it is. Now the money. That man coming this way. It's that Curtis. Man. Here's the money. It's all in this envelope. There's another man with him now. All right, step on it, Joe. Hiya, Joe, Mrs. Landon. Uh, we're in a hurry, Jim. Get out of the car, all of him. Special agent, federal government. He's got a gun. Boy, I'll take your gun. Hand it over. Thanks. I right, get them out of the car, Tom. You see, it's just like I said, Joe. You laughed at me. I'm sorry, baby. I, I shouldn't have laughed. All right, come along, folks. My boss wants to meet you downtown. Yeah, sit down. We're going to have a little talk. Don't you say anything, Joe. Nothing at all. You better let us go, mister. We know our constitutional rights. Will you quote me the passage that gives you the right to process, manufacture, and distribute counterfeit money? My husband's a printer. He rented his shop to Mr. McCloy. What he did there, we don't know. Oh, that's interesting. And you've never met Special Agent Tom Brackett before, huh? Never saw him in my life till he walked over to the car. And you, McCloy, what have you got for us in the way of a yarn? Me? I'm stupid. I know when I've had it. Well, back to you, Mrs. Landis. Our information is quite complete. Now, here's the way it reads. Joe Landis, one of the country's top engravers, designed and created a set of zinc plates. 
for the manufacture of spurious $20 bills. Joe never saw any plates, let alone design them. Well, a man of your husband's skill, Mrs. Landis, makes identification positive. You've got no plates, so you can't prove it. We've got the man you brought in to fix your offset press when it broke down. He saw a reverse plate of the bill on it, and he was doing his work. And we've got the woman who was passing the bills for you. We don't know what you're talking about. Without the plates... The plates. They all know the importance of the plates. Mrs. Landis, I have news for you. I've got the place. I don't believe it. No. Ask Lieutenant Saunders to come in, Mr. Lieutenant Saunders, will you unwrap that package and explain to these people where and how you got it? No. This was found by Navy divers approximately 2,000 yards from the Oakland shore and 230 yards from the bridge. And in case you need something more convincing, here are two sets of negatives, which are recovered from your shop. They've got us, baby. They found the one square foot on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean that held them. And they've got us. By 10 o'clock the following night, Curtis and I were on a plane heading east. What are you thinking about, Sam? Joe Landis. Guy with his talent could make top wages, yet he preferred to work nearly two years on those plates, half starving while he was doing it. Why? Oh, I don't know. Maybe to prove that he's smarter than dumb clucks like us. <laughs> Only you know something they never do. Nice, mild mannered fellow like him. Why? Well, let's leave it to the psychology professor. Me, I'm going to catch your wings. You left something behind you the night we visited Landers' printing shop. That's how she knew you'd been there. Must have fallen out of your pocket. Oh? Wonder what it was. Just a piece of cardboard. Got it here. Oh, let me take a look. Better watch yourself for this. It's dangerous. Oh, let's see it. Here. What do you know? Snapshot of me and the two kids. That was dumb of me. You know what? What? Marion's begin to look more like a mother every day. She's a honey. Uh-huh. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The raping of Joe Landis closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving income tax evasion and wholesale murder in the file case entitled Death and Taxes, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Lewis and Rusoff and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Douglas Fairbanks may currently be seen in the motion picture, Mr. Drake's Duck. Now, here again is Mr. Fairbanks. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last two years, two million out of the ten million civilian refugees in Korea have died of exposure or action of war. Please send any usable spare clothing and or blankets to American Relief for Korea, A-R-K to Massbeth, Long Island, New York, or to St. Louis, Missouri, or Oakland, California. Please, and thank you. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Silent Men has come to you from Hollywood Radio City. Now it's Tin Pan Valley on NBC. Now, hear the Silent Men on NBC. The 
Silent Men, starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents The Silent Men, transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. And now here is Douglas Fairbanks. A nation is like a family in which each member carries his share of the work burden and pays his share of the cost. But in this society of men, there are those whose work is hidden and questionable, men who refuse to pay their way, who profit without accounting. However, these criminals cannot long escape the attention of the silent men, the special agents of the federal government who protect the well-being of many against the crimes of the few. Tonight, with your permission, I will play the role of one of those silent men, Special Agent Henry Renard, in the file case entitled, Death and Taxes. My home base was the Chicago office. But the game I was getting into was going to be played on another field. I got a call to report to Bureau Division Headquarters in Washington, D.C. That meant a special assignment. That was a flight from Chicago, Hank. Oh, sleepy. You want to go to a hotel and rest before we go into this? Maybe a long one. No, I'm ready now. The sooner I start, the sooner I finish. Good. Better come into my private office. And no calls until I'm finished with Mr. Renard. Take the chair beside the desk, Hank. All right. And I want you to look these over carefully. <sighs> Income tax returns, 1947 through 1950, for Otto Dushek. Dushek? The racketeer? Oh, no. Dushek, the businessman. Who says? He does. Huh. He's been mixed up in everything from punch boards to manslaughter. Every branch of the government has been on his tail. Yeah, but none of us have been able to prove anything. Hmm. Think we can get him on evasion? I hope so. He's a smart cookie, though. Remember that? I will. Come to think of it, I haven't heard much about Dushek in the last few years. Let me quit all the more obvious rackets. He's got a new line. What's that? Oh, that's the $64 question. Declared an income of $58,400 for 1950. Almost the same for other years, too. Deductions look normal. Source of income seems okay. Suppose he really has gone legitimate? He reports 50000 he lives like he was earning a million. Check his bank accounts? Normal. Safety deposit boxes? Haven't been able to find any. Could be in somebody else's name. A yeah, girl, possibly. Yeah. But what he's got doesn't prove anything for us. We're interested in money he may be getting and forgetting to declare. <laughs> in other words, it's, it's up to me to find out if Dushek is withholding his withholding. <laughs> That's it, boy. <laughs> uh, living in Philadelphia, huh? Want me to go there? Near there. Uh, not liable to run into anybody you know, are you? No, no. What about cover credentials? I've got them here in the file. You'll have a lot to memorize. Uh, let's see. Well, I see I have a criminal record. Do you send you armed robbery? And you're theoretically wanted for parole violation. Well, Dushek's no dope. You'd probably have old classmates in San Q, and if I get close to him, he may check. He will check. A record on you has been planted in the file out there. Good. Now... How do we plant me on Dushek? By planting something else. You still raising roses for a hobby? Sure, why? That gives you something in common with Dushek. He has the same hobby. Oh. Oh, now I see why I was brought into this. Huh. Well, what's the pitch? Flora shop. In Philadelphia? No, in Camden, New Jersey. Dushek will come to you. How does he find me, radar? He drives to Camden every day to go to the racetrack. Always stops in the same place to eat. The flower shop you're going to take over is right next door to his favorite restaurant. And we suck him in with a rose, eh? You tell us what to start for you, Hank. We'll get any kind of bush you want from any place in the world. I'll give you a list. I think we need one more touch, though. I'd like to open a little sideline. Oh, like what? Bookmaking. If Tushek becomes interested in me, it won't hurt if he finds I'm making a dishonest buck on the side. Mm, yeah, good idea. But remember... If the florist or the book shows a profit, <laughs> I'll declare it on my return. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, I'll send you to Alcatraz. <laughs> the bait was set, and the local police were quietly notified of the fake bookmaking setup. 
Arrangements were made for some of our men to phone bets in every day, and each day the display of roses in the window was changed. On the third week, I got the customer I'd been waiting for. You and your roses. What I tell you a minute ago? I told you to keep your mouth shut, didn't I? Something I can do for you, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah. What are them things in the window there? Oh, um, oh, the sweet peas. No, not them crummy things. The roses. Them, them. Oh, those are Irish fire flames. Yeah, I never saw them before. Well, they're a single hybrid tea rose. Oh, tea rose, coffee rose. Can't you stop here on the way back? You'll miss a daily double. You don't shut up a daily double, you'll miss will be two of your teeth. You want to shoot your mouth off, get outside and wait in the car with Mike. I ain't going. Get out in the car. All right, all right. And while you're sitting there, give your jaws a rest. Dumb broad. Can't take nothing but horses. I send her flowers. All she wants to know is how much they cost. Would you like to look at the fire flames? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're interested in fragrance, the hybrid teas are always excellent. Yeah, you? yeah, I know they are. That's why I like them much better than them uh, polyanthus. Polyanthus ain't got much smell, you know. Well... I see you know something about roses. Yeah, yeah, I raise them. I, uh... uh... Excuse me a minute. Yeah, sure, sure. Reynolds Flower Shop. Huh? Um, well, could you, uh, g- uh, could you call back a little later? I've, I've got a, uh... Oh. All right, I'll take it. Two o'clock. Okay. Now, I don't have to repeat it. I, I told you I've got it. Right. I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Dushek. Otto Dushek. Mr. Dushek. How long you been in this place? I bought it about five weeks ago. <laughs> I thought you was new. You're a pretty smart guy. I beg your pardon? You beg my pardon. Come on, how's the action? What's your take, huh? I don't know what you're talking about. You want to see these flowers or, or don't you? <laughs> what a front. Most of the boys use candy stores or they hold up in some cellar with a telephone. You'll give a business a little class. You talk good English, too. Look, I don't know what's on your mind. Oh, yes, you do. You're booking horses here. I know a phone bet when I hear one. Is this a pinch? <laughs> I look like a cop. No, you don't look like a cop. You look like a mug who might think he's going to shake me down for protection. <laughs> this is peanuts to me. I play a game that really pays off. Then why don't you go play it and stay out of mine? Because I think maybe we can do business together. What kind of business? Well, uh, the now roses. Until we get to know each other. He came back every day after that. But for the next month, he acted like a customer. I had to get closer to him, and the roses were the key. I sold him a bush that was showing the first traces of black rust. When he transplanted it, I knew the disease would spread to the rest of his roses. It did. Ten days after he bought the contaminated bush, I was called to his penthouse, a luxurious place, overlooking the city of brotherly love. Look at him, look at him, look at him. They're dying. Some kind of bugs got on him or something. Yeah, that's not insect damage. Well, what is it then? Phragmidium mucronatum. No, no, never mind the big words. Tell me so I know, huh? Black rust. Well, what am I going to do about it? Let him die? I can fix them. I can come back tomorrow. Ah, uh, tonight. I've got to get a lot Mike of... can get whatever you need. You fix them tonight. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike! Mike ain't here, Otto. Oh, where is he? Well... Where is he? You're losing your mind or something. You know where you sent him. Oh. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, then. Uh, get your coat on. You're going out. Uh, tell her what to get, huh? Yeah, I'll, I'll write it down for you. Sulfur and... Fernet. Mixed in this quantity here. And, um, a hand sprayer. He should worry about me like he worries about these things. Shut up and go. Uh... All right, Dushek, if you want to save your flowers, let's get busy. Hey, what are you pulling them leaves off for? All the diseased leaves have to come off before we spray. It's going to take a couple of hours, so come on. Oh. You know something, Renard? No. What? You're all right. Yeah. You're an all right guy. Uh, 
It's almost 2 a.m. Yeah, this is the last bush. Yeah. You want a drink? Yeah. <coughs> might, might help wash the sulfur fumes out of our throat. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that doesn't. Okay, let's go in. Hey, Betty. Betty, Betty, come on, come on, wake up, will you? Uh, huh? Mix us a couple of drinks. Come on. All right. You got my shoes on. Mike's back. Oh, where is he? In the library. Big brain like you. Gotta have a library. Bring a drink, then. Bring one for Mike, too. Hi. Oh, you know Renard, Mike. Only by seeing him through a flower shop window. Hi. Hi. Betty's mixing some drinks. When would you get back? An hour ago. How'd it go? <laughs> well, no, it's all right. It was smooth. No trouble, eh? Not a rumble. Good, that's the way I like it. Here's the stuff. And mix your own drink. I ain't no bartender. You ain't nothing. Put it down and get out of here. Eh, scotch okay for you? Fine for me. Good. Fix your own, Mike. Thanks. You know, Renard, I could uh, use a guy like you around here. I don't like working for other people. You like working for me? No, thanks. Look, don't brush me off, punk. I mean, uh, you ain't never going to get no place with a flower shop and a two-buck book. You want to raise roses? Raise them here, huh? For how much? More money than you ever saw before. How much? You could cut almost 100 G's a year. Do I look like a sucker? What do you mean by that? You setting me up to take some kind of rap for you? Why pick me? You don't know me. You don't know anything about me. <laughs> Tell him, Mike. You did two years in queue for armed robbery. And you're still on parole. You're hot for leaving the state of California without permission. Hmm. You're smarter than I thought, Dusha. And you're dumber than I thought. What? Huh? Now, don't get hot. You got a lot to learn. You get picked up on a crummy bookmaking rap and you'll wind up back in queue to do the rest of your bit with a few years tagged on for the parole shop. So, suppose I get caught working for you. Is that going to be any better? Much better. We don't leave witnesses like you did on your stick-up. My boys don't go to jail. All right. I'm listening. How far are you willing to go? For 100000 a year? You write the ticket. The tickets we sell are one way. All the way. But in the safest business of all, the murder business. You call that safe? In four years, I never even had a man picked up on suspicion. Police can't set up a murder rap without a motive. Well, you must get paid for the job. Sure, 50%. 50% of what? Insurance money. And it's usually double, uh, double, uh... Double indemnity. Yeah, yeah. Because they all look like accidents. Are you kidding Insurance companies would check on you the second time you filed a fat death claim. We don't file the claims. We don't insure nobody. Draw him a blueprint, Mike. Well, lots of guys get married. Then they get sorry about it. Sometimes businessmen don't like their partners. Sometimes a guy insures his mother in And sometimes they get impatient for people that die, so we help them. So 50% of the insurance money, our minimum is 10 G's each job. I see. Go ahead. <laughs> Kind of late. You must be tired. Why don't you stay here tonight? I'll uh, fill you in on the business later on. When? After you finish your first assignment. I slept, but I didn't sleep well. In the morning, Dushek had Mike drive me out to the flower shop in Camden. I told him I had to sell the place, make it look legitimate. As soon as I could shake him, I made a call to the chief of my division. He flew in from Washington, and we met in a lounge at a small theater. I briefed him on the Dushek operation. I don't think I missed And we'll get inside. A murdering, huh? As cold-blooded as they come. Yeah, Dushek is headed for worse than Alcatraz, then. This isn't the case for us, Hank. You'd better pull out right now. I can't. I'm in there close to him. It's the only way to get him. Yeah, what's your plan? Well, you'll have to help me. Plenty. Take a check on his number one boy, Mike. Oh, uh, we know all about him. Mike Donnelly, strong arm boy. Find out where he was last night. Well, it's impossible to trace now. I think he left 
and return by plane. Well, what makes you think so? They wouldn't be there killing around home base in Philadelphia. Mike drove Dushek to the track yesterday and came back with him. But between 6 o'clock last night and 1 this morning, he killed somebody. Then if he went any distance, it must have been by air. Chances are it wasn't any more than an hour's flight. But he got in at 1 a.m. That means he came in on a flight that landed about midnight. Well, we can check airline reservations. Police must have photos of him from his arrest. Get a shot. Run down all airline stewardesses who worked on flights coming into Philadelphia around midnight last night. If one of them remembers Mike... We'll know where he was. Yeah, I get it, Hank. When we find the city, we ask for a list of last night's fatal accidents. The victim will be somebody insured for at least $25,000. And the beneficiary will be able to supply an airtight alibi. Sure, sure. They'd work it that way. Hey, you beginning to get the idea? Like a flash from the lighthouse. The money. That's it. The beneficiary will get a check from the insurance company. But Dushek won't accept his payment in any form except cash. The yeah, beneficiary will have to cash the check, either at bank of his own or the bank used by the paying insurance company. That's right. If the banks work with us, the money can be marked. It'll have to be passed some way, but if we can prove it winds up in Dushek's hands, <laughs> we've got him. Man, if I can run everything down, I'll arrange for the marking, all right? Good. I'd better get back to Dushek, so I'll leave first. You, you better stay here for about ten minutes. Now, be careful, Hank. I'm going to alert all police forces on this, as well as other federal divisions. Don't slip up any place, or they'll kill you. Huh. That isn't what I'm worried about. I'm worrying about the night Dushek sends me out to kill somebody else. <laughs> I went back to Dushek, and for five days I took care of the roses. Then, one day, Betty left for the track with him, but she didn't come back with him. She turned up late that night, carrying an unusually large purse. Dushek and Mike went into the library with her, and Mike came out stuffing a roll of bills into his pocket. What's the matter, Renard? The roses getting you down? I don't seem to be making any money. You will. Maybe tonight. Otto wants to see you when he comes out. I thought this was a big operation. It is. Look, you were away on one trip last week. Get wise, boy. This is only headquarters. Otto's got men all over the country. Branch officers. He likes you. You stick close and you'll get a cut on all of them. The big cuts you get from what you do yourself, though. I'm ready. Good. Because I think Otto's ready, too. If you don't do something to grab. I uh, got a little assignment for you tonight, Hank. Yeah, so Mike was telling me. Where am I going? Wheeling, West Virginia. Oh. You catch a train in about an hour. You get in there at 6 a.m. Then what? Here. Tear this paper up after you memorize the phone number. Mm, okay. Call that number, then you go to the street corner. It says there. Stand on the corner, lean against the bus sign, and read a newspaper. At 7.30, somebody will stop the car right in front of you and get out and walk away. You take the car. Will it be a stolen car? Of course it'll be a stolen car. It'll belong to somebody working early shift at the mines. By the time it's missed, you'll be back here. Uh... Get the dame's picture, Mike. It's in the table drawer right beside you. Oh, yeah. Well, here's your pigeon. How do I meet her? I run her husband on a restaurant. She leaves the house every morning at 8. She got the address there. Her car will be out of commission. It'll be right on the street in front of the house. You offer her a lift. Suppose she says no. Use a gun to coax her. If I'm going to shoot her, I might as well do it right there. Shooting don't look like no accident. When you get in a car, knock her out, and then find a nice spot between the house and town. Dump her out and run her over. Get away fast and ditch your car. You understand? Yeah. I understand. How do I get back here? There's a plane out of Wheeling at 10.30. There's a reservation on it for a Mr. Wilson. That's you. You'll be back here for lunch. And no petty cash. Don't touch nothing in the dame's purse. It's got to look like an accident. I'll handle it. Okay, sure. Now, read it back to me, the whole thing. I went over the plan for him, and I left. But Mike drove me to the station. He pretended to leave me at the train, but I saw him swing on three cars behind. I was being tagged. Was Dushek having me followed as a precaution, or had I made a mistake? I felt sick. Is this seat taken? No. Mind if I sit down there? Not at all. I have a couple of magazines. You care to read one? No, thank you. I'm Miss Spelling, departmental secretary. How did... Don't you... talk, let me. The man who dropped you at the station followed you. He's on the train. I know, but who sent you? Divisional chief. He's had men watching you, but he didn't want a man to make the contact. 
to have any message? Yes, but it'll be too much to remember. That's another reason for me. I'll take it in shorthand on the margin of this magazine. Just let me know if anybody comes through the aisles. Watch the back platform. How are you going to relay the information? I'll get off when the train stops at Allentown. Two special agents will be waiting there. Good. You ready? Go ahead. I gave her the story as quickly as I could. Then I watched through the window as she got off at Allentown. She was not followed. I still had time to play my hand out with Mike, though. I got off the train at Wheeling, picked up the stolen car, and drove to the designated house. I circled the block until a woman came out and made a vain attempt to start the car at the curb. She got out and raised the motor hood as I turned the corner. I stopped. May I give you a lift? I guess my battery's dead. Which way are you going? You name it. Downtown? Climb in. Thanks. I don't want you to be frightened, but for your own information, you just did a very foolish thing. Don't worry about it. I'm not the woman you were supposed to pick up. I'm a policewoman. What? Your message was relayed from Allentown. We've got Mrs. Delka in protective custody. She was the intended victim. I'm the same size and color as she is, so they sent me to take her place. Well, thank heaven for that. Did you have any instructions for me? You're probably still being followed. Not probably. I am. There's a car about a block and a half behind us matching our speed. You have to lose him. I know. Well, I know the town. I'll tell you when and where to turn. When you get clear, drop me off and go back to Philadelphia as though you carried out two checks assignment. What's the idea of that? Well, Mr. Belkin is away on a vacation. He probably arranged this. We need time to pick him up. You see, he'll be told his wife is dead, then he'll be accused of conspiracy and a murder. If it's properly handled, we may get a confession from him. Meanwhile, your other federal boys want Dushek to think his business is as usual. My chief will... Turn right here. Quick. Now take the cutoff into the hills up ahead. Are the cars still coming? We lose him by the old mine road. What were you going to say before? I was going to ask you if my chief told you to pass on any information about a man named Mike Donnelly. That's probably Donnelly back in the car that's tailing us. Yeah. We got a complete line on where he went last week. It was Baltimore. Man killed in a hit and run accident by a stolen car. Heavily insured? By his business partner. $50,000 double indemnity. I thought so. Now we've got to lose that car behind us. The roads are starting to wind now. Take the turn off as I call them to you. Left here. Now, short right. Quick! We lost him in the maze of mine roads and cut back toward the town. I dropped the policewoman off and ditched the car, then went to the airport and picked up the reservation Dushek had arranged. When I got back to the penthouse in Philadelphia, nobody was there. I waited an hour, two hours. Then Dushek came home. Hello, Renard. Hello. Your job all done? Yeah. That's nice to know. When do I get paid? Everything went okay in about a week. If it didn't go, okay, maybe sooner. What do you mean? I just picked Mike up at the airport. He was out of town, too. His plane got in a little later than yours. What are you driving at? You'll see. Come on in here, Mike. Renard says everything went okay in Wheeling, Mike. Yeah? That's nice. That was a simple I'll problem. I'll talk. You'll listen. I sent Mike to follow you to make sure you didn't make no mistakes. You got wise to that, Renard. You knew I was behind you and you shook me. Why'd you do that, Renard? What was it you didn't want Mike to see? You followed me? You know I did. I know now. I didn't know in Wheeling. All I knew is that I had a car tagging me. Were you crazy? What do you mean? How did I know it was him? It might have been a police car. Sure, I lost him as soon as I was tagged. You think I want to be caught with that woman in the car? You didn't know it was me? How could I know? You recognize the driver of a car a block and a half behind you through a rear vision mirror? I ought to knock your teeth out, Mike. Whoa. All right, stop it, bother you. How could you let him do a thing like that, Dushek? You say you play everything safe. It makes me think I'm being followed and I have to speed through a town in a stolen car. Is that safe? All right, all right. We had to make sure. Did you take care of the woman? I did my job. When I work for somebody, I do what I'm told. You mind if I check on it? What do you mean? Long distance? 
I want to put a call through to Wheeling, West Virginia. No, no, no special party. I just want to talk to the county morgue. I could feel myself tightening up as Dushek was connected with the morgue and started to give a description of Mrs. Belka. It was a checkup I'd never thought of. My only hope was that the police would have it covered. Yeah? Yeah. No, 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 I won't have to. Thank you. Thank you very much. What'd they say? Guess, Mike. I don't want to play games. I told you Renard was all right tagging him with your idea and a dumb one, like he said. He could have been picked up for speeding in that stolen heap. We'd all be in for it. All right. So now we know. They found the body? Yeah. He were a little careless, though. So. How? She was still alive when they found her. She, she talked? No. Unconscious all the way. She was dead on arrival when I got her to the hospital. She was just... Yeah, it must be Betty. Dumb broad, always forgetting the key. Let her in, Mike. Okay. When do I get to draw a little money? You want a couple of grand now? I'd like it. And I got it. I always... Wait, got a wine, chum. Hold him, Police, I'll try to keep him out. in your pocket. Hello, Arno. Well, my favorite detective, Mr. Walsh. What brings you here? I'm going to arrest you, Dusek. Yeah? And what for? Murder. A couple of them, in fact. One in Baltimore last week and one that didn't quite come off in Wheeling today. What are you talking about? You'll be extradited, Dushek. Belka's wife is alive, but Belka confessed about the deal you made. Renard. Don't be so surprised, Dushek. Your mouth drops open and you look very stupid. I'm a special agent of the United States government. So, Mrs. Belka isn't dead, then, huh? So where's your murder charge, Walsh? You're forgetting Baltimore. Man wanted to get rid of his partner. Remember? I want to call my lawyer. I got constitutional rights. That's the wonderful part about this country, Dushek. Everybody has. <laughs> Even you. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. Otto Dushek learned the certainty of death and taxes when his murder ring was smashed. Thanks to the efforts of the silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you the story of international banditry in the South China Sea in the file case entitled Piracy, 20th Century Brand. Another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Joe Murcott and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Douglas Fairbanks may currently be seen in the motion picture, Mr. Drake's Duck. Now, here again is Mr. Fairbanks. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last two years, two million out of the ten million civilian refugees in Korea have died of exposure or action of war. Please send any usable spare clothing and or blankets to American Relief for Korea, A-R-K, to Massbeth, Long Island, New York, or to St. Louis, Missouri, or Oakland, California. Please, and thank you. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Now, it's Tin Pan Valley on NBC. Fairbanks, Jr. in The Silent Men. The 
National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men. Transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. In the United States of America, a man may legally purchase a gun to be kept in his home for the protection of himself, his family, and his rights. This is a constitutional privilege denied in most other nations of the world. However, as crime records attest, not all guns are purchased legally. Those who would use a gun for evil purposes cannot risk the scrutiny that goes with legal purchase. They buy illegal weapons handled in the shadows outside the law, guns bought to intimidate or kill rather than to protect. Against the traffic in illegal weapons, we have one defense, the silent men. Special agents of the federal government who track down the purveyors of illegal weapons. Tonight it is once again my privilege to play the role of one of these silent men, Special Agent Paul Wellman, in the file case entitled Souvenirs of War, in which only the names and places are fictional. It started in Detroit with a request from the local police. They were holding an 18-year-old boy, Billy Watkins, on a charge of murder. He'd killed a liquor store proprietor in a holdup. The federal government entered the case because of the weapon employed. Better come into my private office, Mr. Wellman. Thank you. Quieter in here. Sit mm. down. Ah, thanks. At the um, gun on your desk? Yeah. Ah. German Luger. Nazi army issue for officers. Your your lab been over this? Yeah, you can handle it. Uh-uh. How about the slug? American ammunition, near as the lab can determine. Quite a few companies put out shells of almost identical caliber. Yeah. Not perfect fits, but close enough to kill a man with. Well, we've had a couple of other foreign gun cases. Like what? These. Kid killed in a gang fight a few months ago. The lab thinks the murder weapon might have been a Mauser. And here's another. Negro shot down while he was waiting for a bus. Mm. Witnesses saw a couple of youngsters barrel by in a hot rod when the shot was fired. Slug indicates a weapon of Belgian manufacture, according to ballistics. This kid, this um, Billy Watkins, who killed the liquor store man, uh, he tell you anything? Tough one. Clammed up. You want to talk to him? Is he here? I had him brought in from the county jail this morning. I've got him in the bullpen. You got a private office I can see him in? I'd like to um, get him out of the cell for a few minutes. Sure. You go in here. All right. I'll get him and bring him in to you. I ain't saying nothing. My lawyer told me not to talk to nobody. Now, as far as the charge of murder against you is concerned, he may be right, Billy, but I'm not interested in the murder charge. That's for the local authorities. I want to know about the gun that was found on you. Where'd you get it, Billy? I got nothing to say. Okay. Well, maybe we can talk about something else, huh? Understand you come from a large family, eh? Six. You're the oldest, aren't you? Yeah. Guess you've made your family pretty happy. Well, I don't care whether they're happy or not. They'll get by. Oh, sure, sure. Looking at you through bars isn't going to bother them at all. Hmm. That's why you've refused to see your mother, isn't it? Why don't you leave me alone? That's the stuff. Be tough. You got a kid brother, 14 years old. Maybe he'll see what a big shot you are. Maybe he'll wind up sharing a cell with you for a few years later on. I don't care what you say to me. I ain't going to tell you nothing. Why should you? It's going to spoil your kid brother's chances. Maybe if you keep quiet, somebody will put a gun in his hand someday and he can join you for good. You've been involved in a series of petty thefts, Billy, but never with a gun until this time. You threw away your whole life on that gun. It's my life, ain't it? I ain't kicking about it. You killed a man. You threw his life away. You threw away the lives of your mother and your father. Oh, let me alone. I asked you to leave me alone. Go ahead, ball. It'll do you good. <laughs> you want to see your mother? She couldn't come. She couldn't take it. You want to see her here, in this office, without bars between you? Oh, they wouldn't let me. You know they wouldn't. I could fix it. It might be the last time, Billy. The last chance for the rest of your life without the bars. What do you say, boy? I... All I want to know is where you got the gun. 
I bought it. From who? I don't know. I never saw him. I don't know who he was. You gonna stick to that? It's the truth. Oh, it's hard to explain. Try. I'm listening. Well, I had to put $50 in a locker in the bus depot. Go ahead. Well, then I took the locker key and put it in an envelope. I mailed it. Just like that? No address? It went to a guy named Harold Callan at the Hotel Sussex. You never saw him? No. Then what? Well, the next day I got a letter. An envelope come in the mail, and it had a key in it. Uh-huh. For a locker in the railroad depot. Well, I went and opened it, and the gun was there in a package. I see. Well, who told you to write to this Harold um, Callan in the beginning? A fortune teller? No. It, it, it was... Go ahead, Billy. A guy named Burton. Who's he? Fats Burton. He used to run a pool room on Lake Street before the war. He was in the Army. And mm -hmm. He said the Callan guy was in the Army, too. That's how come he had the gun. It was a war souvenir. All right, Billy. The guard will take you back to your cell. You said I could have a visitor. You will have. As soon as I've checked your story. The story wasn't easy to check. Up to a point, we followed the lead Billy Watkins had given me, but it wound up against a stone wall. I went back to police headquarters. Got a report for you, Wellman. Good. You won't think so. It is. Here's statements from every employee of the Sussex Hotel. Isn't Harold Callan registered there anymore? He never was registered there. Well, that Watkins kid wasn't lying to me, Chief. I didn't say he was. Nobody at the hotel ever heard the name Callan before? The night desk clerk might have. He's not sure. How come? Too many names to remember on a job like that. But uh -huh. when he was going over the register with my men, he, he said he thought a man had stopped in one night and asked if he was holding a letter in the name of Callan. I see. Clerk said he did have a letter. You know, uh, sometimes mail comes to a hotel for people who are traveling, haven't reached the place to check in. Sure, sure. It's a good gimmick. As far as the clerk remembers, Callan said he'd planned to stay at the Sussex. That's why he'd had his mail sent there. But he had to go right back home because of urgent business. Yeah, that figured. Don't suppose he said where home was, did he? If he did, the clerk doesn't remember it. Looks like our only lead to Callan, if Callan is his name, will be through Fat Burton, ex-GI and pool room operator. No good, Mr. Wellman. Why not? Burton's back in the Army. Oh. He re-enlisted and was assigned to duty in the Allied sector of Germany. Uh -huh. Went over last week. Oh, Great. I suppose you could work an angle and have him sent back to the States. Well, what good would it do? He's committed no crime, none that we could prove. There's the kid's story. Sure. The word of a murderer against a citizen without a record. A soldier on top of that. No. Nope. Burton's out. We can't hold him. I had loose threads and nothing to tie them to. I tried to find a man named Harold Callan who mightn't even exist. Billy Watkins had made his contact through Fat Burton in the pool room circuit. I tried the same circuit. For weeks, I clicked balls together, sticking to the places where young hoodlums seemed to gather. Finally, I hit something. Hey, Say, that was a pretty nice shot, mister. Well, thanks. Want to shoot a game? Yeah, all right. Well, uh, what do you want to play? Rotation? Chicago? Or the black ball? You pick it. Rotation. Hey, Pete! Drag him up here, will you? Okay. Uh, loser pays, okay? Sure. Now, how about a little action on the side? Well, you've watched my game. I haven't seen yours. Well, I don't think I'm as good as you are. Uh -huh. Nickel a point shouldn't leave nobody bleeding. How about it? All right, nickel a point. Thanks, Pete. All right. Toss to see who breaks. Fair enough. Yeah. You call it. Head. Tail. Okay, bust them. He played off his game deliberately, keeping his score just a few points behind mine. On the second game, we raised the stakes to a dime a point. On the third, a quarter. He was letting me win, building it up, but I wasn't interested in his game. He was wearing a button-up sweater, and when he leaned across the table to make difficult shots, there was a bulge that had a familiar look. Ah... If I think that when I beat you. Now you get it. You're right. I get it. And that puts me eight points up. Two dollars. Okay. Here. Now, how about a chance to get even? 
Buck a point. No, thanks. I had enough. What do you mean? I want a chance to get even. I said I don't want to play anymore. What, do you take me for a pigeon? You're the one who suggested the betting. I've got a right to quit. Oh, nice. Nice when you've been winning all the time. Suppose you lost. And maybe you couldn't even pay off. I'd like to see. See what? The color of your money. Sure. Here, take a look. You satisfied? Yeah. I thought maybe you were a shark. Must be a hundred bucks there. Eh, a little more or less. Well, thanks for the game and the money. Uh, wait a minute. I'll walk out with you. Time on table four, Pete. I'll pay you later. Okay. Uh, you live around here? No. No, I'm staying at a hotel downtown. Well, I'm going that way. I'll give you a lift. Got a car? Yeah. Parked on the next street. Let's go through the alley here. Sure. All right, this way. It's kind of dark and narrow, but it's a shortcut. Yeah, I understand. Oh, you! Keep your hands from under that sweater, boy. If you don't, you're going to get hurt. Listen, you let me alone. Let me go. Oh, I, I will as soon as I get this. Kind of dangerous toy for a boy of your size. You a cop? Your questions can wait. Mine come first. You can answer them downtown. Now, get moving. But don't get smart. <laughs> The gun was of Italian manufacture. Again, an army issue. The boy's name was Gene Shelby, and his story about getting the gun was the same as the story told by Billy Watkins. Money left in a locker, a key mailed, another key received. There was only one difference. Come on, Gene. Who gave the instructions for buying the gun? A girl. What's her name? Marie. That's all I know. Where'd you meet her? Well, she's a checkroom girl. It's a stockade. That's a dance hall. Marie Kinsey? Oh, I don't know her last name. I never asked her. You know the girl, Chief? I know her. Let's leave this boy alone for a moment. I'm sure he won't try to leave. Sit down. What about this Marie Kinsey? We've been interested in her from time to time. What for? The usual things. But she's also suspected of being a fence for stolen goods. Well, that sounds good. I thought so, too. She could use that check room as a clearinghouse for anything those young hoodlums picked up. And in her business, she'd also know which ones would be interested in buying guns. I can have her picked up. Uh-huh. No, no, no good. She's in the clear just like Fats Burton was. We have no actual evidence. She might get scared and talk if we brought her in. But if she didn't, our trump cards are all tipped. This kid said he mailed a locker key to a man named Harry Cassidy. But if we check the hotel, we're going to get the same story we got on the other one. Sure, but... You got an idea? Possibly. Billy Watkins mailed a key to Harold Callan. Gene Shelby mailed a key to Harry Cassidy. Harold Callan, Harry Cassidy. Both phony names. But both with the same initials, H.C. Yeah, I see what you mean. Check your alias sheets, Chief. Nine men out of ten, when they pick a phony name, use a name with their own initials. You say you've had a watch on the uh, Kinsey girl at the stockade ball room? On and off. Then your boys know something about her context. Dig into them and see if you can find a boyfriend or somebody with the initials H.C. What about the kid? He's yours, carrying a concealed weapon. You can book him. Okay. Oh, uh, just a minute. Before we go out there again. What? You said Fat Burton re-enlisted in the Army. That's right. Why would he go back in the Army? He could go to Europe as a civilian, buy up a batch of guns. Yeah, but smuggling the guns into the States would be a big problem. As a soldier, Fats Burton could lick that problem. Soldiers coming home on rotation might get through with a lot of guns for a buddy. Oh, uh, we'll check it. Take a couple of hours. Want uh, to wait around? No, thanks. No, no, not tonight. I think I'll go dancing at the Stockade Ballroom. <laughs> Marie Kinsey was easy to notice at the Stockade Ballroom. She was hard not to notice. A statuesque blonde in tight slacks. But when you got up close, she wasn't as young as she looked. Come on, come on, you guys. You can't wear overcoats on the floor. Check them. You two busted with a hat. Me? Hi. Hi. Start shedding. Pardon me? The coat. Take it off. I can't check it while you're wearing it. No, I'm not staying. I'm just looking for somebody. Oh, uh, who? A uh, kid named, uh, Gene Shelby. You know him? 
What do you want to see him about? You'll know. Well, doesn't come here every night. He's supposed to meet me here at 8 o'clock. It's 8.30 now. I know. I've been waiting outside and in the lobby. I've got to find him. It's important. So grab a table by the bar and wait. If he's supposed to meet you, he'll be here. Yeah. Is, um... Isn't there any place else I could wait? I, I, uh... I don't like all the people. Why not? Look, um... You've got a chair in there in the check room. Maybe if I came in and sat there... Nobody's allowed behind the counter. Not even for ten dollars? For ten bucks, you can buy the place. Come on. Hmm. Well, this is a little better. Come on, Wolf. Work with the camel's hair. Here. Here, don't forget the check. You really hate crowds, don't you? For ten bucks, I don't expect questions. You turned your head away when those guys were checking that coat. I turned my head a lot. I don't want to get a stiff neck. You hot? You ask a lot of questions, don't you? I'm going to get out of here. If that kid shows up, tell him thanks for nothing. Wait a minute. Relax. What's so important about seeing the Shelby kid? What's it to you? I know him pretty well, that's all. I need something. He was going to help me to get it. He was going to introduce me to somebody. Who? Oh. He didn't say. I'm like a chump I didn't ask. If I had, I wouldn't need him. He... Wait a minute. Have fun, fellas. Listen, I think I know what you're in the market for. I doubt it, baby. Sort of a uh, noisemaker? If you go in for that kind of a party? Hmm. You're pretty smart. Yeah, now. Anybody would know you were hot to look at you. Who cost you a hundred bucks? Shelby said fifty. A hundred. Yes or no? Yes. Let me make a call. Now, wait a minute. No call, no merchandise. Um, go ahead. But I need this thing right away, tonight. No good. I need it, I tell you. You can have it the day after tomorrow, no sooner. So make up your mind. <sighs> I got a big choice. Make your call. Marie, I got a customer. All right. I got it. Hundred. Yeah. Bye. You got a pencil? Yeah, here. No, you write it. Harry Callan. C A L L E N. Hotel Waltham. Can I go over and see him tonight? You don't go see him at all. Go to the depot, five blocks from here. Put the money in an envelope. And then stick it in one of them dime lockers and nail him the key. It was the same setup. Whoever her partner was, neither of them would come out in the open to be linked with the guns they were selling. I left the stockade, switched taxis twice to make sure I wasn't followed, and headed for police headquarters. By the time I got there, I had a plan. And the chief. Had some information. Looks like your queries about Pat Burton paid off, Mr. Wellman. What'd you get on him? Here it is. Walter Burton, drafted October 16th, 1943. Member of the draft board says that Burton offered him a bribe for deferment. <laughs> Sounds like a real patriot. Now, all of a sudden, he starts to miss the uniform and goes back to enlist. Yeah, fishy, all right. Got an army report on his assignment? Yeah. Being a volunteer, he requested the assignment he got. He's in the Quartermaster Corps, port of embarkation. Great. Ha! Rotation troops at his fingertips, and half of them are lugging souvenirs. He must be picking up guns like jelly beans. What he can't get from them, he'll be buying from hungry civilians. Not every soldier that comes through there lives in the city, you know. They don't have to. Once they get to the States, they can mail the guns to somebody here. He's probably got dozens of them doing it on every incoming ship. They don't know his game. How about those initials you were checking, H.C.? There we hit the jackpot. Marie Kinsey has a married sister. Her husband's name is Herb Collier. That time? Like a dream. And I know how we can nail him. How? The man's going to sell me a gun. I'm going to put the money in a locker at the depot tonight and mail him the key. You'll pick up the letter at the Hotel Waltham sometime tomorrow. And we stick it out? Right. You put a man on the desk at the Waltham. Get your lab crew to set up a motion picture camera behind the desk, someplace out of sight. Right. 
I also want a camera set up in the depot to uh, get a film on him when he opens the locker. Well, that still isn't evidence. Just a man picking up two envelopes. Yeah, it's a link. There's more to the chain. Don't forget, he has to plant the gun for me in another locker. Have him followed. And we'll get shots of him carrying the package the gun is in. We can blow them up for close-ups later on. Then we can get shots of him making the plant in a railroad locker. Well, that's going to be a tough camera setup. There are a hundred lockers there. How are we going to make sure our camera's trained on the right one? By keeping 99 of them locked. <laughs> shots of Herb Collier, alias Harry Callum, making the money pickup. We tagged him all the way, but at the railroad depot, while we waited for him to turn up with a gun, we ran into trouble. Now boarding at gate three. There's the signal from the boys on the ramp. Camera's all ready. Now all we need is Collier to turn up. Oh, it won't be long. My men reported by phone. Collier left his house 20 minutes ago and picked up a package at a warehouse between his home and here. Good. Must be using the warehouse for storage. <laughs> Probably got a man there working for it. We've got the address. If, uh... Hey, there he is now. Where? Coming down the stairs by the clock. Oh. Tweed top coat. Yeah, yeah. Well, we better not stand here. You drift that way and I'll... Uh-oh. What's the matter? Woman going down the locker line there looking for a box. We've only got one open. She'll close it. Better stop her. No time. It'll look funny. But we... Uh, uh, give me a key. Give me a key to one of the boxes we locked. Yes. Yeah. Take your choice. What are you going to do? Open it for him. He doesn't know me. I'll pretend to take something out as he comes along. Oh, we've got to change our camera angle. Uh, get up to the ramp and tell your men. I'll give you time. Get going. The woman had placed a package in the one open locker as I came up to the box. Herb Collier wasn't ten feet away from me. I found the box that matched the number of the key I held, and I pretended to be having trouble with the lock. Collier walked slowly through the aisles, looking for a vacant locker. He passed behind me. You are uh, trying to get that box closed or open? Trying to open it. Key sticks a little. You want the box? Yeah. Lock's kind of stiff, I guess. I may need a little oil. I'll have it in a minute. Happy things is way empty. Yeah. That box open on the whole row. Well, you can have this one in a second. There. Yeah, there it is now. Help yourself. I thought you had something in there. It's empty. No, no. I just took this ring out and slipped it on my finger. Oh, I didn't notice. Well, it's clear for you now, anyhow. Just stick a dime in the slot, shove your package in, and, and lock it. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I think maybe I'll keep the package with me. You mean you don't want the locker? I changed my mind. Too bad, Collier, because I want to look at that package anyhow. Oh, me. Uh, keep your hands off. He dug inside his coat for a gun he was carrying, one that was loaded and ready for use. I caught his arm just in time, and a shot ricocheted off the marble floor and tore into the metal locker. The men we had planted in all parts of the station poured forces. By the time I wrestled him to the floor, they were on us, and Collier was handcuffed. Let me go! Let me go of you! All right, Collier, just take it easy, and you won't get hurt. Better have your boys keep those people away. Pete, Monahan, calm them down and keep them off. What kind of a frame up is this? It's no frame up. I say it is. I was passing through here, you opened the locker, and then you shoved a package in my hand and pulled a gun on me. That's fast thinking and a good story. Well, all right, well, it's up to you to break it. We can smash it wide open, Junior. We've got motion picture shots of you carrying that package, and when we open it, maybe we'll find your prints on the gun that's inside. That isn't all of the picture either, Collier. Yeah. We've got shots of you picking up a letter in the name of Harry Callan and taking money out of another locker. I don't know what you're talking about. All you got on me is scaring a concealed weapon. I didn't pull it until you jumped me. Don't be coy, Collier. There's a bigger rap than that. This is a federal case. It's, it's a state rap. If it was, I wouldn't be here. The police aren't taking you, Collier. I'm taking you on a government charge. Illegal sale of weapons. You can't prove it. I can try. Chief, put out a pickup for Marie Kinsey. What do you want Marie for? I want to take her to a movie. Private one. Starring you. She won't tell you nothing. Might. Women don't like prison, Collier. They don't like to age too quickly. We showed Marie the shots of Collier making the pickup, and she started to crack. We read her the law on the illegal sale of weapons, the law and the possible penalties. Just the fact. It was all she needed. I never touched the gun. It never went through my hand. You're an accessory, Miss Kinsey. 
didn't know what he was selling. That won't stand up. You knew what I was buying, and you made the same kind of a deal for a kid in a cell in there, Gene Shelby. Don't you realize that kid might have killed somebody? He just wanted to use the gun to scare people. And so did Billy Watkins, until he got in a tight spot and murdered the owner of a liquor store. Yeah, but even for that. I didn't know the Watkins kid. No, but he got his guns for the same store through Collier. Fat Burton told him how to buy it. And now Fats is in Europe sending more guns through, isn't he? I don't know. You may be able to make it easy on yourself, Marie. The government won't make any deals with you, but judges are inclined to look at all the evidence. Sometimes they're a little more friendly with people who tell the truth. All of it. <laughs> up started. More than 20 men in 20 key cities, men without conscience, putting murder merchandise in the hands of crazy kids, kids in hot rods, kids who thought that guns and whiskey and marijuana made them bigger than society. And when we got the sellers, we got the list of customers. Enough to make you sick. Enough to make the whole country sick. Oh, hello, Mr. Wellman. Ah, hello, Chief. Well, the last of the gang has been picked up in Miami. Yeah. It's all over but the trials now. What about Fat Burton? Under military arrest in Europe. The CID boys got him. Mm. Almost seven weeks for you. You must be knocked out. I am. <laughs> Understand the Billy Watkins case went to the jury today. Uh, it didn't take long. They're back. It's over. Murder in the second. He'll draw 20 to life. Mm. An 18-year-old kid. Yeah, well, maybe because of this, there'll be less of them from now on. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The smashing of the illegal weapons ring closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving heartless dealers in human contraband in a file case entitled Visas for Sale, another venture undertaken for our protection by the Silent Men. The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Joel Murcott and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Stan Waxman, Jerry Farber, Glenn Vernon, Gene Tatum, and Bill Yeagerman. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Douglas Fairbanks will shortly present Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Emlyn Williams in the motion picture, Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting adventures involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Now, here's a holiday wish from the NBC Chimes. Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Jr. in The Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men, 
transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. You may remember the story as it appeared in your newspaper. Two eminent weapons designers missing, the headline shouted. And under it, plans for new anti-tank guns taken out of secret file. You'll recall the rest of the story. It expressed the belief that the two men, Alan Duval and Henry Blackmore, had taken the weapons designed they had created and left the country. The implication that they may have sold out to the enemy was there, plain and ugly. The government got the story long before you did. And on a recent trip to Washington, I obtained the story from them. In it, I play the part of secret agent Ian McKay. It is the file case entitled... The gigantic hoax in which only the names and places are fictional. A few days after the plans for the anti-tank gun were reported missing, I was called into the Washington office. I found my chief in conference with an attractive brunette. Well, come in, Ian. This is Joval. This is Ian McKay. How do you do? Nobody believes me. They say sure, 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 but their eyes, their eyes are different. Uh, you mustn't excite yourself, Mrs. Joval. We'll try to help you. Oh, but I must get excited. My husband is perhaps dead, and he is accused of all of these terrible things against the government, and I am not to be excited. According to Mrs. Duval, the two men were lured on a ruse to Canada and from there kidnapped. Did I get that straight? Yes, and there's no trace of the man who was supposed to have called on the Duvals at their home. Supposed to have. You still don't believe me, do you? I tell you, I was there when they came. One man in a colonel's uniform, the other in a captain. Did anyone else see them come into your house, a friend or a neighbor? No, no, it was night time. He made me promise not to tell anyone he was being called to an arms conference in Europe. He didn't tell you where in Europe? No. But I can find him if you let me go. As an American citizen, Mrs. Duval, you can go anywhere you please. Excluding certain territories, of course. But it must be done now. I cannot wait for visas and papers. You feel sure you can find them? Mrs. Duval fought with the underground during the war, and she feels that they will help her. I was under the impression that the underground had gone underground. They will help me. I have friends there. They say he has sold his invention to a foreign power. He would rather die for... Uh, I'll tell you what, madam. Why don't you let us talk it over? When we reach some conclusion, I may get in touch with you. That is what they have all told me. The same words, the same tone of voice. Uh, we'll call you, you may be sure. Oh, yes. Yes, you will call me to tell me his body has been found. Good afternoon, gentlemen. <laughs> An intense little woman, isn't she? Yeah, a little too much so, I'm afraid. You must mean something by that. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's hard to put into words. It's um, it's like she shouts you down every time you have a rational question to ask. Yeah. What do you think about this kidnapping theory? Well, on paper, it doesn't look too good. Two men, Duval and Blackmore, invent a new high-speed anti-tank gun. They take it to the National Council of Inventors and are assigned to a munition plant by the Army to put the thing into production. They were both screened by security. Well, that doesn't mean too much sometimes. They complete the initial layout and take two weeks off to go on a fishing trip. Two weeks pass, three weeks, and they don't show up. The Army comes down on an inspection trip and the plans are gone, taken out of the secret file. Yeah, it doesn't look too good. The boys in the Pentagon are really screaming about this one. What do you want to start? Me? Is this my baby? <laughs> I'm afraid it is. And don't overlook the kidnapping angle entirely. It's possible, you know. Mm. And the two phony military men, the colonel and the captain, am I supposed to swallow that? No, but leave room for it. It could happen. Well, it's all yours, Ian. What do you want to start from? A corner drugstore with a handful of aspirin. <laughs> I flew to Montreal and from there took the train to Pointe du Bois a little fishing village in the Laurentians where Duval and Blackmore had said they were going fishing. The place was deserted except for an old caretaker who told me in grunts that nobody had been there yet this season. Back to Montreal I went. I got a room at a hotel and after a quick shower and change drove out to the airport. Duval and Blackmore had definitely gotten this far. I presented my credentials to the night supervisor. He was duly impressed but sloughed me off to the clerk in charge of tickets and registration. You Ed Jackson? Yeah? Your supervisor sent this note down to you. Let's see. Give him any information he wants. Say so you must be big stuff, huh? 
Uh, take a look at these two photographs. I'm looking for these men. Landed here on May 23rd. That's more than a month ago. No, sir, those pictures don't do a thing to me. They came in on the afternoon flight from Buffalo, New York. I thought maybe they took another flight out. Well, it's a tedious job, but why don't you look over the passenger list and all that going flights? You might find them there. Where do I start? Here in this book. <laughs> if a boy you silly, but then it's your job. Go ahead. Now, if I can avoid any distractions... Like my yakking all the time? Okay, okay. Wallow in your own gloom for all I care. I wallowed for two and a half hours and found nothing. I even tried to figure it out by the seating arrangements, figuring that the two of them were occupying adjoining seats. Here, I brought you some coffee. Oh, thanks. Any art? You're some kind of a cop, aren't you? Hmm. Some kind of one, yeah. What makes you think they flew at a Montreal? Well, it seemed logical till now. I'll have to try something else. Hey, if these guys were on the scram, why would they use their own name? I mean, it'd be nothing to buy a couple of tickets under phony names. And that opens up another field of speculation. If they were bound for Europe, I could concentrate on that section. Shouldn't be too hard to run down that list. And if something looks good to you, you can check with the Trans-Canada stewardess and that's right. My boy, you know what you've just done? Me? What? You've tied another knot in the binding friendship of the United States and Canada. I took the list of London-bound passengers for the week following May 23rd. That gave me 114 names to check. 67 of these were women and children. That left 47 possible suspects. In four days, I had checked on all but three passengers. These three men had given a Montreal hotel as their address. When I checked with the hotel, they told me they had no such guests. I went back to the airport and checked the list again. The three men whose identity I was looking for had all traveled to London on the same flight. Montreal to Gander, to Glasgow, to London. I waited till the same stewardess who had sparked the flight I was interested in came on duty. Well, hello. Are you the gentleman who's been waiting to see me? Yes, yes. I'm with the federal government of the United States. You carried three passengers on May 24th to London. According to your records, they occupied seats 17, 18, and 19. May the 24th? That's a long time ago. Here are two photographs of the men I'm looking for. They mean anything to you? Well, they sure do. Especially this one, Mr. LaFleur. You're positive? May the 24th, the national holiday in Canada. We were traveling very light. Six or seven passengers, that's all. I spent most of the trip with Mr. LaFleur. You know the way these things are. And this man? No, I'm not so sure of him. But I know the three of them were together. Nobody met them at the airport? Well, not that I know of. But you'll positively identify this one man as a passenger on your flight. But very positively. Well, oh, thanks. I guess that's all for now. Anytime I can help you. Anytime at all. Before I left, she gave me sketchy descriptions of the other two men. I went back to the clerk at the ticket counter, and he found a receipt for three tickets from Montreal to London, which had been picked up by a man named Lafleur. I had photostatic copies made of the receipt and mailed one of these in a general description of the man to counterintelligence in Ottawa. It was pretty meager information to try and run a make on, but everything's worth a try in this business. I flew back to Washington, and when the chief came into his office, I was waiting for him. Oh, hello, Ian. You back from the war so soon? No, just a little recess. You got something, McKay? Our two gunsmiths in company with another man took a flight out from Montreal to London. The names they used were Lafleur, Pelletier, and Jordan. Phony names, phony passports. Yeah. That doesn't do too much for the kidnapping theory, does it? Not unless the men honestly believed it was legitimate. They may have accepted the phony passports as merely being good security precautions. Uh, now what? A trip to Europe. Paris to start with. Then wherever this thing takes me. Why Paris? Well, that's where the passports indicated they were going. I'll contact Tim Anderson when I get there. All right. I'll have everything ready for you in a few hours. Oh, one more thing, Chief. Uh, fix it so Mrs. Duval can leave right away, will you? Well, I thought you didn't want her to She needs watching. And I'd like her around where I can keep an eye on her. Hmm. You don't think too much of her, do you? Well, just say that I'm cautiously impartial. I went back to Montreal and spent a couple of days trying to track down something on the man who called himself La Fleur. If he had engineered the deal with the phony passports and the rest of it, he was the man to know. 
I learned nothing by the time I was ready to make the big hop over the Atlantic. I got to the airport half an hour early. I stopped to see if the voluble little ticket clerk was still in good form. Well, look who's here. The cop with culture. You're beginning to haunt this place. Well, I won't be here long. Taking the next flight to Gander, Newfoundland. Then Glasgow, London, and Paris. Who says a policeman's lot is not a happy one? Huh. Hey, you want to know something? It's not the one about the two Frenchmen, is no, it? No, no, this is on the level. <laughs> it's about those guys you were looking for. Go on. Somebody else was in showing those pictures around. A woman? With a French accent. Brown hair, brown eyes. Yeah, I got a name, too. Said she was Mrs. Uh... Duval. Hey, how'd you know all this? I didn't. Just wishful thinking, I guess. The ride was uneventful, though a little bumpy over Newfoundland. Jim Anderson, one of our agents attached to the embassy in Paris, was waiting for me with a car when I landed at the airport there. I'd wired him from London to meet me. Hiya. Got a phone call from Washington. I think they got something on Mr. McClure. Good. Let's have it. I don't want to check the writing on the receipt with a Mr. Amo Edinger, who had had some trouble with him. I'm sure it's one of the same. Deported from Canada in 1947 for illegal entry. 47, eh? But they've got no record of him ever being back in Canada since then. Got anything on him over here? Yeah, plenty. Assuming that he is, Mr. Edinger... He was with the Maquis, the French underground during the war. Yeah. He was exposed as a collaborationist and left the country. That must have been his uh, Canadian episode. Anything current on him? A lot, including an address. Having his place watched now, he's been away for a while. When he gets back, we'll know it. Good. Now, well, take me there. No one there at all? No. What are you going to do? I'm going to show you how to open a lock and burglarize an apartment. Scientifically. Stand back. I'll need a little light. What are you doing? Not so hot. Wait a minute. I think I've got it. Yeah, that does it. Ah, nice place. The guy spent dough. Where do we start looking? Anywhere. I'll take the desk. You try the bookshelves. All right, now, now, tell me what I'm looking for, will you? Pieces of paper with writing on it, for one thing. I want to check with his signature on his airline receipt. Make sure he's the right man. Well, there's no doubt of that, is there? We'll double check. It's a book with his name on the fly sheet. I'm on Edinger. Let's see it. Good, 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 good. It checks. This guy's a fiend for snapshots, all neatly dated and cataloged here. Well, let's see some of the latest ones. Oh, well, they've been dated April 7th, 1951. That's not so long ago. Well, this one in front of the railway station. Wish he'd photographed the name of the building. What for? Well, if we get to a place he's been, he might be there again. Kind of forlorn hope, isn't it? You see anything unusual about this station? If we could find some way to identify it, we could... Oh, well, uh, how, how about the flowers in that window box? Not too many stations are prettied up like that. Well, that's something. And that uh, caragana bush right alongside of it. Yeah. About four feet high and two, three feet away from the corner of the building. Yeah, there's a gleam in your eye. Mm-hmm. It's an anticipation of the swell job you're going to do in the next couple of days. Oh. Uh, okay, get it over with. You're going to find me a little railway station in France that looks just like this. <laughs> I put up at the Swa Hotel and had begun a few inquiries of my own. I learned that Ettinger had only recently contacted a liaison man with the French Ministry of War with an offer to turn over something of military importance at a price. He had contacted two other foreign government officials with the same proposition. One of them had been definitely interested, I learned. We sat watch on this man, hoping Ettinger would show up. That night, I was getting ready for bed when there was a knock on the door. Coming. Uh, monsieur, pardon, I am sorry to disturb you, but this could not wait. You come in, Alfred. Has uh, Edinger showed up? No, no, monsieur. You, uh, had you tell me to watch the Madame Duval? <laughs> she is like the eel, monsieur. Ah. I am with her one minute, the next she is gone. But I have overcome this. I have locked her up in the gendarmerie. Well, what did she do? 
I see her talking to some men. I'm still looking at her, and she is gone. Voila. Then I go to see my partner. And we see a light coming from one of Ettinger's windows. We go up. It is she. She is searching the room. Well, she's no good to us in jail. Let's get her out of there, quick. Uh, oh, mais, 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 pa- pardon, monsieur. But what is it, Alfred? It is customary, even in Paris, when one goes out, one puts on his trousers, monsieur. <laughs> It was an angry Mrs. Duval who paced the floor of the visitor's room of the prison. She didn't even stop when she heard the door open and close behind me. Mrs. Duval? Oh, it is you. Can you get me out of this horrible place? Well, burglary is a criminal offense in any country. Oh, but I must get out. My husband, I cannot find him if I am in here. And what makes you think he's in France? Oh, I know he is. Get me out, please, monsieur. You haven't answered my question. How do you know he's in France? Well, I... I had not told you the whole truth in Washington. Try it now. This uh, captain who came to see my husband with the colonel, mm. well, I told you he was French, but I did not tell you that I knew the man. I saw him from a distance only, and it, it seemed impossible. But then, when all this happened, I knew it was at in jail. Armand Ettinger? Oui. During the war, I was with the Marquis, the French underground. He was, too, before he turned collaborator. Well, why didn't you tell us? Oh, I was afraid. Should they learn that you might find him, they would kill the two men and escape. And you thought you'd take them single-handed, eh? But I have many friends who would have helped me in their own way. Monsieur, please, you tell them to get me out of here. All right. I'll see what I can do. With many gestures and very little French, I managed to get Mrs. Duval released. When I got home, I found Tim waiting for me. I find your little railway station. Good, good. In Brittany, a little town called Le Matin. Ah. Only a dozen houses there and a, a church and a store. You, you'll find no arch criminals there. Eh? Well, you're probably right. But we're going to try. The Matin was a full day's journey out of Paris. We rented a rickety old Fiat and made all the necessary preparations for our trip. While the car was being greased, I called on Mrs. Duval. Better I should have stayed in jail. Then I would know I could do nothing to help. This way. What could you do, Mrs. Duval? I don't know, but I could be active. You don't know this Ettinger the way I do. Monsieur, I have the hope of finding him one place. If I tell you, you will let me come along? I can't expose you to the possible consequences. Oh, what about the consequences of a murdered husband? Can you leave me with that? Don't you understand? If I could find... Tell me where this place is. I'll not promise that. Le Matin. A little town in Britain. What do you know about Le Matin? Ettinger, he goes there often. He has friends in a chateau in the hills nearby. The met is now. And... Oh, I must stay helpless here in a hotel room. If you knew this last night, why did you break into Wettinger's room? I did not know this last night. They came this morning, these friends of mine. They told me about Le Matin. Will you go there, please? Yes. In about half an hour. And me. Me. I go with you. All right, Mrs. Duval. You go with <laughs> took everything that car had to get us to Le Matin early that evening. It was only nine o'clock and already the little village was bedded down for the night. We stopped in front of a small bakery shop. There's a light in the back of the store. Will you try there? Yes. Don't ask directly. Try and find out who's living in the chateau. I will. I understand. What do you make of her, Ian? I don't know. Three quarters of the time, I think she's on the level. The other quarter... Well, why'd you bring her along? Eh, thought I'd feel better knowing she was here with me. You have some reservations about her? Mm, I'm afraid so. I'll be tickled pink to be wrong, though. Kind of like to think that anybody who migrates to America gets to be an American. Quick. Mm, I know what you mean. Well... And Monsieur Pregon bought the chateau last year. He has a business in the city and only comes out here occasionally. Well, what about that, Monsieur? And she would not say for sure. Monsieur Pregon has much company. Does she know him? No. 
restaurant does not have anything to do with the village. Oh, here we are again. Nowhere. Well, uh, shall I try another place? The church, perhaps? The father, you might mean. No, no. Get in, Mrs. Duval. Where to? The Chateau Rigan. Mm, we're going to get in? Two lost Americans looking for shelter. What's the chateau to an American anyway? Oh, that is no good. You will be suspect immediately. Let me go in. Then you two come in later. You'll sit in the car and wait. Nothing more. Understand? Oh, all men, they are stupid. Some men, disastrously so. <laughs> Bumped along an old dirt road till we came to a huge set of wrought iron gates. It was the chateau. Well, how are we going to get in? Right in. Light shining, horn honking. Then they'll know for sure we're American. I would not do it that way, please. Yeah, we're in luck and the gate's open. When we pull up to the house, you get down in the back seat. And stay there until we come out or call you. Don't move. Ian, there were some men back there by the gate. A bunch of them. The Mackey? What did you say? Uh, nothing. I don't like this. Look, Ian, we better go back. We can't turn back now. There's the house. It's a little too quiet to suit me. Oh, come on, come on. Let's let's try the door. Huh? You stay there, Mrs. Duval. Don't move. Duval, she's running out on us. Mrs. Duval, come back here. Shall I go after her? No. No, she's out fucked. Well, here goes. No answer. There's a light burning upstairs. There's something screwy here. Try the door. Use a few light bulbs in this hallway. Shall we go any further? Yes, let's. No, gentlemen. Let's not. What? The... Stay where you are, gentlemen. Tell your friend that I have a gun in your back. Tell him? Well, seems like he has, Tim. Now, put your hands well over your head. Let's try. What? Only one gun, Mr. McKay. I am afraid I do not know your friend's name. There. That removes the sting, gentlemen. Now, if you'll just move ahead of me, we'll go someplace where we can talk. This way, please. This is an occasion, gentlemen. We'll use the baronial library. Sit down, please. Facing me over there. That's better. Now. If you'll both place your hands on that table and keep them there. Comfortable, Mr. Mickey? You have the advantage over me. I don't know your name. Come, come. How unsubtle. Of course I am on that You would not have come here if you had not known what I looked like. You were expecting us? I was rather hoping that you would not find your way here, gentlemen. But I'm quite prepared. As you have no doubt noted. We're looking for two American citizens, Henry Blackmore and Alan Duval. A very pretty speech. Almost calls for a fanfare. Nevertheless, Mr. Ettinger, we are... They are here. Your two American friends. In this house? Alive. And in this house. And it's quite up to you whether they leave this house in the same condition. The man has a prepared speech. Why doesn't he make it? You have a point there, Tim. I forgot how direct you Americans are. Very well. I shall state my case. The two gentlemen have with them a set of blueprints which only they can explain satisfactorily. It seems they have committed some intricate details to memory. And they refuse to remember. Good for them. On the contrary, our patience is at an end. We were quite determined to put an end to this whole thing till you came along. Now, where do we come in? I have a feeling that Mr. Duval might be impressed if you ask him to divulge the necessary information, I'm sure that you can impress upon him... I don't get it, Ian. This, this Duval, the, the way we were crossed by... Quiet. What was that? Nothing. Go ahead. 
We have gone to much trouble arranging for them to be here. And expense. A great deal of expense. Well? Persuade him to talk, and you all live. Don't, and you all die. The four of you. Um. Well, give me some time to think it over. I'm a red knot. My associates should be here any moment. They are determined that events shall happen quickly tonight. I might almost say immediately. One burning question. How did you know my name and the fact that I was here? Come, come, Mr. American. You don't seriously think I would answer that. Suffice it to say, we have avenues of information. Well, gentlemen, there come my friends. Your answer, please. That does not sound like him. Something has happened. Son of key. Stay back. He's here, Mrs. Duval. Alive. Stay back, I say. Don't come closer or I will kill you. Mrs. Duval, stop him. Mrs. Duval, why did you... I could not stop him, monsieur. They are the Marquis. The crime for which he has paid was not committed against the United States or my husband, but against France over six years ago. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. You saw the first headlines in the paper. The one that said, Two eminent arms designers missing. And after this report is filed, you will read these headlines. Missing weapon designers rescued. And in smaller type, Heroic woman aids federal agents in capture. Then the story will go on to give as many details as the department thinks is advisable. And so closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we'll tell you a story involving espionage and murder in the file case entitled The Enemy, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Lewis and Russoff and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Conrad, Lamont Johnson, Ted Osborne, and Charles Davis. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Douglas Fairbanks is currently presenting Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Emlyn Williams in the motion picture Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. You are tuned to your favorite station of the NBC radio network, where you'll always find the very finest radio entertainment. Day and night, every day of the year, during every waking hour, NBC presents music, drama, comedy, mystery, sports, the latest news and programs of public service. You have made this your favorite NBC station because of the wide variety of great programs always available at the turn of the dial. We at NBC will continue to send you the finest radio entertainment and furnish you with the most up-to-date news from all of the news centers of the world. NBC, the national broadcasting company, is now in its second quarter century of broadcasting in the public service. Always tune where you hear the familiar NBC chimes. They're your invitation to fine radio entertainment. Fairbanks, Jr. in The Silent Men.
The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men. Transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. Many people assume that the special agents of our federal government are concerned only with foreign intrigue, espionage, or international problems. But this is not the case. For every citizen of this country, regardless of age or nationality, is under the constant protection and surveillance of the silent men. And the same skill and persistence that is used in guarding the security of our nation is also used in dealing with some of the trials and disturbances of Mr. and Mrs. Average American. This is such a story. A case involving simply people. In it, I play the part of Special Agent Alec Brown, from whose departmental chief in Washington I obtained the facts. The file case entitled The Big Kill, in which only the names and places are fictional. I'd been transferred from CAA headquarters in Washington to the district office in New York. A new office meant a new routine, and I was familiarizing myself with it by working evenings. An office is a lonely place at night, and when the phone at my side shattered the stillness with its sharp cry, I was startled out of my wits. Hello? Is this the Civil Aeronautics Bureau? Yes. Who do you want to speak to? Someone in charge. Quick, please, hurry. What is it? Maybe I can help you. A bomb in the plane, Chicago. A what? Isn't there anyone there who can understand me? I tell you, the Chicago bomb plane... One minute, please. Give me your name, please. What does my name matter? You have no time. The passengers... I must have your name. No. What flight to Chicago? 755. 755? Yes, I couldn't call till now. My husband... Lady, it's five after eight now. You phoned just ten minutes too late. <gasps> oh, no. No! Oh! In my line of work, I get a lot of crank telephone calls, but I couldn't take chances on this one. I called the control tower at the airport immediately. Brown at CAA. You have 755 flight to Chicago? Yes, sir, but... Contact the pilot immediately. Have him make an emergency landing at once. Unload the passengers and let no one in or near the plane till I get there. I'll stand by. I've been trying to tell you, sir, the Chicago plane hasn't taken off. Oh. The uh, fog settled suddenly on the airfield and we're waiting till it lifts. Where is she now? Uh, the far end of the strip. And... Well, leave her there. Warn all personnel to keep clear. I'll be there as soon as I can. But what is it? The... Well, I don't understand... Do as I tell you. <laughs> From police headquarters. By radio, they contacted Lieutenant Pearson and a driver in my neighborhood, and in less than five minutes, I was in the back seat of a car racing to the airport. What time you got, Lieutenant? 8.20. Step on a driver. He's doing 80 now. There's the lights of the field. If there's anything I can't stand as bombs, even thinking about them gives me the goose flesh, and me off duty 20 minutes ago. There she is. You can stop here. You stay here, Lieutenant. I'll call you if everything's okay. That makes me plenty happy. I don't mind. There's been a bomb, all right. And a big one. When the earth stopped tossing me around, I looked up at the burning DC-4. People were pouring out of the main building, and I saw a truck with a fire crew headed for the plane. I picked myself up to my feet... Come on. You hurt, Alec? You hurt bad? Oh, I was just shaken up. Lucky I didn't get any closer. Oh, I tell you, I nearly died when I heard it. I ain't afraid of nothing in this big, wide world like a bomb blast. And I thought she was another crank. <laughs> All right, folks. You'll have to step back. Lieutenant, I don't want anyone near but the fireman near this plane. You heard the man. All right, now step back. Right back. Go on. Get back. Get back. Fire boys did their best, but it wasn't good enough. The charred ghost of the airliner lay there on the ground. If she had taken off on time, 30 human bodies would have been added to the awful sight. Being in this branch of the service for seven years taught me where to look for evidence. Lieutenant Pearson, help me. What are we looking for? Oh, anything. Bomb fragments, maybe? See these bent ribs here? Uh huh. That's the spot that got it first. Sure made a mess of this luggage. Yeah, what there is left of it. What's that you got in your hand? 
A piece of sharp metal I picked up. Here, put it in his handkerchief. It's a bomb fragment. If you see any more, don't handle it. Prince. If I'd have known it was from the bomb, I wouldn't have touched it with a ten-foot pole. Here's a real find. A piece of leather with a fragment embedded in it. Could just be it. Be what? A suitcase the bomb came in. Passengers still waiting? Yeah. They're celebrating the miracle that let them go on living. I'm afraid one of them is going to stop celebrating. Let's go. I want to have a talk with him. You think the, the bomb was in one of the passenger suitcases? I'm sure now. But it don't make sense. Why would a guy put a bomb in his own luggage if he knew it was going to blow him the kingdom come? I don't know. Maybe insurance. Just ship his luggage, and when the plane goes, he's registered as dead. Stranger things have happened. Mm, never thought of that angle. Who's in charge of this investigation? Both of us. Why? My name is Stephen Bradley. So? I want to go back to my hotel. I'm badly shaken up. You have no right to hold us here. I have a lot of right to find out who tried to murder 30 people. Then it was murder. I knew it. You have a copy of the passenger list, Lieutenant? Yeah, have one. All right, folks. We'll call you up one by one. See if you can identify this piece of yellow pigskin leather. If you think it was your luggage, please say so. We'll begin with you, Mr. Um, Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Stephen Bradley. Okay. Is this your luggage? Look anything like it? No, that wasn't mine. All right. Next one, please. Come on, folks. We ain't got all night. Get moving. Come on. Thirty people lined up to look at the piece of yellow leather. Not one of them claimed it. The lieutenant checked their addresses and gave them the routine spiel about being available for questioning and then let them go home. Well, that's that. I guess there ain't much more we can do tonight. Uh, my time says ten past nine. That's right. Less than an hour ago, 30 people would have died. Up there somewhere. Ah, it's not me for a loop. Why don't you phone your report in and take off? No. Mm. Uh, what about you? Oh, I have a little more routine checking to do in the baggage department. If anything turns up, I can call you. The baggage man was reading a ten-cent comic book. He put it down reluctantly as I approached. What can I do for you? You handle all the luggage? Six to one o'clock. Why? Would you remember if you handled a piece of luggage made out of yellow pigskin? Hey, you must be the fella looking at that bombing. You know, I got my own ideas how it happened. It's them communists. We'll get to the international situation in a while. Right now, see if you can remember handling a yellow bag. Handle maybe four or five hundred bags a night, not being paid enough for that. Now I got to start memorizing things. This coarse grain on the leather makes me think it was a Gladstone. By golly, now you come to say it? Hey, I do remember seeing one. Yeah, a yellow one. Yep. Right here on this rack tonight. And what's more, I know how it got there. A messenger brought it. You sure? I'm positive. Oh, wait, now, I'll, I'll find you the slip. Yeah, here it is. Minerva Messenger. Let's see that. Hey! Delivered to airport terminal, one pigskin Gladstone bag. Look here. Delivered to baggage room for Stephen Bradley, flight 36. Stephen Bradley. Bradley, yeah, that's the guy. You better go get him, mister. <laughs> I phoned Bradley at his hotel. He hadn't checked in yet. Then I called Lieutenant Pearson. There was no real welcome in his voice. Mm, uh, glad you called, Alec. What's up? I found out who owns that suitcase. Good. I'll pick him up. Not so fast. It's Stephen Bradley. And he's not in his hotel. I'll get him all right. So that's who did it. The way he strutted around there, you think he owned the airport. Well, let's not convict him yet. Find him first and prove it. That's the way it's done, you know. Save them book rules for somebody else. Where will you be? I'm going to visit a 24-hour messenger service, the Minerva Company. Ever heard of it? No. You will. Three or four souped-up motorcycles rested on the wall of the Minerva messenger service, and inside the enthusiasts who drive them were playing cards. Yeah, there goes our card game. What's it, mister? I'm looking for a messenger who delivered a yellow pigskin suitcase to the airport early this evening. Know anything about it? Yeah, nothing much, except I'm a guy who took it. Yellow pigskin, Gladstone bag. Bill to Stephen Bradley? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the name, yeah. Where'd you pick it up? I always had screwy deal this evening. Boss finds an envelope in a mail slot, got two bucks in it, and a key will lock at the Arlington bus depot. Instructions to pick up a suitcase about 6.30 and take it to the airport. Arlington bus depot. Yeah, no, look, if you'll excuse me, I was kind of having a lucky streak when you came in. Well, here's the half a buck I kept you from winning. Ah, oh, thanks, thanks. Oh, that guy's all right. The 
fact that Bradley hadn't brought the suitcase to the airport himself led to some interesting speculation. And I'd learned long ago in this business that the obvious is something you've got to regard with suspicion. It was about a quarter to ten when I got to the bus depot. The usual weary-looking travelers sat around nodding their heads. The lady who'd started this evening off for me had phoned from here. There was no doubt of that. Especially after I learned that the yellow bag had been picked up at the same depot. Near a row of unboothed telephones, there was a magazine and candy stand. I waited till the girl behind the counter got rid of some of her customers. Yes, sir. Something to you? Any other pay phones than these over here? No. Then you make change for most of them, do you? Yeah, it drives me nuts. I got a loose sale to make change, and I work on commission. Wouldn't that kill you? The person on your job gets to be pretty observant, don't you? Mm, you're telling me. Say, my boss don't like me talking to fellows during working hours. Well, maybe he'll forgive you in this case. I'm a special agent, federal government. Go on, you're kidding. Well, you sure don't look like one. <laughs> no square cut jaw, steely gray eyes. <laughs> look, miss, this is serious. Very serious. I get you, mister. A little after 8 o'clock tonight, a girl phoned me from this bus depot. She'd been crying. I thought maybe you'd noticed her. Mm, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Know what she looked like? No. I'd say she was between 30 and 35. Kind of a sexy voice. She said mm. she'd had to hang up. Her bus was leaving. That would have been about um, five minutes past eight. That's a Jersey special. And I think I got the girl for you. Go on. Well, she came in about 7.30. I noticed how nervous she was. And then she came up to me and asked if anyone had left a message with me for um, Mrs. Cullen or, or Coran, anyway, some name like that. Her eyes were red, like she'd been crying, so I watched it. You saw her make the call? Right at the first phone. Did you... No, I couldn't hear what she said. But her shoulders were shaking like she was bawling. Mrs. Coran or Coran? Uh-huh. What does she look like? Well, oh, like I wish I looked. Dark hair, about five feet four. Beautiful figure. Are you writing that down? Yeah. Oh. Just a minute. Boy, am I done. Before she left, she gave me a note to give to anyone who might ask for her. It said Hal. Hal? Yeah. Oh, she didn't feel it or nothing, so I... I know, I know. And this Hal came and got the note? No, I still got it. Here it is. Hal, please come home. What do you make of it? Jersey bus leaves at 8.05. I saw it go through the Jersey gate. Make any sense to you? Yeah, a lot. You know what? What? If you ever need a job, there's one waiting for you. In Washington. The girl had left the trail easy enough for a tenderfoot boy scout to follow. The phone book told me there was a Hal Coran living on 96th Street in Jersey City. Caution should have warned me that it was a little too pat, too easy. The way things looked at this point, I'd have a case for or against Bradley by morning. In less than two and a half hours after the woman had called to tell me about the bomb, I was standing in front of the door to her apartment. At first, I thought there was no one home. Then I heard some movement behind the door. Is that you, Hal? No. Please open the door. Who is it? The man you called on the phone early this evening. Well, I don't know you. What? Well, I'd know you, Mrs. Coran. Your voice. It's very distinctive. I've heard it only once before, but I'd know it ten years from now. You heard my voice. I think you're mistaken. You spoke to me on the telephone at my office this evening. Me? I think you'd better go. Mrs. Coran, you phoned me this evening from the Arlington bus depot to warn me that a bomb would explode in a Chicago-bound plane. Oh, no, I didn't. I made a recording of the conversation. As I said, Mrs. Coran, you have a very distinctive voice. What? You're mistaken. I see. You didn't leave the apartment? No. Hmm. I have a note here for your husband, Hal. Oh. That is your husband's name? Yes. You gave it to a girl in the bus depot. Is this your writing? Maybe you can see now how useless it is to... Yes. Yes, I gave it to her. And you phoned me at the Civil Aeronautics Authority? Oh, I tried to stop it. I begged Hal not to do it. But he was like a crazy man. Better give me a description of him. We've got to pick him up. It's no use. You won't find me. Why not? He said he was going to take his own life. I got his description and phoned it into police headquarters. From them, I learned that Bradley had not yet been located. 
All the while I'd been on the phone, Mrs. Coran sat there crying softly. And, Sergeant, if you get anything, you can phone me at, um... What's the number here, Mrs. Coran? Exeter 1074. Exeter 1074. Yeah, okay. Thanks. He's dead. And it's my fault. It was the quarrel. It started off like any other quarrel. Husband and wife disagreeing. Would you like to tell me about it? I suppose I'll have to sooner or later. My husband and Stephen Bradley started the union machine shop together. They were equal partners to begin with. They did exceptionally well, I understand. No, not at first. Then, then Hal did something. He used some of the company's funds. He gambled with it. When Bradley found out he wanted the money put back at once or he would prosecute, well, Hal couldn't raise that much. Bradley took over Hal's half of the business instead. And then? He lost all of his initiative. He became a laborer in the business he'd created. Bradley used him for all he could. We quarreled about it. You always refer to him in the past tense. He's dead. I feel it. Then we learned that Bradley had sold out to an eastern combine for $150,000. Bradley hadn't said anything until the deal was completed. And that night, Hal came home from work. I'd never seen him look that old. Claire? Oh, just a minute. I'll put the fire into the soup. Hi, honey. Hmm. Well, how come you brought all your things home from the office? Let's not talk about it now. I'm dead. Hal, something's wrong. Oh, not now, will you? After supper, please. It's always not now with you, isn't it? Come on, tell me, Hal. All right, all right. I lost my job. I'm out of work. Can. Lost your job? Yeah, I'll get another one. Well, why did Bradley fire you? Wasn't Bradley. Uh, new people took over this morning. Hell, what new people? Why is it you never start at the beginning? What new people? Well, Bradley sold a the business. They didn't want me, so I'm through. But that business is half yours. You helped build it up. Oh, look, we've been through this before. How can you let things like this happen to you without a fight? What kind of a man are you? What was I supposed to do? Hit Bradley over the head? Oh, no, that takes nerve. Dirty, rotten, double D. And he didn't say anything to you? Well, well, he came up to me after it was all over and said goodbye. He's going to the coast to live. Going tomorrow night. And you just stood there and said, good luck, Steve. Oh, hell, this is the last straw. I can't go on living with a man who won't fight back, a spineless incompetent... That's enough of that. Am I supposed to do? Kill him? Yeah. Maybe that's what you want me to do. Kill him. You weak me jellyfish. Go on, let him step on him. Coward. All right, all right, I'll show you. That's the last time you're going to call me that. What are you going to do? What you want. Kill him. Kill Steve Bradley. Who said anything about killing? Just go up to him and demand what's coming to you. Half of that money is yours. Ah, you know how far that's going to go. Oh, hell, please talk sense. I'm talking it for the first time in my life. See you later. Hell, come back. Hell! <laughs> Early this morning. The bomb? Hal put it in a suitcase and made me go with him and put it in a locker. Then he drove me to the messenger place and I dropped the envelope there with the key in it. He had a gun with him and said he would kill me. But why a bomb? Why jeopardize the lives of 30 passengers? I don't know. It was like a man who's lost his mind. He, uh, he made me wait at the bus depot till I picked the suitcase up. Then he came up to me and said goodbye. He said he would kill himself after he was sure the bomb had gone off. Oh, oh. maybe. Hello? Alec Brown still there? Yes, just a minute. For you, Mr. Brown. Brown? Yeah. Find Bradley or Coran? No. I thought maybe you'd leave me up there. No, I don't think so. Concentrate on Coran. He's got a gun, and when he finds out Bradley wasn't killed, he'll go after him. He's the man we want now. All right. We'll keep at it. Bradley wasn't killed? But the bomb... The plane was grounded on account of fog. None of the passengers were aboard. Fog? Then nobody was killed. Oh! What is it? That fog saved the lives I of... I But how? He killed 
sold himself for nothing. Oh, poor Hal, even this one final gesture couldn't come off right for him. I'm not so sure he's dead, Mrs. Coran. He may have been at the airport when the bomb went off. He may be looking for Bradley now, with the gun. No, he's dead, I tell you. I tell you, he killed himself. <laughs> woman was in a state of semi-hysteria, and I was only too glad to bring her some sedative pills she kept in her medicine chest. She took two of them and fell back exhausted on the couch. I phoned headquarters. Still no news of either Bradley or Coran. It was near midnight, and I was getting a little drowsy myself, when I heard someone turning the doorknob. He stood in the doorway a moment, an old, old man in his thirties. His shoulders sagged, and there was a look of utter dejection about him. He blinked stupidly at me. Then he walked over to the woman on the couch. What's the matter with her? Claire? Are you Hal Coran? I got to talk to her. Claire, mm. could... Claire, wake up. And... What? What do you want? Me, Hal. Open your eyes. Hal, you didn't... I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't go through with it. He... He couldn't do it. They didn't have the nerve. <laughs> What's the matter with her? I told you to let her be. She's upset, hysterical. Oh, the poor kid. It's all my doing. Look, Claire, baby. Get away from me. Don't touch me. I hate you. You've never done anything right, have you? Never. I'm arresting you, Mr. Coran. Me? What for? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? What are you talking about? He doesn't know. Do you? About the bomb. The bomb you put in Bradley's suitcase. Oh, that's what I've been trying to tell her. I, I couldn't go through with it. I, you know, thinking about all those people, the women and kids. And... It's no fault of yours that they're alive at this moment. If the plane hadn't been held up on account of fog... I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I just couldn't go through with it. I understand I was going to, but I, Claire says I got no guts. I'll have to take you in. You're under arrest. Uh, are you a cop? Yeah. Then listen to me. Look, this this is the way it was. I, I took the suitcase to the depot. I left it in the locker. I came back later, and I took the bomb out. Now, look, I'm telling oh, you the truth. Oh, hell, I, I won't do you any good. Haven't you even got the strength to admit what you've look, done? I, look, I brought it home. See, I disconnected the fuse. I put it in this, this drawer right over here. Come on, I'll show you. It's right in here. Well. <laughs> uh, 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 no, I was here. I put it here myself. I... Oh, it's funny. Honest is funny. The man, he makes a thing. I'm going to phone the police to come for you, Mr. Coran. Put the phone down. Give me that gun. I mean it. I took the bomb out of the suitcase and somebody put it back there. All right, Hal. <laughs> What's this? Well, will doing? you listen? Somebody put that bomb back there. How long do you think you'll last? Long enough. Don't you try to follow me. <laughs> I phoned the police and asked them to stake out the neighborhood. Then I went out after him. I figured he'd be hiding someplace close by. I felt uneasy about leaving Mrs. Coran alone in the apartment, so after about 15 minutes, I went back. I heard some movement behind her door. I was sure Coran had come back, and I wanted to get in quietly so I could get him from behind. Someone was standing close to Mrs. Coran, but it wasn't her husband. It was Bradley. Stephen Bradley. Bradley? That, well, that old man who's looking for Hal. Oh. Find him yet? No. Where have you been, Bradley? Police have been looking for you. He knew it was Hal who put that bomb in his suitcase. Didn't you, Steve? Uh, yes, I wanted to square it my own way. He's gone out of his mind. They've got to find him. I've got no pity for him. No feeling. Any man who could do a thing like that. Well, I tried to stop it. I tried to... That gun, Coran. Jet, you get back too. I'll shoot you in a minute. I'll step back with the others. Here. You're fooling with the federal government. Oh, my gun don't know the difference. That's better. No oh, gun, Mister Federal. How about you, Bradley? Huh? Oh yeah, Bradley's got one. Can we give it to me? Thank you. Oh, hell, darling, now put it down. Now, what's on your mind, Coran? 
Look, uh, maybe we can talk this whole thing over. Huh? You're making things worse for yourself, Coran. Hal, honey, I, I love you, Hal. It came to me all of a sudden. A lot of little things that meant nothing until I started putting them together. Today I got the total. Add it up. You see, Mr. Government, I did take the bomb out, but somebody put it back. He's like lying. I he never came back to the house all day. I, I asked myself who put it back, and the answer was so simple. <laughs> the laugh. <laughs> Claire. She put it back. We can have this whole thing out in the proper place, Coran. Right now, I'd suggest... Stay there, please. Anybody tries to stop me now gets killed, believe me. Why bring Claire into this hell? Why don't you be man enough it's Just to... what I asked myself. Why would Claire... There's nobody going to stop him. Hal, what are you doing to me? And that hit me. See, Claire had been working me up on Bradley, not because he was running out on me, but on her. He's crazy, officer. I'm remembering crazy little things, like little trips Bradley had sent me on that didn't make sense, things like that. Then... When I told her Bradley was leaving tonight, she went wild. The police will be here soon. It'll go better for you if I tell them you submitted of your own free will. Because Bradley was running out on her. She was the one who wanted them dead. And when I took the bomb out, she put it back. But I didn't know it. See, I just knew that I had no reason to go on living. So I said goodbye to her and I told her I'd kill myself. Oh, Steve, don't believe it. See the way that is up to me, government? No. If you can it... prove that in court, Hal, you'll be in good shape. Give me that gun. Oh, no, no. I can't wait for the court to settle my account. Just got the total tonight. <laughs> I gotta pay off. Steve, he's gonna kill you. Graham, look, you you're not yourself. But what do you want? Money? I'll give you lots of money. Hal, lots of Hal, Bradley will make it right with you. He will. Uh, tonight I got the picture. See Bradley, Claire, and Hal. Claire, Bradley, Hal. Hal always laughs. It's see? not true. So I figured it's no use running through the streets when I left here. I knew they'd find me. I got to the fire escape on the next building and Open up in there. Now, which room I could see from that fire escape, Claire? This one right here. Hell! Yeah. You saw. Oh, honest, Hal, he didn't mean anything. Hell, he did You want Yes, but he's got his corner. Don't take any chances. Right, shut up there. I saw Bradley come in. I saw you rush up to him. I saw that look on your face, the same look I used to see when we were first married. Alex, you okay? Wait. You'd taken it away from me, and you'd given it to Bradley, see? I made it a clean sweep for him. My business, my job, my wife. Hell. Hal, I'll make it right. Just give me a chance. Ah, oh, you don't owe me anything. It's clear. If she's taken from me, there's only one way to square. Me? Oh, Hal. You're going to kill me. Yeah. You love me, Hal. Don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I love you. <laughs> Goodbye, Claire. Oh. Come on. Claire. Claire. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. This closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving a missing boatload of plasma in the file case entitled Blood Money, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Lewis and Russoff and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Lorene Tuttle, Lamont Johnson, Harry Lang, Paul Freeze, Betty Moran, and Jack Carroll. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Douglas Fairbanks is currently presenting Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Emlyn Williams in the motion picture Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Now it's adventure with the Texas Rangers and Joel McRae on NBC. Fairbanks, Jr. in The Silent Men.
Capital Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men. Transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. They've been spilling blood on the frozen hills of Korea. The stretchers were stained with it. The foxholes were wet. The eyes of the wounded hopefully searched the sky for the helicopters that were to bring in the blood. Whole blood. Plasma. Your blood for theirs. I don't think you can know what it's like to be waiting for blood until you've seen the faces of the men who wait. The boys who may have died without it. The top... ...low on the totem pole of humanity. And there was a gang vicious enough to do just that. One of our agencies assigned a top undercover agent to get to the root of this evil. In tonight's story... I will assume his identity. Special Agent Mark Wagner. File case entitled, Blood Money. In which only the names and places are fictional. Oh, it's good to get back home after you've finished a long job. I just completed an assignment that had taken me halfway around the world. Now I was in a plane landing at National Airport in Washington, D.C. As I walked down the ramp, mentally figuring how I'd use my time off and luxuriating in the thought of a hot bath, I saw the chief himself had come down to meet me. Mark. Well, an official welcome. I didn't know I was that important. You <laughs> Yeah, about six months, I'd say. Come on, over here. Blaine waiting to take you to New Orleans. Hey, wait a minute. What for? I just got in. I haven't even got a clean shirt. I need to shave. I'm sorry to do this to you, Mark, but we don't have any time to waste. Ah, life and death, eh? That's <laughs> right. Isn't it always... What is it this time? Somebody siphon off Lake Pontchartrain? No, Mark. Blood. Huh? Plasma. A warehouse full of plasma earmarked for Korea. Stolen, hijacked. Well, what's the dope? Well, it happened before, but only in small amounts. We blamed it on mishandling. But a warehouse full of plasma, that isn't any accident. Warehouse? Where? The big blood processing plant in Indianapolis. It was very daring. You know how they process blood into plasma, a big batch of it at a time? Yes. Well, the shipment was ready, processed, packed, ready to be picked up, but still officially the property of the Defense Department. The plant had it ready to turn over to the military. Now, before schedule, army trucks pulled up, presented credentials, and drove off with it. And the credentials were phony, huh? Yeah. yeah. We found the trucks abandoned on a country lane outside of Indianapolis. No clues, nothing. No trace of anybody connected with it. We put Joe Chapman on the case. Been on it for weeks. No luck. Now he turns up this lead. Joe, eh? Well, we were in the Navy together, you know. That's why it had to be you. You're the only man available who can recognize Joe on sight. He, uh, thinks he's on to the big man. In New Orleans, eh? Good. Oh, it'll be great to work with Joe again, anyway. No, uh, you don't work with him, Mark. You replace him. He's hot? He's afraid so. He thinks they're on to him. Now, you've got to get right down there and replace him immediately. It's urgent to get on the case before the trail gets cold. Well, where will I find Joe? Well, we can't afford to arrange a rendezvous for you. It's too risky. If Joe's hot, they'll spot you, too. Well, you'll have to devise some way to contact him. Where? On the New Orleans waterfront, in and around the Cafe Mamba. All right, here's your plane. Okay. Sorry about the vacation, I promised you, Mark. Oh, forget it. Landed at Marrera Field in New Orleans, checked my bag at the airport, and took a cab to Bourbon Street in the French Quarter. From there, I walked to the waterfront. It was dark. The air was humid and heavy. And I saw the uncertain neon of the Mamba Cafe, a back alley bar that clung like fungus to a flop house. Just as dismal on the inside as on the outside. There weren't more than half a dozen people in the place. I scanned their faces quickly as I sauntered to the bar. Bartenders, a man at the piano who looked more like an acrobat than a musician, a few customers, obviously seamen or stevedores, and, and a girl with red hair and sad eyes. But no sign of Joe. I ordered a beer and took it to a table in the corner where I could watch the door if he came in. Are you waiting for somebody? No. You don't want to drink alone. Uh, sorry. I've got all I can do to pay for a beer. You're cute. I'm broke. Flat. Busted. Don't you understand? Go pick yourself another target. <laughs> I am here. 
Yeah, what's wrong with this place? Looks pretty good to me. Oh, you tiny kid. This joint ain't your type. Come on, have a drink on me. No, thanks. I only take it around when I can buy one back. I'm not trading, sweetie. I'm buying. Charlie, two beers. Two beers. No kidding. What's a fella like you doing in a rat trap like this? What do you mean, fella like me? Are you on a bomb? Is that a job? You on top? Why? Like I said, you're cute. Yeah. Yeah, I like to know in case you see the fella again. Well, hold your fire, sweetheart. All I can afford is a small beer. For once. <laughs> see you around. <laughs> I walked away from the girl and out into the street. I was still in front of the saloon when I spotted Joe. He was across the street, dressed as a seaman. Although he didn't give any sign of recognition, I knew that he had seen me. He stopped to light a cigarette, and I walked away along the dark wharf to the shadows of a warehouse, where I waited. In a while, I began to pick Joe up, coming towards me from one dim light to another. I picked up something else, too. A man, following him about half a block behind. Joe was almost to me. I didn't know if he knew he was being followed or not. I was afraid he'd speak to me, and yet I'd had to talk to him. So I did the only thing I could. I jumped him. You're being tailed. Oh, I shook him. I'm taking over. Look out for a key man. Big, bald, turtleneck sweater. Where's the plasma? I think he's not afraid of Bruno. Sales tonight. I'm signed on as a seaman. Jump ship. I'll get the first. I'm going to knock you out. Okay. Make it look good. him on the shoulder. He fell as though he were out. I rolled him, took his money and his watch, his papers, stuffed them into my pocket. I did it slowly, methodically, as I listened to the footsteps approach. The footsteps of the man who had been tailing Joe. As he came into the light, I looked up, guiltily. Looked into the face of a big, bald man wearing a turtleneck sweater. You can get in trouble that way. Yeah? You gonna make it? Well, I ought to report you. You're going to? Why did you pick on him to rob? Because he's a seaman and he's got papers. You took his money, too. i got to get out of the country if it's any of your business. Don't fight me, friend. I can help you. Yeah? Why? Why? Maybe I just like to help people. Maybe it's because I had no use for the guy you rolled. Come on. I'll buy you a drink. Cafe Mamba. Ever been there? Nice seen it. Go on, have another. Now, look, I'm not going to hang around here all night. i got to get out of the country. Relax. I told you I'd fix it up for you, and I will. The Bruno's sailing at midnight. Got a connection. I'll talk to him. Go ahead. Or anything you want. Charlie, give him anything he wants. Look, I don't want anything. Why don't I come with you? You'll stay here. I won't be there. I watched the big, bald man as he walked to the door. I'd made the contact. It had been easy. But that's what bothered me. It had been too easy. He stopped for a second on his way out and spoke to the muscular man at the piano, then to the girl, the girl who'd wanted to buy me a drink earlier. I wanted to follow the big man, but I had a feeling I wouldn't get past the piano. In a moment, the girl sat down beside me. Well, you're getting to be a regular customer. Still buying you and drinks? Hey, who's the guy with the bald head? He said he was a friend of yours. Wants me to keep you company. Be careful, we're being watched. Huh? The man at the piano. He wasn't hired because he can play Swanee River. Illuminating, but I'm not interested. Interested in getting out of here alive? Mm, very much so. Well, then, make friend Scotch. Hey, bartender! Scotch for the lady. What's the matter? You too good to drink with me? Make that two. It's better. Okay, now tell me. Why are you concerned about me? I'm supposed to knock you out. Huh? Those two drinks you just ordered, yours will be loaded. Why? I don't know. You gave me $50 to do it. That's all I know. And told the guy at the piano to see that you drank it. Yeah, but I don't understand. Why are you telling me? I don't know myself. 
You're different, I guess. Not like the rest of the scum that comes into this joint. So my drink's going to be loaded, eh? And the man at the piano is going to see I drink it. I <laughs> don't have much choice, do I? Oh, no, I'm going to help you. They wouldn't do anything to you in here. Now, after the drink hit you, I'm supposed to get you out the back door and throw you in the alley. Well, that'll be a big help. Oh, but I'm not going to. Oh, shh. I like scotch. It's such a high-class drink. Now, why the double talk? Look, when I reach around you for the ashtray, the guy at the piano will be able to see you. Then you switch the drinks. You drink mine. Yeah, but what about you? They don't expect me to drink. Yeah, but... Get it down. Drink it quick. And pretend you're busy. I hope you get the hour. When you get there, you better run, brother, and run fast. Yeah, but you, what'll happen to you? Stop playing. I'll take your choice. Do it my way or do it his. Hurry, switch them. In the mirror, I saw him coming, but her body hid the drinks from him. I did what she said. I switched them and gulped hers down. Then I sat on the stool a minute and pretended to get dizzy. I ran my hand over my head, leaned against her. She helped me off the stool, put my arm around her shoulder, and led me to the alley door. The ruse was working perfectly. Perfectly, except for one thing. I was dizzy. My stomach suddenly turned over and over. And the floor came up to meet me and I fell flat into their trap. It was wet and damp and I felt cold when I came to it. It took me several minutes to figure out where I was. They had dumped me in the shadows of the warehouse where I had jumped Joe. Joe was there, too, lying where I'd left him. But not the way I'd left him. He was dead. Killed with a bullet that unquestionably came from the gun I was holding. And I was framed. A murder that served two purposes. I felt rotten leaving Joe there, but I had to get away before the police found me and delayed me. As it happened, I wasn't a block away when I heard their sirens. I stopped under a street light and looked at my watch. Quarter to one. The plasma. The ship. I ran along the waterfront to the docks. But the Bruno was gone. The tugboat was letting go her lines as she slipped out of the channel into the open sea. In more ways than one, I had missed the boat. Waterfront went uptown and registered at a commercial hotel where I'd made my report over the phone to the chief in Washington. And then I waited for the information I had to have before I could proceed. Those are the bad hours, the hours when you wait, because that's when you think. Joe Chapman, his family, a vicious organization dealing in stolen blood. I was glad when the call came. Hello? Mark? Oh, yes, chief. Red China? What? Nothing. Go on. First port of call, Puerto Limon, Costa Rica. Well, that means she'll have to go through the canal. That's right. What's your plan, Mark? When she goes through the canal, have her detained and searched. Well, have you got any evidence? I'm only too glad to have her searched, but we have to have something more to go on than a hunch, you know. I'll have evidence by the time she gets there. I'm going to board her at Puerto Limon. How, Mark? Do you think you can? Well, it shouldn't be too hard. She's short of semen. And incidentally, I'll need papers. Good. Well, I guess that's about all. Have the police here notified you about, uh, about Joe? Yeah. They're flying him back. I hated to leave him. I... Yeah, yeah. Mark? Yeah? Watch it. They're not only stealing blood now, they're spilling it. <laughs> By the time I caught a plane and landed at Puerto Limon, I was well on the way to looking disreputable. What with needing a shave and not changing my clothes, I looked exactly what I advertised myself to be, a beachcomber. And as such, I attracted the attention of a languid gentleman by the name of Juan Emilio, owner of Emilio Brothers Warehouses, 
and signs along the dock proclaimed him an important man in port. Shipper, importer, exporter, transportation. Senor. Yeah. You've been around the docks three or four days now. You're looking for a job? No. Nope. Well, I'm a man of some influence. You could do no better than to work for me. Half to there. Yeah, what kind of work? Well, how's donkey? No, you're not a man for donkeys. Doc. You can load cargo. No. Thanks just the same. Oh, that's the trouble with everybody. Too lazy for work. Believe me, Juan Emilio did not arrive at his present state of finance from being lazy. Lo amigo. The SS Bruno docked late one afternoon. She was tied off, the hatches open. Steam brought the winches to life, and the native stevedores on dock got busy, helping load a cargo of coffee from the mayor's warehouse on it. On the deck, the first mate was supervising the loading. Come on, come on, you amigos! We haven't got all year! I walked up the blank flank point. Come on, come on, get on it! Snap it up! Get that cargo on! Uh, who are you? What do you want? A job. Read it. Look, mister, I'm on the beach. I want to get out of here. Sign me on. I got papers. Oh, birds, I said. Yeah, but I've been here six months. I want to go home. We're going to China. China? Any place. I don't care. Just get me out of this hole. You're going to beat it? Okay, okay. Hey, come on. Come on, you guys. Get on it. Oh, Senior Emilio. Oh, the beach goer. You changed your mind about a job? Yeah. Come on. You use another hand with that cargo there? You must be pretty hungry today. Get to work, Senor. <laughs> the line of derelicts and peons who were carrying coffee from the warehouse to the dock. I felt if I kept busy, I wouldn't be noticed. I had to get aboard that ship, and since I couldn't do it legitimately, I'd do it the other way. I worked for almost an hour, and when the mate and Mr. Emilio were in a harangue, I slipped aboard and made my way aft, swung open the small iron door that led down into the propeller shaft alley, and in that cramped and dim place, I waited. For another hour, I could still hear it. The noise and confusion of cargo being brought aboard and stowed in the hold. And then, in a while, that sound was replaced by another sound. And we were underway. In roughly 48 hours, we would be detained in the Panama Canal. I had to find the plasma before then, but my first concern was to avoid discovery until I had located it. I was safe in the propeller shaft until the oiler made his round. But that wasn't for long. I climbed up and out of the way I'd come in. On the well deck, two seamen were completing, battening down the hatches. I ducked, tried for the shelter deck. The door was locked. I went up a ladder and I was amidships. I turned into a companionway and ran right into him. My big, bald friend in the turtleneck sweater. Only now he had added a cap, proclaiming him master of the Bruno. Well, you again. Captain Kubitschek. At your service. Yeah, I don't like your service. I didn't like it the last time when you threw me in the alley with a corpse. Corpse? Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. By the way, what happened to you? I come back for you at the bar, but you were gone. And how'd you get to board my ship? Stowed away. In New Orleans? Well, you didn't think I'd stand still for murder, did you? I told you I had to get out of the country. So you did. So you did. Well, Skipper, hmm. everything's ship shape now. Did you... Hey, what's this punk doing here? You know him? He hit me for a job. In New Orleans? No, Limon. I told him we didn't have no bird. Well, it looks like you lied to me, Mr... Smith. It's an odd coincidence, isn't it, Mr. Smith? First New Orleans, then Puerto Limon. You seem to be following me around. What are we going to do with him? What we usually do with stowaways, put him to work. Put him to work? Of course. And then we get to the canal zone... We turn him over to the authorities. Turn me over to the authorities? What for? You've broken the law, haven't you? It's illegal to stow away. He didn't seem the least concerned that I was aboard. Not the least. And yet I knew, he knew, why I was there. You get so you sense when you're hot. I had an odd feeling a switch was being worked again. They kept me busy, and although they didn't watch me openly, they saw to it that I never got to the hole. 
I did get one chance at the cargo. On the shelter deck, there were some crates. We had just passed the lighthouse off Point Toro outside the breakwater of the canal. I got to the crates and I ripped one open. But it only contains spades and shovels. Small farm equipment. I was ripping open another crate when the mate jumped. I Why, you wish I'd dumped you overboard. Mr. Rick, let him go. You are Why? to learn discretion. And you, Mr. Smith, you're very curious, aren't you? Captain Kubitschek will be in Panama Canal in a very little while. I am aware of the course. I'll just stand here talking to him, Skipper. Let me take care of him. Don't be a fool. Don't you realize Mr. Uh, Smith is a special agent? You're very wise, Captain. The canal authorities know I'm on board the Bruno, and if you were to arrive in the canal without me, I'm afraid you'd be in a bad spot, so no fatal accident, eh? You underestimate me, Mr. Smith. I never have accidents. At Christabel, where we were boarded by the Navy, I had the first sense of security since I'd left Washington. Captain Kubitschek? Yes? Lieutenant Easter Day, United States Navy. I've orders to detain your ship and have you searched. I don't understand, Lieutenant. Why my ship? Searched for what? Uh, Lieutenant, my name is Mark Wagner. Oh, glad to see you, Wagner. I was informed you'd be on board. Wagner? I thought you said your name was Smith. All right, man, searcher. What is the meaning of this indignity, Lieutenant? What are you looking for? Contraband plasma stolen from the United States government to be transported to Red China. On my ship? And you suspicion me? I won't allow it, Lieutenant. I have my rights, and I refuse to... Open the holes, Captain. We're going to inspect your cargo. Uh We went into the holes and we looked. We broke open every bit of cargo. We searched. We fine-tooth combed that ship, and we found nothing. In the end, we apologized, and Captain Kubitschek and the Bruno left with a clean bill of health. We sailed through the canal and into the Pacific. Too bad, Wagner. I was uh, hoping we'd find that plasma as much as you were. Lieutenant, I don't understand it. Joe Chapman was positive it was a boy. Well, maybe he'd had a bum steer. No. I might believe that if they hadn't killed him. They were afraid of him or they wouldn't have killed him. Well, it's not on board now, that's for sure. We didn't miss any hiding place big enough to store a package of K rations. I still don't buy it. They got rid of me in New Orleans so I couldn't join the ship. New Orleans? Where did you board it? Port of Limon. Oh, they, they, they didn't drop any cargo at Limon. They only took some cargo on. I know. I helped them. I. What's the matter? Of course. That. That last hour down in the shaft. How. How would I know if they were loading or unloading? It would sound the same, wouldn't it? Yeah, but why drop plasma at Limon if it's bound for China? What would they do with it in Costa Rica? Well, another ship could pick it up. They could shuttle it to the Pacific. Could be. I've got to get back to Limon before that stuff disappears. Lieutenant, I'll need a plane. You've got one, mister. In a matter of hours, I was back in Porto Limon. In the elaborate office of Juan Emilio. Oh, so you come back. You're a very unreliable fellow. You work one hour. What happened? You open the drunk somewhere? And uh, do not ask me to pay wages. Senor Emilio, did the SS Bruno drop any cargo when she was in port? Huh? I want a straight answer, senor. Did she drop any cargo? Well, see, did you not see for yourself? Where is that cargo? In your warehouse? No, senor, it's gone. What ship has it? No ship, uh, donkey train. Donkey? See, si, it goes my donkey to Punta Arenas. Punta Arenas is on the west coast of Costa Rica, on the Pacific Ocean. A very strange fellow for a beachcomber. You're sure that cargo's on the donkey train? You couldn't be mistaken. Mistaken, senor? When I myself own the donkey train? You know what's in that shipment? You know what your donkeys are carrying? No. Sewing machine. Sewing machine. A man does not get rich by asking questions, senor. One time we carried dynamite to Punta Arenas. Boom. Blow up the donkeys. Well, I have insurance. Thank you, senor Emilio. Thank you very much. It was perfectly clear now. The Bruno had dropped the plasma on the Atlantic coast of Costa Rica, intending to pick it up on the Pacific. 
completely escaping the danger of being caught with it in the canal. As the Navy plane carried me across Costa Rica, I looked down from the newest form of transportation and saw the oldest, the donkey train. I naturally arrived days ahead of them in Punta Arenas, where I impatiently waited. And one day, the donkey train plodded in, and along with the local authorities, I inspected the cargo. The crates on the backs of the donkeys were labeled sewing machines, all right, but they were filled with plasma. And that afternoon, as the SS Bruno put into the Bay of Nicoya, I helped carry the cargo aboard, disguised as a peon, the leader of the donkey train. When the last crate was on deck, I presented Captain Kubitschek with a bill of lading. The cargo is in order, senor. Yeah, in order. And you are supposed to sign here, senor. I know that to sign. There. Now up. Get your men off the ship. I'll be glad to, Captain Kubitschek. Will you join us? Further. Uh, You're under arrest. This is Costa Rica. You have no authority here. You're quite right. But I've covered that, Captain Kubitschek. What are you talking about? If you'll take a closer look at the peons who carried aboard the cargo under every sombrero, you'll see a member of the Costa Rican police. Well, it was over. One of the dirtiest cases in the book. The Bruno was interred, the captain and the entire crew extradited to the United States for trial. And the plasma flown to Korea, express. And I was back in headquarters in Washington. Well, you were right, Mark. We checked back on Kubitschek. He got a record of black market operations in Europe a mile long. Well, it won't be hard to get a conviction on him. What about the girl in New Orleans? Well, we've got her. Name's Elsie Solonsky. Hmm. We've got all of them. Nailing Kubitschek wraps up this whole operation. Well, that's good. Good. Well, have a good time on your vacation, Mark. You need it. When are you leaving? Oh, tomorrow. No. What's wrong with this afternoon? Why wait till tomorrow? No, uh, there's something I've got to do. I've neglected doing it for a long time. Well, maybe I can do it for you. No. No, I've got to take care of this myself. I... Say, maybe you can at that. Good idea. You can come along with me. Get your hat. Sure, Mark. Sure. Where are we going? To the blood bank. Sure. <laughs> They give you a coffee and donuts over there, you know. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The capture of the missing blood closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men. The special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving grand theft of war material in a file case entitled Stolen Arsenal, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by John and Glenn Bagney and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Lorene Puddle, Paul Freeze, Lou Krugman, Nestor Piver, and Don Diamond. Your announcer is Don Stanton. Douglas Fairbanks is currently presenting Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Emlyn Williams in the motion picture, Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law, involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Chimes mean good times on NBC. Later today, listen for the big show and its great all 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 Fairbanks, Jr. in The Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men. 
transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government in their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. The infant republic of the Philippines is the great testing ground of transplanted democracy, American brand. When it was learned by our State Department that the Hooks, a communist-inspired group of Philippine rebels, were using American-made weapons in their bloody raids, an immediate investigation was called for. And this is the story I pass on to you. In it, I play the role of Special Agent Donald Hines, the file case entitled Stolen Arsenal, in which only the names and places are fictional. Because I had served in the Navy in the South Seas, I was assigned to the job. My first contact was with a Mr. Manuel Zambales in Manila. He met me at the airport. I spotted him leaning against the steel wire fence, a thin, wiry-looking little man. M- Mr. Hines? Yeah? I am Manuel Zambales. Oh, glad to know you, Manuel. We, we will go this way, please. Oh, no, not through the rotunda. There is much tension in Manila now. The hooks are threatening to seize the city. The hooks are using American weapons, eh? Yes, sir. In the same weapons that once depended us are now turned on us. In one village alone, 27 people lose their lives. And the, um, the source of these weapons is unknown. Mm, they are cunning, the hooks. They smuggle them in in old fishing junks. Where are you taking me now? Very close to here. To meet one of the hooks. Mm, these ruins we are passing now. They were once a modern housing project. Now, you said one of the hooks? We have those among us who serve as hooks. I want you to talk to this one. Uh, we stop here. Already? Watch your step. Well, I feel right at home, sir. I spent five years in the Navy. That was long ago. 
Well, you have a chart of all the islands in the Caroline Group which hold war surplus material. I'd like to see it, please. On principle, I object strongly. It's most unusual to divulge information of this sort to a civilian investigator. These are most unusual circumstances, sir. Yes. Well, I've been ordered to cooperate. Here it is. Decoded. I'm looking for a weapon that has the following serial number. B-4780. B. All B prefixes are on this group of atolls, 91X to 94X inclusive. You're sure? In this branch of the service, we make it a point to be sure. In that case, the weapons which the hooks are using have been stolen off 91X. Impossible. These islands are continually patrolled and are accessible only by outrigger canoe. They have guards stationed on them? Civilian natives, small family group, for maintenance purposes. How often are they patrolled? Every two, three weeks. Enough time to strip any one of them. No decent-sized ship could come within two miles of any of these islands. Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's go and see for ourselves. We loaded a fast patrol boat for a five- or six-day journey and headed for truck. From truck, we worked our way west. Everything was in order. To me, the trip was something like homecoming week. All these places had a familiar look to me. I even had a chance to brush up on my pidgin English with the natives. At Sorrel Islands, we began working our way back. We were approaching the small, uncharted groups of islands marked on my map as U.S. Territory X. Commander Forsythe ordered the engines stop. This is a small one. Four islands in this group, 91 to 94. Half-tracks, light tanks, field guns. All right, men, lower the boat. All set? Come on. Well, this island doesn't seem inaccessible. According to my chart, we should be heading into a sharp coral reef. Isn't it possible to blast through the coral? Yes, of course. That's how they made a channel so they could get in to store the equipment. After they were through, they blocked up the passage again. Well, then they forgot to do this one. According to my information, it was treated the same way. You're not insinuating any breach? No, 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 sir. Not at all. Not at all. Man by the name of Cholak looks after this one. We'll probably see his hut when we get up this bank here. Mm-hmm. Mm, just a minute. Yes, what is it? These wheel marks coming down to the water's edge. Yes, I don't understand. I do. Come on. Cleaned out. 300 pieces of U.S. equipment. Disappear. We'd let lay my hands on this Cholak. There's his hut. Cholak! Cholak! Where are you, you thieving murderer? You're wasting your breath, Commander. He's either moved to another island or he's dead. Cholak's hut showed no signs of violence. Apparently, he'd been bought off by the captain of the pirate freighter and moved on. But islanders never moved too far, so we knew he must be in the vicinity somewhere. We sent our native boys out to make some inquiries, and soon we had his new address. Tulasook Island. We paid him a visit. A whole procession of villagers followed us to Tulasook's tethered Abacao hut. I hope your pigeon English holds up. <laughs> I do, too. Here's his place. Tulasook! Hello, Texas! Um, me talk talk you. Okay, you come along me house, me talk talk. Okay. Cholok, why you go-go island? White man, him say she boss. Say go-go, quick. Why him say go? Him say come along big boom, me die. Woman die, baby die. I, I, uh, I lost him there. They told him to clear out quick. Oh. Him take all the gun. What kind of ship him got? Ship? Water buckets. Oh, him big water buckets. One him big, big, big. One him all right. Um, how him take gun? Him boom, boom, water. Uh, they blasted the coral. Used one big ship and one small one. Probably an LCVP. Uh, the LCVP ferried the guns out to the freighter and they were hoisted aboard. Uh, Commander, get me a stick, will you? I'm going to have him sketch the ship on the ground. Right. Um, how him look, big, big buckets? Oh, him uh, 12 big. Here's your stick. What does 12 big mean? Well, that's the highest number they can think of in terms of, uh... <laughs> Well, it means very big. Uh, you made 
Water buckets with stick, huh? Uh, me, me. Yeah. This is fellow man, bone dry. He dry too much. What in the world? A tough guy. Uh, him say me die, baby die. He's doing a good job with that stick. I make her out to be a freighter. How about you? Yeah, liberty type. Sometimes me find this fellow man bone he dry too much. You know him again? Me know him done fool. Okay, you belong us? All the time me belong you. All the time me Texas. <laughs> Come on, Commander. <laughs> thread out of which a whole cloth was to be woven. Somewhere in the South Pacific was a freighter with a captain and crew daring enough to raid a United States arsenal. Forsyth was insistent that the whole area be put on an emergency footing. Even while he was waiting with me at the airfield for the plane that would take me back to Manila, he kept trying to make his point. I'd have had my way. I'd have closed off every sea lane, every avenue of approach. I know, I know. But whoever raided that island would know it too and wouldn't come back. Our State Department wants to catch him, to set an example to others who might get similar ideas. That's the civilian approach. I'm completely dissatisfied. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's my pilot. In my report to my superiors, I intend to recommend a much more direct action. The people in this area must learn once and for all. Sure, that... sure. Anything you say. Huh? Go on. Back in Manila, I spent a couple of days trying to locate and identify all Liberty-type freighters who might be operating in these waters. I finished up with a list of seven ships that I could consider worthy of further investigation. It would be a long process and probably a fruitless one. I was in not too happy a frame of mind when I went that night to keep my rendezvous with Manuel. As Manuel had done, I snapped my lighter on so my face could be seen. Senor Hai? Mari. I was expecting Manuel. He could not come. He's, he's all right, though. The answer to that is in God's hands. He joined the crew of the crater, Colombo. That is the ship that brought the guns here. You know that for certain. The Colombo. Now, I have her on my list. But she's, she's on the Panamanian registry. The crew is made up of hooks. I'm fit for the daring. That Manuel is with him. Well, where was she bound? Australia, the first mate said. But he was lying. Ah. Colombo's on the Panamanian registry, yet the crew is hooked. I don't quite understand. And here is something I find bitterly hard to understand. The captain of the Colombo, he is an American. <laughs> Oceanic phone call to my chief in Washington. I asked for a full report on the Colombo. He called me back later with the information I wanted. Five hours later, I was back on Guam. Forsyth's attitude toward me hadn't improved considerably. It's time you got back. <laughs> well, out of the past 48 hours, I've flown 12 hours, worked 30, spent the next six hours in plain foolishness, such as sleeping and eating. Well, I suppose it's the tropics. A guy gets lazy out there. All right, no speeches, please. What'd you find out? The name of the ship we're looking for, the Colombo, and the name of her American skipper, Captain Murdoch. Mm, good. Hope she's heading this way. Let her get into U.S. trust territory and... According we'll... to my information, she's going to Australia. Mm. Send out some of your reconnaissance planes and see if you can spot her. Tell them not to show too much interest in her. Perhaps you'd like to issue the orders direct to them yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Guess I'm a little over-anxious. You see, I, I found out the Colombo is under Panamanian registry, but... She's American-owned and operated. Oh, one of those deals, huh? Yeah. You know what I'd do if I could? Make some of these guys spend the monsoon season out here. Let them feel the 85-mile-an-hour wind and the rain that comes down on you like open pen knives. Yeah, yeah. In the meantime, I have a plan that calls for immediate action. What's that? Some food, a shower, and a bath. <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> Colossal gall. Well, I better get moving. I want to be there to meet her. How long do you think it'll take her? 
Well, she's moving fast. A little more than two days, I'd say. Well, that'll give me time. How many men do you want? None. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, an islander who speaks fair English, just the two of them. You can have sheep sheep, my orderly. Sheep sheep? <laughs> I'd like to have been at that christening. <laughs> Those island nicknames. How about cover for you? What if something goes wrong? No cover, please. We want nothing to stop her from loading the stuff. You can you can get her when she's in the clear. This is the darndest thing. Taking orders from... A suggestion. From a civilian. It's a good thing you were a Navy man at one time or so. Uh, once a Navy man, <laughs> always a Navy man. All right. And don't forget that. I won't, sir. Sheep Sheep, Forsyth's native boy, and I were flown to Forlet. And from there it was a half a day's trip by Africa canoe to X-93. The United States government demands that at least two reliable witnesses be prepared to testify to any criminal or fraudulent act. So as we approached our destination, I swore in Sheep Sheep as a special agent. Category? Temporary. The islanders were only too willing to take off for different parts when Sheep Sheep explained why we were there. Under the roof rafters of the hut, I fixed a place where I had a commanding view of the shoreline as well as the approach to the house. At dawn of the third morning, I was awakened by the boy. Sore, you better wake up. Huh? Uh, where is the boy? The boat. Mm. Is that anchor? Uh, oh, let's take a look. No. Oh. Yeah, that's her. You better hide quick. The canoe, it is on beach. I did not see it before. All right, all right. Don't panic. I hope this platform holds me. Quick, sure. They are on bank. You afraid, boy? Sheep, sheep, never afraid. Good. Uh, who are you there? Uh, hello there. Who's in charge? Me, sir. I am boss. Yeah? All alone? Mother and father go to Ulil, sir. You lying land lover. No one else with you on the island? No, sir. It don't make sense. But then nothing in this whole wild Pacific Ocean makes sense. Yeah, I think I'll go into your hut and look around. There you are, sir. Yeah, I guess it's all right. But you'd better not be lying to me, boy. Never lie. All right. I have orders from the United States government to move all this equipment off. The guns and tanks? Everything. But the patrol... They say nothing. Never mind arguing. You can't win and I can't lose. I've kissed the Blarney Storm. Have you? No, sir. <laughs> All right, then, lad. Just give us a hand. You have papers? Well, now, if that isn't the luck of the Irish, one literate islander in the South Pacific and I had to find them. <laughs> Here's your documents. Thank you, sir. Now, why would they be leaving a million dollars worth of stuff with one man and a young one at that? Sheep sheep very strong. Sheep sheep's got a wagon tongue in his head. Where's your lumber? In back of hut sore. Call me captain, you swab. I'm a seagoing captain, you understand? A license? Oh, now, what's the use? Come on, give me a hand. We're building a ramp to the shore. But the coral reef, it's impossible to... We're blasting the channel through it. Come on now, young dick swabber. <laughs> Blasting of the coral reef to make a channel for the LCDP. Descriptions of the material as it was loaded and taken away. The hoisting of the stuff on board the Colombo. At dusk on the fourth day, Murdoch trudged up to the hut. Sheep Sheep had just started preparing the evening meal. Captain, I thought you had gone back to your ship. Yeah, I come back to tell you we were through here. Uh, but you'd, uh, you'd better clear out soon. By tomorrow night, the planes will be dropping them new bombs on this place. Yes, sir. I surely go. Yeah. Smells good. What are you making for supper? Lapu lapu. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a heap of grub for one man. Sheep sheep eat enough for his brother, too. What's that? Maybe wind. Yeah. Well, I'll be shoving off. And mind you, you too. And you're not to talk to anyone about what's happened here. Yeah. Here's a little something for your trouble. Money, sir. Ten dollars. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Cut your lions even talk, son. You was expecting at least twenty dollars. <laughs> now, aren't you? No, sir. No, sir. All right. All right. Take care of yourself. <laughs> You may come down now, sir. 
No. No, he's suspicious. The captain's wise. I have a hunch he lets the boat go and stay behind himself. Look, boy, if he comes back, don't look up here. Go on, eat your supper. As you say. It is very good, this lapu-lapu. Shall I give you some? No, thanks. Not now. There's someone outside. Quiet. Uh, I thought maybe I'd have a bite with you after all, lad. Welcome, Captain. I heard both go back, and I thought you... I'd gone back with it? Yeah. Your friend is smarter than you are. The gun sore. Why you hold it? That is to persuade your friend to come down. What do you say after that? There's no one there, Captain. No? Shall I shoot through the boards to prove it? No. One more chance. Are you coming down? All right, Captain. Saints of Ireland, for white men. Well, sit down, mister. Thanks. Maybe you can't explain. I always had the feeling that the lad was land, and I don't know why. Then when I seen the amount of food... Well, what are you saying for yourself, mister? Well, I've been living with this boy's people for a long time. I'm wanted in the States. That's true, Captain. Yes, and yes. Oh, my, my, my. I was afraid it'd be a yarn like that. No, Captain. It's true. Well, that's neither here nor there. Main thing is, you saw too much and you know too much. You'd better come along with me, both of you. Me? But I cannot... Come along. I don't know what I'm going to do with you, but whatever it is, it won't be good. Well, leave the boy stay here. This has nothing to do with him. Move. <laughs> CDP was waiting for us, and using his gun for emphasis, the captain invited us in for a ride to the Colombo. On board the ship, we were taken below deck to a little cabin. It, it's so dark here. I can see nothing. <laughs> the conveniences aren't all they should be. My mother, she will worry. Oh, we'll be all right, boy. We'll be out of here soon. And the girl I was to marry, she will be very angry if, if I die. Oh, stop talking nonsense. Commander Forsythe will have us out of here in a few hours. The commander said so? Yeah. Then we will be safe. Quiet. Someone's at the door. Uh-huh. Yes, who's that? Manuel, what happened? Your American government could not stop them from loading the ship. We'll let them load the ship purposely, Manuel. Then we'll seize it with the cargo aboard. But you will not live to give the evidence. Don't worry about that, Manuel. Someone's coming. Quiet, boy. Uh, stay where you are, gentlemen. You needn't rise. Thank you. I wish things hadn't turned out this way, but uh, you had no right to interfere with the wheels of industry. Industry? Sure. My own particular industry. Hiring myself out to the highest bidder. But killing in my line, and it saddens me to think I may have to look after you two in such a manner. Why? We do nothing bad. Or oh, them hooks. They got it in mind that you two are spies. And them hooks, they just soon kill a man as eat. Well, I can tell you a few things that may govern the action you take. Five or six miles out, you'll be met by a group of American naval ships. Oh, an interesting revelation. And you speak with some authority. I do. I'm a special agent, United States federal government. You got papers to prove it? I don't need papers to prove it. You'll know it soon enough. Well... I sure hate to mess around with the federal boys. On the odd chance that you aren't bluffing. I'm not. It'd go pretty bad for me if you weren't around when and if they got to me. Very bad. Uh, They'll be expecting me to pull a banker in the morning. They'll be waiting for you whenever you try it. Maybe not. Well, one thing to do, make a run for it. What's so funny? If they sink the ship, you go down with it. If we get through, the Hucks want you. Either way, you lose. In 20 minutes, the ship was underway. Her engines picked up speed quickly. She was traveling fast and with no lights. The ship. I hope they are there. They will be. We have already traveled five miles. It's the boat. Manuel. Oh. Quick. They're going to run for it and we may be fired upon. Get us out of here or we haven't a chance. Let do it. A searchlight. I saw it. Another one, sir. A circle of ships around us. Oh, isn't that a sweet sight? Look, sir. Other ships are moving in. We'll have to stop. I pray that you are right. Good boy, Manuel. Lean on it. 
The boat door. It has stopped. Here, Mr. Hines. I have brought some pistols. We can fight our way up to the deck. That won't be necessary. Listen. Get on deck. We got to the bridge a little behind Commander Forsythe. Murdoch stood waiting for him, his feet planted wide apart. He was unarmed and smiling. You are in command? Lieutenant Commander Forsythe, at your service. Captain Jeffrey Murdoch, at yours, sir. Your ship is in custody, sir. Yes. My compliments to you, Commander, for as fine a bit of maneuvering as I've ever seen. Thank you. Consider yourself under arrest, Captain. At your service. Uh, you will do me the courtesy of not putting handcuffs on. My crew, sir, I wouldn't like them. Naturally. Come along, in. waiting for my plane to take off. I had two young friends with me. Someday, senor, you will come back and find the island at peace. I hope it's soon, Mary. You have done your share, Mr. Hines. Oh, I had a job. I was lucky enough to see it finished satisfactorily. You will be back someday? I'll be back twice. In the spirit, if not in the flesh. Twice, sir? Yeah. Once when Manuel gets his degree at the university. And the second time? When your first boy... Is named after me. <laughs> that will be a fine name. Donald, Heinz, Querido, Manuel, Julian, El Siore, Zambale. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The recapture of the stolen arsenal closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men. The special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving an American agent held hostage in an Iron Curtain country in the file case entitled Confess or Die, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. That case was written by Lewis and Bruce Roth and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian, George Neath, Junius Matthews, and Jeffrey Silver. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Douglas Fairbanks is currently presenting Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Edmund Williams in the motion picture, Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Before you buy a house, an automobile, or any expensive item, you usually consult an expert for his opinion. That's good common sense. But when you drive, do you consult the expert, or do you endanger your life and the lives of others? One man who is an expert is the man who drives for a living, the truck driver. You should drive carefully and courteously. Use your common sense as well as observing all of the traffic regulations. Careful driving can save a life, and the life you save may be your own. Tomorrow, it's the City Service Silver Radio Jubilee on NBC. Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men.
transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. And now here is Douglas Fairbanks. The international boundaries dividing the United States from Canada and Mexico are eternal monuments to the truth that nations can live side by side in peace and brotherhood. Not one fortress, not one pillbox stands guard over the treasures that are America. But there are people who mistake trust and goodwill for weakness, and who, for profit and with criminal intent, would violate the immigration laws governing our borders. Of special concern to the Department of Labor in Washington was the existence of a group of criminals whose specialty was the smuggling of aliens and undesirables into this country through Mexico. To help smash this ring, an undercover agent was assigned to the Los Angeles Division. In tonight's story, I will assume his identity. Special Agent Pete Bradford, in a file case entitled Visas for Sale, in which only the names and places are fictional. <laughs> In Los Angeles, the chief put me in touch with a Mr. Louis Martinez, an undercover man for the Mexican government who was working on the same problem. We were driving down the California coast to San Diego, where Martinez would leave me while he went on to Mexicali. Uh, just like the postcards say, orange trees, oil wells, and the Pacific Ocean. See, si, we are leaving the ocean for a while. I know a shortcut through the hills. It will save much time. You were born in Mexico, Martini? Yes, si. in Punta Prieta. Yes, that's the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you seem to be in the middle of nowhere right now. Not a house in sight. Yes, that's right. And that is why it is sometimes used by them. Them? Yes, si. the dealers in human contraband. Ah. I have a deep hatred for them, senor. It's a personal thing with me. Hey, that, that guy ahead there, he's flagging us down. Yeah. There's a state trooper. What's the trouble? You fellas will have to wait here a while. We're expecting an ambulance. An accident? That looks more like murder. A couple of wetbacks. That is what they call the Mexican nationals who try to skip across the border. Yes, I know. Uh, I would like to see them, please. All right, officer. Pretty messy thing to look at. I'm used to it. It's in my line of business. Huh? Undertaken? <laughs> Not exactly. Special agent, federal government. Yeah, well, sure. Come on if you want to. It's around the curve here. Yeah. So many of them are found like this. Yeah, they come across by the hundreds. They know they'll be caught and shipped back, but they come anyway. See? Yeah. Ten, fifteen times some of them have tried. Yeah. Pobre soldan. Pretty, huh? Lovely. How did it happen? I don't know for sure. It's a job for the lab men. Yeah, you see those bits of cement on their clothes? Hmm. That's concrete, not paving asphalt. Yeah, that's what makes it hard to figure. Hey, tell me, who reported this, huh? No one. I was cruising around when I saw it. These men have been dead a long time. And nobody reported it? Who's to report? Another wetback? A uh, motorist taking this stretch at 70 miles an hour? Yeah. One woman was run over half a dozen times before she was removed. These men fell or were pushed off some height. Mm-hmm, it looks like it. It might have been one of those big freight trucks they sometimes ride on top of the van. We'd better move on, Martinez. I'll get a report on this in the San Diego. Can we get through, officer? We're on government business. Yeah, sure. Working on something special in San Diego? Nice breeze coming in off the ocean, isn't it? <laughs> That's what I like about you federal boys. Ask a question and what do you get? Nothing. <laughs> in silence for a while. The tight lines round Martinez's mouth showed how deeply he was disturbed. I tried to engage him in conversation. Martinez! Yes, senor? I want to go over my briefing with you, see if I've missed anything. Now, the outfit we're trying to crack works out of San Diego, right? Well, we believe the American headquarters are in San Diego, see? But we have found nothing to prove that. Mm-hmm. They brought the wetbacks long before they reached the city. Ah. And when they are picked up, they will not talk. That's uh, part of the bargain. And the only suspect in San Diego is this Sam Johnson, eh? He's the traffic supervisor for the Bailey Trucking Company. And their trucks have carried wetbacks. But he himself has never been implicated? No. Nothing is proved. But he's only a link, amigo. The, the real power, the brains are supplied by somebody else. 
And that is who we want. Well, why do they do it, these countrymen of yours? Surely they know yeah, that they are poor people. So they save a few pesos and come north for the more abundant life. I have seen men who have walked for a week to get to the border. The syndicate takes their money and they are gotten across the line, and when it's convenient, they are dumped dead or alive. It makes no difference. You'll call me in San Diego when you need me, won't you? See, si. And it will be soon. The princes are assembled, amigo. Soon we will find the means of making them fall into place. We reached San Diego and Martinez dropped me off at the El Centro Hotel. I spent the next few days getting all the background I could on the smuggling operation. I questioned a busload of Mexican nationals who were being shipped back to Mexico from Los Angeles. They told me nothing. Just shrugged their shoulders and smiled. Only their eyes showed their disappointment. I hung around the Bailey Trucking Company and saw the big trucks come in with their loads from Yuma and points east. Nothing out of the ordinary. I shadowed Sam Johnson for two days, and that led me nowhere. Once I slipped into a seat next to him in a crowded little restaurant. Uh, busy spot. Yeah, food's crummy, too. How's this town for work? Looking for a job? Yeah. What kind of work you do? Oh, anything to do with cars, mechanic, chauffeur, truck driver. You don't look like no truck driver. And you don't talk like one. Well, give me a chance to prove it and I will. Sorry, bud. Don't know of a thing. My usefulness, as far as Sam Johnson was concerned, was at an end. I spent the next couple of days waiting for a call from Martinez. In between waits, I fed the pigeons in the Plaza de Panama. I'd been in San Diego a week when I got a call from Mexicali. Bradford? Yeah. That you, Louis? Si. Take the bus and come to Mexicali as soon as possible. What's up? I will tell you when you arrive. This is it? Si, hermano Bradford. I think this is it. It was early evening when the bus reached Calexico. I checked through the U.S. Customs there, and they gave me the usual friendly advice to keep away from the taverns on the side streets. <laughs> the Mexican Customs officer directed me to the El Cortez, where Martinez told me he was staying. I found him in a hotel bar, sipping a drink. He barely glanced at me when I sat down next to him on a stool. Do not talk to me now. Order a drink, and when you finish it, come up to my room, huh? Number 302. 302. Take your time. Right. Adios. Bartender, glass of tequila. Phew, that tequila. Must be the fuel they use in rockets. Three months, amigo. Three months I have waited, and last night it came. The break that we are waiting for. Good, what is it? The wetbacks would never have led us to the head of the syndicate, but now... Now it is our good fortune. Come on, let's hear it. And the boss last night from Tijuana, a European refugee. I've taken him into custody. No legal entry papers? No, no. Good, good. What did you learn from him? Uh, he will not talk. We must make it. He can lead us to the man we are looking for. You think he was trying to jump the border? He had American money. $200 bills sold into the lining of his coat. Payoff money. Where is he? On the guard in the home of one of our customs officials. I did not want him seen, so I took him there. Well, let's go and talk to him. Uh, you must go yourself. You see, we must not be seen together because I am known to be a government man. Yes, you're right. This European will lead us to him. What makes you so sure? The money. With the Europeans, they deal in hundreds of dollars. Very likely he'll uh, buy a forged passport and visa when he reaches his destination. This will bring him in contact with the top. I hope you're right. Where can I find him? At the home of Joseph Salvatore. Uh, that's the first big white house on La Posta. Can I give you a note to him. I showed Senor Salvatore the note, and he led me to a room at the back of the house. He put a key in the lock and turned it. Inside, slumped on a chair near the bed, sat a man of about um, 45. He wore a 1923 model American-style suit. He raised his clouded eyes to mine and stared at me for a moment. The senor closed the door behind me. I'm told by Mr. Martinez that you speak English. Yeah. 
My name is Pete Bradford. I'm a special agent for the United States government. I have committed no crime. I have hurt no one. You gave your name as Stanley Michael Mosher. That is correct? Yeah. Where was your last place of residence? My home was in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Now I do not know. Where was your destination? Where were you going from Mexicali? This I do not answer. Were you trying to get across to San Diego? Do with me what you will. I cannot answer questions that, that will implicate others. You had 200 American dollars. Where did you get them? Do you have relatives in the States? Well, yeah. No. No, I have nobody. Mr. Mosher, let me give you some idea of what you're up against. If we find that you do have relatives in the United States, they face prosecution. And if this relative should happen to be a refugee like yourself... It could mean deportation for him. Deportation? No, no. And I assure you that we have means of finding him. It may take some time, but we'll find him. Please, I have done nothing wrong. It's a criminal to look for a home, a place to live, to die. What once was my home is now prison for me. If I return, death waits for me. You should have followed the due processes of the law. You don't understand. I wouldn't have lived that long. I spoke against the government. America is everything you want? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yet you chose to enter it in such a way that would violate its laws. And you chose to deal with a type of vicious criminal who make America what it should not be. I was desperate. You thought you were buying freedom. But you were buying fear instead, a lifetime of fear, the fear of exposure. Is that what you wanted? No. These people you were dealing with, who are they? No, I cannot tell you. I... I... I promise. Then we will find them without you. Somebody has been helping you, sending you American money. When we find them, they will face prosecution. No, no, please. Then help us. Tell us what we want to know. Oh. I have no choice. You have near relatives in the USA? Yeah. A sister in Portland. She made these arrangements for you? No, no. In Marseille, I learned that a boat would take me to America for $500. And I cabled my sister. She sent the money to me. What was the name of the boat? The Round Eagle was a freighter. Go on. And we went through the canal, the Panama Canal. After this, I was transferred to a fishing boat that was the Isthmus. And they put me ashore in Zanada. And I came here by the motor bus. What were you supposed to do when you got here? To contact the man in, in Mexicali who will get me to San Diego. His name? Uh, Migrini. Pedro Migrini. I, I was to give to him the $200 American money, and, and he will take me to San Diego. And that was your final destination? Well, there for $500 more, a man would give me a visa. And then I would be free to go where I please. This man's name in San Diego? I don't know. I was to be taken to him. Well, what about the money for the passport? Do you have that? No, no. My sister left for me in a, in a pawn shop in San Diego. I have the ticket for it. Dr. Mosher. Yes, sir. Would you mind standing up? No, I don't understand. But... Now, now, turn around. Are you okay? No, 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 no. I'm not going to hurt you. No. Huh. Same build, same height. Now, take off your coat. Well, they have already searched. I want to try it on. All right. There. Well, that's it. Now, your trousers. No, but... You no, and no. I are trading clothes. Uh, your shirt and tie, too, please. Well, gladly, but I do not understand this what... This man, McGreeny, does, does he know what you uh, look like? Well, perhaps the general description, that is all. Then I shall call on him. And my name will be Stanley Michael Moser. You will take my place? No, but the way you talk, they, they will know. And they are dangerous people. They will kill you. Huh, they will not kill me. <laughs> the accent isn't perfect, but it'll have to do. This is our one big chance, and we've got to take it. Oh, no, but that, that cannot work. It'll have to work. I'll be back tomorrow for a little coaching. Oh, yes. One more thing. Yes, what? Your shoes. Oh, who ever heard of yellow shoes? <laughs> It was late, and I walked through the streets practicing Mosher's version of the English language. 
Luckily, the night clerk at El Cortez was dozing behind his desk, and I slipped upstairs unnoticed. I knocked on Martinez's door. Who is that? Mr. Mosher. Stanley Mosher. What in the name of... Bradford? <laughs> Come on in. My home was in Prague. Beautiful Prague. The city of music and laughter. Then suddenly she died. Like a beautiful woman in her prime, she died. <laughs> in that accent, I don't know, but that suit, that's very good. <laughs> What's the idea? I'm taking Mosher's identity. It's going to lead us right to Mr. Big in San Diego. Yeah, that's most dangerous. If they find out... My first contact is here in Mexicali. A Pedro Migrini. You know him? See, si, si, we know Senor Migrini. We have been watching him. Mosher was to give him the $200. And so? Magrini gets me across the border. Then I'm transferred over to someone else who takes me to Mr. Question Mark in San Diego. Uh, you do not have his name? Eh? No, no. Mosher was to bring him $500 that he has waiting for him in San Diego to buy a phony passport and a visa. Uh, Nigo, we've got to consider this plan carefully. The risks are great. We'll go over the whole thing tomorrow. Right now, I could... I could use some sleep. <sighs> Louis... If you hear me mumbling in my sleep, don't be frightened. I'll just be practicing my accent. Mm. You had better, on you. <laughs> I spent most of the next day with Dr. Moser. I repeated words after him till I was satisfied that I was reasonably close. He briefed me on the details of his life, and I committed them to memory, knowing that some minute scrap of what he told me could either cost me or save me my life. It was 8 o'clock when I got back to the hotel. Martinez was waiting for me. Everything is all right? Good. Good. Well, where does Don Migrini live? One mile on the highway to Tocati. Uh -huh. You turn left on the first road, then it's another mile to the Hacienda. You want to take the car? Uh, it wouldn't look too good, no. no. I'll walk. All right. I've uh, arranged cover for you. Uh, don't make it too good or it'll tip him. Make sure he's a smart operator. Yeah, the best. Hey, you carry a gun? No. Then, amigo, be careful. Huh? Mucho careful, Senor Louis. Senor Negrini was pleased to see me, mainly on account of the $200 I handed him. He made a phone call and told me I'd be picked up in about an hour. It was almost 10 o'clock when I heard a car pull up. There was a polite exchange of goodbyes, and I went outside. An old sedan was waiting for me. The driver wheeled it to the highway and headed west. About four miles out, he stopped near some big boulders. He blinked his lights, and five Mexican men, obviously wetbacks, climbed into the car. One of the men got into the front seat with me, and the car moved away. Suddenly, the man next to me gave me a poke in the ribs. I looked at him closely. Martini! See, I promise you good cover. You're satisfied? Uh-huh. After that brief exchange, we lapsed into silence. We turned north up a mountain trail, and the car rattled bravely on. That car must have been part mountain goat the way it took those climbs. About an hour later, we passed through Hakumba. We went north about another mile, and the driver stopped. He motioned us out of the car and herded us up a hill and down the other side. Then he pointed to a clump of bushes and left us. Martinez whispered to me that we were in United States territory. We waited there for about two, 20 minutes. Then a truck pulled up to the side of the road. The driver got out and opened the back door to the van. Okay, you guys, on the double. A big load today. I can't take you all inside. Three inside, two on top of the truck. Hurry up. I, I beg your pardon. Now what? Who are you? Uh, 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 Moser. Dr. Moser. Keep your mouth shut. You get the grade A treatment. Get in the cab with me. All set? Let's go, huh? Hey, hey, hey. You two guys climbing on top of the Wileys here. That's dangerous. There's a railing on top you can hang on to. Oh. One more can sit in front with us? Oh, no, nothing doing. The truck is big, but that cab is small. All right, you guys, you getting up there? Here we go. What's been keeping you, Moja? 
We expected you a week ago. <laughs> in Sonata. It was a beautiful place. Yeah. Beautiful senoritas, huh? Yeah, yeah. This is big park. We have none like this in my country. Just got it broken in. Yeah. If you'll do 80 on an open stretch, no. you'll have a full load, too, yeah? yeah? 13 feet 6 inches high. Yeah. That's the limit. Scrapes bottom of some of these underpasses. Yeah. Those men on top there, is uh, danger? Oh, it's all part of the game. They'll ride anyways. Yeah. Now it's getting tough to operate now. They even got the feds down here now trying to stop us. Huh? I'm going to stop at this filling station and call in. I'll just be a minute. I got out to ask Martinez if he was all right, but he motioned me away. I sat down and waited. The driver came back on the run. Gotta go up. Driver came back on the run. Gotta go up. Driver came back on the run. Gotta go up. Driver. Fairbanks Jr. in The Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men, transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. And now here is Douglas Fairbanks. The special agent lives with the constant threat of personal danger. Nor is death a stranger to his profession. In these troubled days of international insecurity, this danger is intensified. For there is practically no country in the world that does not play host to American federal agents on important missions. This story is about one of these agents. The details I obtained from a friend in Washington. In it, I assume the identity of Special Agent Dick Bosworth, a file case entitled Confess or Die, in which only the names and places are fictional. Ben Cummings, one of the outstanding journalists of the American press, had been sent on a routine assignment to a middle European country. Following two news dispatches, he was not heard from and his whereabouts became a mystery. Ben and I had grown up together and my concern for him was a real and personal thing. I had been badgering my chief for a chance to go over and locate him. For the third time this day, I knocked on his office door. Come in. Oh, back again? I just came back from talking to Ben's wife. It's pathetic. Expecting her first kid and no word from him. Well, what am I supposed to do about it? Press a button and wish him back at his fire sign? State Department's doing everything possible to find him. Ben's wife thinks he's dead. She may be right. Well, not knowing makes it worse. Go on, let me go and locate him, will you? I don't know. You're too much involved in this. I'll forget the personal element. A lot of people are interested in knowing what happened to him. You'll have to send someone. No. Well, let's be logical, Chief. Who who knows middle you're best in this office, huh? You do. Well, but we're not sending special agents into Iron Curtain country. You know that. I'm not going as an agent. I have only one mission. To find a friend. I've been thinking about it. I won't say I haven't. Well, think a little harder. And a little faster. Yeah, I was mixed up in this, all right. Ben and I, kids together, three houses apart on an elm treed street. Fishing together, hooky, football, then double dating. Me and Ann, Ben and Rose. For a while, we didn't know for sure who was going to marry who. After my talk with the chief, I was useless around the office, so I paid another call on Ben's wife. Dick, you've heard something. I can tell it in your face. I haven't, Rose. You just don't want to tell me. You want me to sit down and make myself nice and comfortable with my knitting first. I haven't heard a thing. You're lying. I know you are. He's dead. What's the matter? Are you psychic or something? Call it psychic. Call it intuition. He's dead. Will you stop it, Rose? I told you we haven't heard. Then why did you come? You were here only an hour ago. Well, I thought with the time so close. No, no, you came to tell me something. Am I the young widow, Mrs. Cummings? What a pity they'll say such a cute child and no fun. It isn't healthy for you to think like that. You've got to stop worrying. Is that what you came to tell me? No, I... I've got the 
chief thinking my way. He might send me to Europe to find Ben. Oh, Dick, has he said so? Not yet, but he will. I know the signs. But look, Rose, you've, you've got to help me with Anne. Anne? I, I didn't think of her. Uh, she'll be all right, but just stick together, the two of you, while I'm gone, will you? can't let you go. The same thing that happened to Ben might happen. Anne will be scared. But if you keep her busy... And... You're not going, I tell you. Listen, if I go, it'll be because I'm sent. Understand? It'll be another assignment. Dick, I won't let you do this for me. I won't be doing it for you. I'll be doing it for me. I started preparing Anne for a possible trip to Europe. She was frightened, but she didn't show it. Just the way she looked at me, long, silent looks, like each of them had to stick with her forever. A couple of days later, Chief Hogan sent for me. Sit down, Dick. Thanks. What are you studying, Chief? It's a book on philately. Know anything about it? Well, I wouldn't care to run across it in a spelling bee. Stamp collecting. Oh, yeah. Should have known that. Why? You've got four days to learn to become a philatelist. An expert. Think you can do it? Well, it just depends what for. For a trip to the continent. For that, two days is plenty. You sending me? Yes. But why the stamp angle? Convention of philatelists in Europe on the 24th. Oh. Collectors from all over the world. Well, sounds all right to me. This is a tough one, Dick. I hate to send you on it. But you asked for it. I know. We've closed our consulate there. You'll have no recourse to any American government official. You'll be suspect as soon as you cross the border. Any contacts? Few, but only one you can get in touch with. A deadly moon by the name of Olga. She shows up at the Basilica Cafe there. How will I know her? Yeah, here's a picture of her. Wow. (laughs) I better not take this one home. (laughs) A little on the sultry side, eh? Tell me, how will I identify myself to her? Cigarette trick. Under an open pack of cigarettes, one cigarette a lot darker than the other's. If she takes it and breaks it in half, she's your girl. When do I leave? Next Monday, five days. Okay. And remember, this is an assignment, nothing more. As soon as you have some definite news, good or bad, you leave the country. You understand? Yeah. An assignment, nothing more. No heroics, no revenge. You find out Ben's dead. Come home, quick. <laughs> I spent the rest of the week studying stamps. Monday morning, I said goodbye to Anne. She wanted to come to the airport with me, but I wouldn't let her. She clung to me for a long time, and she said nothing about where I was going or what I was trying to do when I got there. At the airport, I was 20 minutes early. I got to a phone and called Rose. Hello, Rose? Hello? How are you feeling, Rose? All right. I thought you were going to leave without saying goodbye. I was going to. Change my mind. When are you leaving? Right away. Oh, be careful. You feeling all right? I thought maybe... No, that... I've got about ten days to go. I'll tell Ben. Ben's dead. How many times do I have to tell you Ben's dead? Rose, listen to me. What? I'm sorry I called you. Awful sorry. Dick. Goodbye. <laughs> I tried hard to stay objective about Ben, but it was a losing battle. I stayed in Paris a few days, and I moved on to my destination. At the border, the custom men gave me a good going over, but they let me through. The train rode like a broken-down Iowa cattle car. (laughs) The door to my compartment opened. I had company. A heavy-set man with sandy-colored hair. Uh, You're off right, eh? Yeah, this will churn butter, all right. Churn butter. <laughs> and that must be an American expression. You are... Yes, yeah, I'm an American. <laughs> As if you didn't know. <laughs> I lived in America once. Los Angeles. You know that city? Yeah, sure. I had a coffee shop on Melrose. Oh, <laughs> did you? I lived in the hills near Sunset. Ah. At night, a beautiful view. Beautiful. <clears throat> you are attending the Stamp Collectors Convention. Yeah, how did you know? Not many Americans are attending. But you will enjoy yourself. We will see to that. I'm sure. They've even assigned me a permanent escort. That is true. You are to be my responsibility. A rough tale, eh? Eh? What does that mean? 
A man who's been assigned to watch you with no attempt at concealment. Well, you should be flattered that my government sees fit to assign you a guide. Mm, thanks. Now, you tell your government for me that I appreciate its concern, but there are times when a man must be alone. Well, at such times, I shall stay at a discreet distance, Mr. Boswell. <laughs> I see we need no introduction. Naturally not. We are well informed, my friend. I can see that. There is only one doubt in our minds. Your identity. I'm an American citizen, legally admitted to your country. Mm -hmm. Some question exists among my superiors whether you are a stamp collector or a United States agent. A rough tale is the hardest kind of a shadow to endure. It's a wide open cat and mouse game with a terrific psychological impact. He's with you all the time, and when you stop to talk to somebody, he follows immediately to find out what you said. And that's the way it was with Andrew, my escort. Two days had passed, and I'd been able to do nothing about Ben. I'd been several times to the little sidewalk restaurant, the Basilica Cafe, where I was to contact the girl whose picture I'd memorized so carefully. I'd seen her twice, but didn't dare make the contact. Finally, I saw my chance. Andrew was the usual 15 yards behind me as I approached the eating place. It was crowded. She was sitting alone at a table. I stood there for a moment, hesitating. Do sit down. But aren't you expecting something? No. I'm expecting no one. Oh, thank you. Your uh, friend seems lost. Oh, he'll find a seat elsewhere. Yes, he has. About seven tables back. Now, where's the waiter? I'm hungry. Oh, this service is painfully slow. Huh. You are an American? Yes. yes. Last pack of American cigarettes. Did you care for one? Thank you very much. I will take one. Ah, here it is. I will break it in half so I will have two smokes out of it, all right? Very much so. Your friend is watching very carefully, but he cannot hear us. Who are you and what do you want? I want information about Ben Cummings, an American newspaper man who disappeared. <laughs> it's not as if we were chatting gaily. <laughs> Cummings, the name is unfamiliar to me. He was last heard from a month ago. You brought money with you, American money? Yes. Good. Where are you staying? At the Burick. But my room is wired for sound. Yes, I'm sure it is. I've got to talk to him. We have nothing to talk about until I can get some information. When that time comes, I shall arrange to see you. I'm followed constantly. It can be arranged. But it will take much money. How much? One of the waiters will bring a lunch up to your room, which you have not ordered. Give him then a thousand American dollars. Mm, that's a lot of money. It will probably be much more by the time this is finished. Mm. Here comes your friend. I refuse to wait any longer. I'll go elsewhere. Good afternoon, Miss. Good afternoon. Friend. Then followed three days of bitter frustration. With Andrew at my heels, I was helpless. It was almost noon on the fourth day when there was a knock on my door. A waiter wheeled in some food I had not ordered. After a cautious exchange of words, I gave him the money for Alda. He slipped it into an inside pocket in his coat. From his hand, a printed piece of paper fluttered to the floor. Then he left. I picked it up. It was an advertisement about an old Charlie Chaplin movie playing in one of the theaters. Nothing more. Test for hidden writing revealed nothing, so I took it to mean a meeting at the theater for this afternoon. After lunch, I went out. Andrew was waiting for me. Well, uh, a lovely afternoon. Perhaps a walk along the wharves would be... Well, I think it's a wonderful idea for you. Uh, then perhaps <laughs> the Royal Palace or the Parliament Building? No, thanks. What I'd really like is to see the Giants and the Dodgers play. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll settle for a movie. There's a Charlie Chaplin picture in one of the theaters. Oh, I have seen it. It is wonderful. Mr. Chaplin is wonderful. My place in California was not far from his studio. Where is his theater? Uh, not far from here. Shall we go? By all means, my dear Andrew. Let's go. The sound was scratchy and the translations nearly covered the screen, but the picture was still enjoyable. I kept waiting for some sign of a contact, but the box office wasn't doing much business that day, and there were only about a dozen people in the whole place. I sat through another half of the picture and nothing happened. I went back to my room. Andrew escorted me. You are retiring so early. Only nine o'clock. Oh, what an unexciting time you are having here. 
Uh, you would like perhaps. No, no. I've got some reading to do and some letters to write. Oh. Good night. Uh, should you be wanting me, I will be downstairs in the lobby. Oh, that's one thing I'm sure of. <laughs> I walked into my room and flicked on the light. I spun around. It was Olga. She motioned me to say nothing. She walked across the room and turned the radio on. That will confuse the little ears in the walls. Mm, you know all the tricks, don't you? I have to know these things. It is my business and a very good one, too. I had my waiter friend admit me while you were gone. You were surprised. Very much so. And, uh, delighted? Hmm. My wife should see this scene and I'd have a quick change of profession. <laughs> oh, you have a wife? Almost new. Two years. And you are probably one of those model American husbands we read about, but... Don't believe. <laughs> Probably. Look, let's get down to cases. What have you found out? Very much. You have made a good bargain with me. Quick, for Pete's sake, tell me. Just tell me, is he alive and well? He is alive. Good. But not very well. What do you mean? He's been arrested for espionage. Nonsense. He's a journalist, nothing more. They are trying to make him sign a confession. About what? This is ridiculous. He will sign it. Sometimes it takes longer, but they always get it. He will sign both of them. Both of them? An interesting man, this friend of yours. He is accused of taking money from both governments, mine and yours. The double cross, you call it? Ben, are you crazy? There is no use to disturb yourself. Where is he being held? In Rob, a little town 40 miles from here. I've got to get to him. I have arranged it. Good. I'll go you're a queen in this murky trade of yours. How? The payoff. I will need another thousand dollars. Then you can get to see him. You will be admitted into his room, and then you can talk to him. Thousand dollars? Prices have gone up, haven't they? It is the same all over. Huh. What about Andrew? You will have to give him the slip. When can I see him? Tomorrow night at the hour of 11, if you have the money. You're cleaning me out, but here it is. Uh, you will meet me tomorrow night at the Central Market, and I will drive you there. If you are not able to get rid of your follower, that will not be my fault. Now, if you don't mind... Say, Finney? Please. You are too resolute for one so handsome. All right. Go and take Andrew for a cup of coffee so that I can get out. <laughs> started bright and early the next morning testing my shadow. I led him a merry chase that day, changing cabs and front doors and out of back doors. I tried all the tricks and he was right with me. But towards early evening, I noticed that he was slowing down a great deal. <laughs> I guess he had too much weight to lug around with him. And in the end, I decided the best way I could shake him was to run for it when the time came. A wild idea had taken root in my mind and after a quick supper, I stayed in my room studying maps. About eight o'clock, I went down to the lobby of the hotel. You are going out? Yeah, I'm restless. Good brisk walk is what I need, I think. Mm, I thought after your activity this afternoon, you, you would be as tired as I am. Well, I'm leaving the day after tomorrow, and I wanted to take in everything I could. I haven't seen the wharves at night yet. You are going to walk both ways? Sure. Come on. Mm. I led him at a fast pace to the downtown section with the queues of people lining up to get in to see the show. I moved faster. At a busy corner, I took my big gamble and broke into a fast run. Andrew was behind me, but he was losing ground. Stop! Stop that man! I lost him and went into a theater near the central market where I was to meet Olga. At five minutes to nine, I went outside. I saw her sitting in a small car, waiting. Let's get going. I knew you would lose that fool. Yeah, it wasn't too easy. This is an official car of some kind? Military police. A friend of mine. Yeah, you have got friends, haven't you? I buy mine, that is all. What do I do when I get there? It's all very simple. He's being kept in a house. Two men are guarding him. They understand that you will be around tonight. I will wait outside. Do I have to identify myself? Uh, they will see me out of the window. Hmm. It is a good thing you came tonight. Tomorrow he will be moved to the big prison. Your friend may be executed. What? He signed the confessions, both of them. I don't believe it. You will see for yourself. 
Oh, he'd rather die than admit he'd sold out. Nevertheless, he did sign them, and he is still alive temporarily. Now they will make a big international incident out of it. You would be wise to get out of this country very quickly. After losing Andrew the way you did tonight, you will be in great danger. Yeah. How soon will we be there? Too soon. It took us nearly an hour to get to Rob. We stopped in front of an ordinary-looking brick house set well back from the main road. You wait here for me? Yes, but do not be too long. When Andrew reports in, then they think of coming here. Olga, have you got a gun? What do you want with a gun? Have you got one? Yes. Give it to me. What if they search you? Then I'll only have lost your gun. I'll pay you for it. A hundred dollars? Well, that'll leave me kind of short. Give me a hundred dollars and I will engage my friends, the guards, so they do not think of searching you. Let me mail you the money. No, I do what I do for money. I want it now, in cash. All right. Come up to the door with me. When I'm inside the house, you get back into the car and wait. No? You have something in mind? Nothing, nothing tangible. We'll see. Ah, it's you. Yes, my friend was nervous. He asked me to bring him to the door. Yes, risky business. I made it quick. Only ten minutes, no more. Go in, friend. Frederick will take you to his room. I go in, too. Certainly. Come on. It's me, Dick. Did they let her go, did they? Let who go? Rose, they said they'd let her go if I signed the papers. They had her upstairs, but they wouldn't let me see her. She screamed for me, but they wouldn't let me see her. Snap out of it, Ben. Rose is all right. I just saw her last week. She's fine. She called my name. Ben. Oh, Ben, she yelled, but they wouldn't let me to her. But she's all right now. I signed them, and it's all right. Did they tell you what you were signing? Yeah. Yeah, I have to, that I'd, I'd taken money from two different governments. Double dealing. Can you beat me doing a thing like that? Did you, Ben? Yeah. Yeah, they said I did. But did you? Sure. You didn't do it, Ben. Do you hear? You did not do it. They showed me the money. I did it. They talked you into it. Understand? They beat it into you. Rose will be all right now. That's the main thing. And the kid will be all right, too. Oh, my head. God, a drink of water. Please, this man's going to faint. I am no nursemaid. Please, then let me go. No, no, I get it. I lock you in. Ben. Ben, you listening? Yeah. We're going to try and make a break for it. Get up on your feet. Where will I go to? No one wants me to sell out my own country. Keep quiet. You do everything I tell you. Can you walk? Not very good. Not, not like I used to. When the guard brings the water, I'm going to stand behind the door. When it opens, I'll get him. Then we'll get away. There's a car waiting for I him. I've got no place to go, I tell you. What kid wants an old man? Shh, shh, shh. Here you are. Come on. It's no use. Come on, I said. Hurry up. That's the stuff. Faster. Here's the car. Olga! She's gone. Get in, Ben. Quick! According to the study of the maps I'd made earlier in the evening, it was about 70 miles to the border. I'd pushed that little car for all she had in her. In about an hour and a half, the lights of the little border village came into view. I ran the car into a clump of bushes and parked her there. What are we going to do now? Try and cross the border. Oh, we'll never make it. We'll try and make it over some of these open fields. Come on. I, you shouldn't have bothered with me. They'll get us and you'll be in a jam, too. Get down. Those lights may catch us. All right. Let's go again. I can't do it. My legs, they, they don't want to hold me up. Well, lean on me. It's only a little way. Oh, you go on without me. Put your arm around my waist. That's it. You sure you saw Rose before you left here? Yeah, yeah. They said she was upstairs and she kept crying for me. There's another car. We'll have to get down. All right. 
but I won't be able to get up on my feet again. The car stopped. Someone's coming this way. Crawl behind these bushes. Come on. Get away yourself, Dick. You can do it. No. Coming here. He found the car in the bushes. Looks bad. You get going. I'll hold him off. No, no. It's only one guy. The, the others are staying in the car. Is he coming this way? Yeah. Sit tight. Got your gun. Yeah. No bullets. I jinxed you, Dickie. Mr. Boswell. Mr. Cummings. Will you please come out from behind those bushes? Quickly. Not so fast, Andrew. I've got a gun on you. A gun without bullets. How's he know that? Make it quick. It's for your own benefit. I can imagine. He's got us, Ben. We're coming out, Andrew. Walk in front of me, please. We're not going back to the highway? No. Turn off here. You were very foolish to think you could cross through those fields. The border has been alerted. They're waiting for you. How did you know my gun had no bullets? Olga. She has a good head for business. A frame bought and sold us, eh? I think that's what you call it. They hope to catch the two of you at the border. So she made all the arrangements with the necessary authorities. The visit, the escape. It would have made good ammunition for the propaganda machine. Would have? We stopped here. Where are we, Andrew? You are past the border. You're safe now. I don't get it. This is the only place you could have crossed. Yes. These two friends are lost. They must get to Vienna, to the American zone. We will do our best. For the benefit of my friends in the car, now they will think you are dead. He's helping us to get away. You have more help here than you think. There is a movement. Tell your official. There is a movement. It's enough to make me feel my strength coming back. I wish I knew how to express our thanks. There is no time. I must go back and join in the frantic search for you. And when you see Olga, tell her that I'll be back someday with an itemized statement. The rest was anticlimactic. We were taken through devious routes to our own zone in Europe. In Paris, we rested a few days and flew home just in time to meet Rose and her new baby when they came home from the hospital. Careful how you handle him, honey. His head's too... Look out, you'll drop him. Here, you big lug. You take him. <laughs> Me? <laughs> Nothing doing. I don't touch him till he looks human. All right, then. Keep quiet. I'll put him down on the couch for a minute. I'll keep an eye on him. He's kind of ugly, isn't he? Ben! Well, I can say it. You said yourself he looks like me. I'd better take off. Anne's waiting for me. Oh, before you go, Dick. Yeah? Something for you. Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for everything. Hey, what's that for? Well, that's for proving that Rose was psychic. When you were away... Please, she... Dick. She kept saying all the time that you were all right. She knew it. Womanly intuition. <laughs> <laughs> Dick. Right. Okay. Well, maybe she can tell by looking at the kid what's wrong with him. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The safe return of the American newspaper man closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving the desperate attempts of the enemy to rearm at American expense in the file case entitled Murder in Vienna, another venture undertaken for our protection by... The Silent Men. The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Lewis and Rufoff and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Johnstone, Billy Janice, Shepard Menken, Joan Banks, and Stan Waxman. Your announcer is Don Stanley. 
Douglas Fairbanks is currently presenting Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Emlyn Williams in the motion picture, Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Our thanks to American Magazine for this month voting the silent men the top family adventure program on the air. Sometime this month, a neighbor will ask you to give a wounded soldier life through blood. Give food and shelter to victims of fire, flood, disaster. That neighbor, the Red Cross Fund Drive volunteer, asks you to give all you can. You are the Red Cross. Give now. Robert Montgomery presents a Citizen Views the News next on NBC.